Vivian knew I generally turned my phone to airplane mode when I went to bed, and old habits dying hard, I did so again that night. In the morning after turning it back on, I saw that Vivian had left two voicemails. I know you wanted to talk, and we will, but only when we're both ready. I don't know what else I can tell you. I want you to know that I didn't plan for this to happen, and I know how much I've hurt you. I wish it wasn't this way, but I don't want to lie to you either. I'm mainly calling about London. Right now it's insanely busy at work with the transition, and Walter's pack and all the traveling. We still have the DC leg, and we're flying up to New York this weekend. And since I'm traveling so much, it's probably best if London stays with you for a while. I want to get settled in here first and get her room set up, but I haven't had time to start either of those things. Anyway, I think it's important that you don't tell London what's going on yet. She's already stressed with school, and I know she's got to be exhausted. Besides, I think this is something we should do together. Hold on. Let me call you right back. I don't want your voicemail to cut me off. The second voicemail picked up where she'd left off. I spoke with a counselor today about the best way to tell London, and she said we should stress that we think it's best if we just live apart for a while, without mentioning separation or divorce. And obviously we should both emphasize that it doesn't have anything to do with her, and that we both love her. Anyway, we can discuss it more in person, but I wanted to let you know that I'm trying to do what's best for London. We'll also have to talk about when it might be a good time for her to come to Atlanta. She paused. Okay, I think that's it. Have a good day. Have a good day? Was she kidding? Sitting on the edge of the bed, I replayed the voicemails several times. I think I was searching for something, anything, to suggest that she still cared about me in the slightest. But if it was there, I didn't hear it. I heard a lot of what she wanted, cloaked in terms that were ostensibly all about London's well-being, and the subterfuge infuriated me. While I was thinking about it, my cell phone rang. Hey there, Marge said, her tone sympathetic. Just calling to check in on you. It's not even seven in the morning. I know, but I was thinking about you. I'm kind of angry, actually. Yeah? Vivian left a couple of messages, I said. I paraphrased as best I could. Oh boy, that's what she woke up to? Not exactly a cup of delicious coffee, is it? Speaking of which, I'm on your street and about to pull in your driveway. Unlock your front door. I left the bedroom and padded downstairs. By the time I got the door open, Marge was already getting out of the car, holding a pair of styrofoam cups. Watching her walk up the drive, I noted she was already dressed for work. I can make coffee here, I said. I know, but I wanted to lay my eyeballs on you. Did you get any sleep last night? Maybe four or five hours. I didn't sleep much either. Liz keeping you up late? No, she said. Just worried about you. Let's go inside. Is London up yet? Not yet. How about I get her ready while you enjoy your coffee? I'm not incompetent. I know, she said. Actually, you're the opposite. You're holding up a lot better than I would be in your shoes. I doubt that. Surprising me, she reached out to touch my cheek, something I could never remember her doing before. I haven't had to talk you down from a water tower, have I? Thanks to the coffee and Marge's early morning help, I felt a bit better than I had the day before when I drove London to school. She chattered away in the back seat about her dream, something about a frog that kept changing colors every time it hopped, and her innocent cheer was exactly what I needed. Back at home, I forced myself to put on my running gear. I hadn't run since Vivian's announcement, the first days I'd missed since I'd started back up, and I hoped that the physical exertion would leave me feeling more like myself. On the run, I was fine despite adding a couple extra miles. But by the time I'd finished my shower, I found myself thinking about Vivian again. The fury I'd felt earlier had diminished, replaced by an overwhelming sadness. It was almost too much to bear, and knowing I couldn't face yet another day like the two I'd just weathered, I had to do something, anything. My desire to work was zero, but I forced myself to go to my den. As soon as I took a seat at the desk and saw a photo of Vivian... I knew that staying at home wasn't going to work. There were too many reminders here, too many reasons for the emotional train to start steaming again. It was time, I thought, to visit my office. Packing up my computer, I went to the office I'd rented. The shared receptionist was startled to see me, but reported as usual that I had no messages. 
For the first time, I honestly didn't care. I unlocked my office. Nothing had changed since I'd last been here. It had been weeks, and there was a thin sheen of dust on my desk. I set my computer on it anyway and opened my email. Dozens of messages, most of them receipts for automatic bills or spam. I deleted as much as I could and filed the bills in the appropriate folders until I was left with the emails containing links to the footage for the commercials. With the presentation for the plastic surgeon already complete, it was Taglieri's turn. I reviewed the notes I'd taken the weekend before. Of the six takes we'd made in front of the courthouse, three were definite no-goes. Of the three that were workable, I eventually whittled that down to two. Of those, I thought he was better in the beginning in the second take, and better at the end in the first take. With a little editing, I had basic software on my computer, I'd be able to put those two sections together. There's nothing quite like movie magic. Even better, I liked him in the footage we'd shot, and I was sure that others would as well. He came across exactly the way I hoped. Honest, competent, and likable. But more than that, he looked good on camera. Maybe it was the natural lighting, but it was a vast improvement over his previous commercials. The footage for the second commercial was much more complicated. There were a lot of different scenes shot from varying angles, and a particularly gorgeous scene of a meadow with grazing horses, along with many different people, and that multiplied the way the commercial could eventually play out. Knowing it would take more time and energy than I'd be able to summon, I decided to simply work on the first commercial. The software I used wasn't commercial grade, but that was okay. I'd already spoken to the best freelance editor in town, and slowly but surely I got to work. At lunch, I had to force myself to finish a bowl of soup I picked up from the deli, then went back to editing until it was time to pick up London from school. It had not been an easy day. Whenever my concentration waned, even for a second, the emotional turbulence and questions would return. I'd get up from my desk and pace. Other times I would stand near the window, feeling as my chest grew tight and hands began to shake in what seemed to be an airless office. I would feel, deeply feel, my own loss in a way that made me believe there was no reason to go on. But inevitably, because distraction was my only hope of salvation, I would return to the desk and try to lose myself in the service of Taglieri. What you're experiencing is normal, Liz assured me on the back patio later that night, after I told her what I was going through. She and Marge had shown up at my house yet again after work. Marge had brought Play-Doh and was sitting on the floor with London while they sculpted various items. You've suffered a profound shock. Anyone would be upset. I'm worse than upset, I admitted. I can barely function. While Liz and I had talked hundreds of times, it was the first time I ever felt that I needed to talk to her. The day had left me spent. I wanted nothing more than to run away or find a dark, quiet place to hide, but with London, I couldn't do that. Nor did I think it would help. After all, I would carry my thoughts with me wherever I went. But you told me you went to work, she said. You got London to and from school and piano. And she's eaten. I picked up fast food on the way home. That's okay. You've got to learn to be gentle with yourself. You're handling this about as well as anyone could, especially the way you're dealing with the emotions. Did you not hear anything I told you? Of course I did, and I know it feels unbearable, but believe it or not, the fact that you're letting yourself feel the emotions instead of suppressing them is a good thing. There's an old saying that goes like this, the only way out is through. Do you understand what I mean by that? Not really. But then again, my brain doesn't seem to be working all that well. The next time I look at the commercial I edited together, I'll be depressed at what a terrible job I did. If it's that bad, you'll fix it, right? I nodded. I had to fix it. Because Vivian had opened her own bank account, it was up to me to cover all the bills, including, I assumed, the mortgage. Good, and that will be another step forward. And as to what I meant earlier, too many people think that suppressing emotions or avoiding them is healthy. And sometimes it can be, especially after the passage of time. But in the immediate aftermath of a traumatizing event, it's often better to simply allow the feelings to surface and to experience them fully, while reminding yourself that the feeling will pass. Remind yourself that you're not your emotions. I don't even know what that means. You're sad now, but you're not a sad person and you won't always be sad. You're angry now, but you're not an angry person and you won't always be angry. I thought about what she'd said before shaking my head. I just want to stop the emotions from being so intense. How do I do that? 
keep doing what you're doing. Exercise, work, take care of London. In the end, it's just going to take time. How much time? It's different for everyone, but every day you'll feel a little less vulnerable, a little stronger or resolute. If you thought about Vivian every five minutes today, maybe next week you'll think about her once every ten minutes. I wish I could snap my fingers and be done with it. You and everyone else who experiences something like this. Later that night, after London had FaceTime with her mom and had gone to bed, I continued to sit with Marge and Liz. For the most part, Marge was content to listen. In your experience, I asked, do you think she'll come back? I've seen both situations, honestly, Liz answered. Sometimes what someone thinks is love is just infatuation, and after the shine wears off, they decide they've made a mistake. Other times it is love, and it lasts. And still other times, even if it is infatuation, the person comes to the conclusion that the love they felt for the first person is no longer there. What should I do? She won't even talk to me. I don't know that there's anything you can't do. As much as you might want to, you can't control another person. I wanted a drink. I wanted to forget and simply not care, if only for a little while. But even though there was beer in the refrigerator, I held off because I feared that once I started drinking, I wouldn't stop until the fridge was empty. I don't want to control her. I just want her to come back. I know you do, Liz said. It's clear that you still love her. Do you think she still loves me? Yes, Liz said. But right now it's not the same kind of love. I turned toward Marge. What happens if she wants London to move to Atlanta with her? You fight it, hire a lawyer and make a case that she should stay with you. What if London wants to go? I felt the pressure of tears beginning to form. What if she would rather be with her mom? At this, Marge and Liz were silent. Friday, I took London to and from school and dance, but otherwise buried myself in work like the day before. I was barely surviving. I remember that 14 years earlier, on a horrible day I would never forget, the Twin Towers collapsed. Then came the weekend. Liz's suggestion had become a mantra. Work out, work, take care of London, and though I wouldn't be heading into the office, I nonetheless wanted to follow her advice. I woke early and ran seven miles, my longest run in years. I forced myself to eat breakfast and then fed London. While she relaxed, I finished my edits on the first commercial and started working on the second one. I brought London to art class, continued to edit while she was there, and learned that London had made a vase. She carried it to the car gingerly, careful not to bang it on anything. We have to bring this back next week so that I can paint it, London told me. I want to paint yellow flowers on it and maybe some pink mouses. Mouses? Or a hamster, but hamsters are harder to paint. I had no idea why that would be, but what do I know? Okay, flowers and mouses. I said. Pink mouses. Even better, I agreed. Are you ready to head to Nana's? I helped her into the car, knowing that it was time to tell my parents that Vivian had left me. Because Marge wanted to stay with me while I shared the news, Liz took it upon herself to take a walk with London. I called my father in from the garage, and he took a seat next to my mom. I spilled it all in a single rush of words. When I finished, it was my dad who responded first. She can't leave he frowned. She's got a kid. I should call her, my mom interjected. She's probably going through a phase. It's not a phase. She told me she was in love with him. She's got her own place now. When is she coming back? My mom asked. If she comes next weekend, your dad and I will be out of town. We're going to visit your Uncle Joe in Winston-Salem. It's his birthday. My dad's younger brother by a couple of years... Joe was a mechanic who'd never married, but had, over the years, gone through one long-term girlfriend after the next. Growing up, he was the cool uncle, and I can remember wondering why he'd never married. Now I suspect that he might have been onto something. I don't have any idea when she's coming back, I answered. The work must have been too stressful, my mom said. She's not thinking right. How is she going to see London? My dad asked. I don't know, Dad. Doesn't she want to see London? My dad pressed. I should really call her, my mom fretted. You're not going to call her, Mom, Marge said. This is their business. I'm sure that Vivian will be back to see London, and even though she hasn't told Russ when that might be, I'd guess it'll be within the next week or so. 
In the meantime, it's probably not the best time to pepper Russ with a ton of questions or to start making plans. As you can imagine, it's been a pretty rough week for him. You're right, my mom suddenly said. I'm sorry, it's just such a shock, you know? It's okay, mom, I said. I watched my dad rise from the couch and walk to the kitchen. How are you holding up? My mom asked. I ran a hand through my hair. I'm doing the best I can. Is there anything I can do? Do you need help with London? No, I said. I'm doing okay with that. It's not so hard now that she's in school. Why don't I bring over some dinners for the week? Would that help? I knew she felt like she needed to do something. That would be great, I said. London likes your cooking a lot more than she likes mine. I felt a tap of cold glass against my shoulder. My dad had a beer in each hand and was holding one out. For you, he said. I'm in the garage if you want to talk. When I wandered out to the garage twenty minutes later, my dad motioned for me to sit on a stool while he took a seat on a toolbox. I'd brought out a second beer for both of us. There was something on my mind, something I hadn't mentioned to either Marge or Liz and I wanted his perspective. I don't know if I can do this, I said. Do what? Be a single father. Take care of London. Maybe it would be better if London went to live with Vivian in Atlanta. He cracked open the beer I'd brought him. I take it you want me to tell you that I'm in agreement with you. I don't know what I want. That's not your real problem. Your real problem is that you're afraid. Of course I'm afraid. That's what parenting is all about, doing the best you can while being terrified of screwing up. Kids can turn hair gray faster than anything else, if you ask me. You and Mom weren't afraid. Of course we were. We just never let on, is all. I wondered whether that was true. Do you think I should fight for London, like Marge said, if it comes to that? My dad scratched at the jeans he was wearing, leaving a streak of grease. I think you're a damn good father, Russ. Better than I ever was, that's for sure. And I think London needs you. She needs her mom, too. Maybe. But the way you've been taking care of her, I know it wasn't easy. But you just got up and did it, and she's a happy little girl. And that's what being a dad is all about. You do what needs to be done and love your kid the best way you can. You've been doing that, and I'm real proud of you. He paused. Anyway, that's what I think. I tried to recall whether he'd ever said anything like that to me before, but knowing that he hadn't. Thanks, Dad. You're not going to cry, are you? Despite everything, I laughed. I don't know, Dad. Why are you crying? I wiped at a tear I hadn't known was there. It doesn't take much these days. Chapter 15 One Day at a Time Unlike my friend Danny... I was around to experience my mom's angst as one by one she lost the family with whom she'd grown up. I was 13 when my grandfather died, 18 when my grandmother died, 21 when the first of her brothers passed away, and 28 when the last one slipped from this world to the next. In each case, my mom bore the heaviest burden. All four were lingering deaths with frequent trips to the hospital while poison was administered in the hopes of killing the cancer before it killed them. There was hair loss and nausea, weakness and memory loss, and pain. Always there was too much pain. Toward the end, there were occasional days and nights spent in the ICU, with my relatives sometimes crying out in agony. My mom was there for all of it. Every night after work, she would head to their homes or to the hospital, and she would stay with them for hours. She would wipe their faces with damp cloths and feed them through straws. She came to know the doctors and nurses in three different hospitals on a first-name basis. When the time came, it was she who helped with funeral arrangements, and I always knew that despite our presence, she felt very much alone. In the weeks and months following that fourth funeral, I supposed that I thought she would rebound in the way she always had before. On the surface, she hadn't changed. She still wore aprons and spent most of her time in the kitchen when Vivian and I visited. But she was quieter than I remembered. And every once in a while, I would catch her staring out the window above the sink, isolated from the sounds of those of us nearby. I thought it had to do with the most recent loss. It was Vivian who finally suggested that my mom's grief was cumulative, and her comment struck me as exactly right. What would it be like to lose one's family? 
I suppose it's inevitable in everyone's family. There is always a last survivor, after all. But Vivian's comment made me ache for my mom whenever I would see her. I felt as though her loss had become my loss, and I began swinging by more frequently. I'd drop by after work two or three times a week and spend time with my mom. And though we didn't talk about what she, and I, was going through, it was always there with us, an all-encompassing sadness. One night, a couple of months into my new routine, I dropped by the house and saw my dad trimming the hedges while my mom waited on the porch. My dad pretended not to have noticed my arrival and didn't turn around. Let's take a drive, my mom announced. And by that, I mean that you're driving. She marched toward my car, and after opening the passenger door, she took a seat and closed the door behind her. What's going on, Dad? He stopped trimming but didn't turn to face me. Just get in the car. It's important to your mom. I did as I was told, and when I asked where we were going, my mom told me to head toward the fire station. Still confused, I did as I was told, and when we were getting close, she suddenly told me to turn right. Two blocks later, she directed me to take a left. By then, even I knew where she wanted me to go, and we pulled to a stop next to a gate that was bordered on either sides by wooded lots. Before us stood the water tower, and when my mom got out of the car, I followed her. For a while, she said nothing to me. Why are we here, Mom? She tilted her head, her eyes seeming to follow the ladder that led to the landing near the top. I know what happened, she said, when Tracy and Marge broke up. I know she was brokenhearted and that you met her here. You were still a child, but somehow you talked her down and brought her back to the dorms. I swallowed my denials, something easier said than done. Nothing I could say would matter. This was my mom's show. Do you know what it's like to think that my daughter might have died here? When she told me, I remember wondering to myself why she hadn't called me or your dad. But I know the answer to that, too. You two share something wonderful, and I can't tell you how proud that makes me. We may not have been the best parents, but at least we raised you both right. She continued to stare at the water tower. You are in so much trouble, but you never said anything to us. About where you'd been that night? I wanted to tell you that I'm sorry. It's okay, I said. I saw a deep sadness in her expression as she turned toward me. You have a gift, she said. You feel so deeply and you care so much. And that's a wonderful thing. That's why you knew exactly what to do with Marge. You took her pain and made it your own, and now you're trying to do the same thing with me. Though she trailed off, I knew that more was coming. I know you think you're helping, but no matter what you do, you can't take my sadness away. But you are making yourself miserable. And that breaks my heart, and I don't want you to do that. I'm getting through this one day at a time, but I don't have the strength to have to worry about you too. I don't know if I can stop worrying about you. She touched my cheek. I know, but I want you to try. Just remember that I've made it through 100% of the worst days of my life so far. Just like your dad and Marge. And of course you have too. And how we get through them is one day at a time. Later that night, I thought about what my mom had told me. She was right, of course. But what I didn't know was that as challenging as life had sometimes been, the worst days were still yet to come, and they would be the worst of all. 9,360 minutes. That was how long it had been, well, approximately, anyway, since my world turned upside down. And to me, it felt as though I'd been hyper aware of the passage of every single one of them. Every one of these minutes in the past week I had passed with agonizing slowness, as I seemed to be experiencing them with every cell in my body, every tick of the clock. It was Monday, September 14th. A week ago, Vivian had left me. I continued to dwell on her obsessively, and the night before, I'd had trouble sleeping. Going for a run helped, but by the time I'd returned, I'd lost my appetite. In the last week, I'd dropped another seven pounds. Stress. The ultimate diet. Even as I made the phone call, I think I already knew what I was going to do. I told myself I simply wanted to know where Vivian would be traveling this week, but that wasn't true. When the receptionist at Spannerman answered, 
I asked to be connected to Vivian and reached a woman named Melanie, who identified herself as Vivian's assistant. I didn't know my wife even had an assistant, but apparently there was much I didn't know about her, or maybe had never known at all. I was told that Vivian was in a meeting, and when Melanie asked my name, I lied. I told her that I was a local reporter and wanted to know whether she would be around this week to speak. Melanie informed me that Vivian would be in the office today and tomorrow, but after that she would be out of the office. I then called Marge and asked if she would pick up London from school and later bring her to dance. I told her that I was going to see my wife, but that I would be home later tonight. Atlanta was four hours away. I'm not sure how I imagined my surprise visit might go. In the car, one prediction replaced the next. All I knew was that I had to see Vivian. There was a part of me that hoped the hard-edged exterior she offered to me on the phone would melt away in my presence, and we would find a way to salvage our relationship, our family, the life I still wanted to live. My stomach clenched in knots as I drove, evidence of a simmering anxiety that made the drive more difficult than it should have been. Thankfully, traffic was relatively light, and I reached the outskirts of Atlanta at a quarter to twelve. Fifteen minutes later, with my nerves jangling hard, I found the new Spannerman building and pulled into the parking lot. I found a space in the visitor's section, but hesitated before getting out of the car. I didn't know what to do. Should I call her and tell her I was downstairs? Should I enter the building and show up at the reception desk? Or storm past the reception and confront her in the office? The countless variations on our conversation that I had imagined on the drive always began with me sitting across from her at a table in a restaurant, not with the steps that led up to that point. My mind, I knew, wasn't quite up to par these days. Vivian would certainly prefer that I call, that way she could perhaps put me off entirely. For that reason, showing up inside seemed preferable, but what if she was in a meeting? Would I leave my name and sit in the waiting room, like a kid who'd been called in to meet the school principal? I wanted to head straight for her office, but I had no idea where it was, and something like that would cause a scene, which might even be worse. I forced myself from the car as I continued to ponder my choices. All I knew for sure was that I needed to stretch my legs and use the restroom. Spotting a coffee shop across the street, I jaywalked through the stalled traffic to reach the other side. When I left the coffee shop and crossed the street again, I made the decision to call Vivian from the building lobby. That's when I saw them, Spannerman and Vivian in a brown Bentley, getting ready to pull out of the parking lot, onto the street. Not wanting them to see me, I edged closer to the building and ducked my head. I heard the roar of the engine as it finally pulled out, inching its way into traffic. Even though I didn't have much of a plan in the first place, the little I did have was going up in smoke. Despite the lack of appetite, I supposed I could grab a bite to eat and try to catch up with her in an hour or so, which seemed preferable to waiting around, and I started back to my car. Pulling out of the lot, I noticed that the traffic had barely moved and I could still see the Bentley about eight cars ahead of me. Beyond it, I saw there was some construction going on. An 18-wheeler loaded with steel girders was backing onto a work site, and the traffic on the street had ground to a halt. When the truck cleared the road, traffic started moving again. I followed along, conscious of the Bentley in front of me, watching as it made a right turn. I felt like a spy, or rather a creepy private investigator, when I took the turn as well, but I told myself that since I wasn't going to confront them at lunch or do anything crazy, it wasn't a big deal. I just wanted to know where they were eating. I wanted to know something about the new life my wife was leading. And that was normal, something anyone would do. Right? Nonetheless, I could feel my anger growing. Now there was only a single car between us and I could see them up ahead. I imagined Walter talking and Vivian responding. I pictured the same joyful expression she'd worn when on the phone with him after her argument with London, and my anger transformed into feelings of disappointment and sadness at all I had lost. Why didn't she love me? They weren't on the road long. They took a left and then quickly turned into a parking garage beneath a splashy high-rise called Belmont Tower. It had a doorman out front, the kind you see in New York, and I drove on, finally pulling into a restaurant parking lot just up the block. I killed the engine, wondering if there was a restaurant inside the high-rise. I wondered if it was the location of the corporate apartments. I wondered if this was where Walter Spannerman lived. Using my phone, I found the information. Belmont Tower was a Spannerman project, and there was also a video link. I clicked it and saw Walter Spannerman boasting about the building amenities. 
As his final selling point, he proudly announced to viewers that he'd chosen to live on the top floor. I stopped the video, but like a man choosing to march unassisted to his own execution, I stepped out of the car and made for Belmont Tower. I signaled to the doorman when I was close and he approached. It's a beautiful building, I said. Yes, sir, it really is. I was wondering if there's a restaurant in the building, or a dining club for the tenants, I said. No, there isn't. However, the building has a relationship with La Cerna next door. It's a five-star restaurant. Are there any apartments for rent? No, sir. I put a hand in my pocket. Okay, I said. Thanks for your help. A few minutes later, dazed at the idea that Vivian had most likely gone with Spannerman to his penthouse, I was in my car and on my way back to Charlotte. I arrived half an hour after London got back from school, and when I opened the door, she came running. Daddy, where were you? I had to work, I said. I'm so sorry I couldn't pick you up. That's okay. Auntie Marge was there. She drove me home. She put her arms around me. I missed you. I missed you too, baby. I love you. Ditto, I said. What does ditto mean? You say ditto when you want to say the same thing. You said I love you, so I said ditto, meaning I love you. That's neat, she said. I didn't know you could do that. It's just a crazy world, isn't it? Did you learn anything fun in school? I learned that spiders aren't insects. They're called arachnids. You mean arachnid? No, Daddy, arachmid, with an M. I was pretty sure she was wrong, but she'd figure it out eventually. That's cool. It's because insects have six legs and spiders have eight legs. Wow, you're pretty smart, you know that? But I still don't like spiders. I don't like bees anymore, either. Even though they make honey. But butterflies are pretty. Just like you. You're pretty, too. Prettier than any butterfly, I said. Can I go say hi to Auntie Marge for a minute? Okay. I have to check on Mr. and Mrs. Sprinkles. Did you remember to give them water? Oops. No, I didn't. But they had plenty yesterday. I'm sure they're okay. I'll go make sure. I kissed her cheek and put her down. She ran toward the steps and vanished from sight. Marge, I noticed, had been watching us from the kitchen. You're a good dad, you know that? She said when I reached her. I try. How was she? You mean in the hour I've had her? I had to drive her home and get her a popsicle. And then Mom showed up with a ton of food and I had to deal with that too. I put some in the refrigerator and some in the freezer, by the way. Let's just say that you really owe me for this one. I'm exhausted. What a day. I'm not sure I can take any more. My sister had a flair for sarcastic melodrama, obviously. I didn't think I'd be back so soon. Neither did I. And when you did get home, I thought you'd resemble a pile of mashed potatoes. What happened? Was she even there? I saw her, I said. Well, kind of. I told her what had happened. While I spoke, she poured two glasses of ice water and handed one to me. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Why didn't you just wait for her? After they went to Spannerman's place, I realized I didn't want to see her after that. Because? She was... with him. Probably at his penthouse or whatever. And... And what? She left you. She told you she was in love with him. You do know she's sleeping with him, right? I know that, I said. I just don't like to think about it. I don't want to think about it. Marge offered a sympathetic expression. That makes you perfectly sane. I hesitated, realizing I was utterly exhausted. What am I going to do? You're going to take care of yourself. And you're going to continue to be a good father to London. I mean about Vivian. For now, let's just worry about you and your daughter, okay? I never should have gone to Atlanta. On Tuesday, I tried to bury myself in work on Teglieri's commercial but it was hard to stay focused, and I thought endlessly of Vivian. I would see her in the Bentley, Spannerman in the seat beside her. Whenever I imagined her expression, it was the same one I'd seen on the patio. Those images haunted me, bringing with them a sense of inadequacy, of inferiority. I hadn't simply been rejected. I'd been replaced by someone wealthier and more powerful, someone who had the ability to make Vivian laugh and smile in a way that I could not. She had left me, not for reasons of her own, but because of me. I said as much to Marge on the phone the following day, and when she wasn't able to talk me out of my funk, she and Liz showed up at my home after work. 
It was Tuesday night, and I'd fed London one of the meals my mom had made. As soon as they walked in the door, Marge and London headed off to watch a movie in the family room, while Liz and I sat on the back patio. I recounted everything that had happened and the way I'd been feeling. When I was finished, Liz brought her hands together. What did you think would happen if you talked to Vivian? I guess I was hoping that she'd make the decision to come back, or at the very least we'd discuss how we could work it out. Why? Has she given you any indication that she wants to come back? Or try to work it out? No, I admitted. But she's my wife. We've barely spoken since she left. I'm sure the two of you will have a sit-down when she's ready, but I can't promise that you'll like what she tells you. It wasn't that hard to read between the lines. You don't think she'll come back, do you? I'm not sure my opinion is any better than anyone else's, or that it's even relevant. You're right. It's not relevant. But you've seen situations like this before, and you know Vivian. I'd still like to know what you think. She exhaled. No, she finally said. I don't think she's coming back. I wanted numbness. I didn't want to feel or think about Vivian, but it seemed that the only time I could find oblivion was in the hours that London was in school, when I buried myself in work. On Wednesday, I continued to bury myself in Taglieri's second commercial before finally sending it off to the editor for polishing and finalizing. After that, I worked on the presentation for the surgeon on Thursday afternoon. I was proposing a different campaign than I'd recommended for Taglieri. A much higher online presence and user-friendly website, a heavy emphasis on patient testimonials on video, direct mail, social media, and billboards. And even though I was far less than 100% during the presentation, I left the meeting the following day with a handshake agreement knowing I'd landed my second client. Like Taglieri, he'd committed to a year of services. With those two clients, I realized that I'd replaced nearly half of my previous salary, not counting bonuses. It was enough to meet my monthly obligations with a few trims here and there, it made it significantly easier when I picked up the phone and canceled our joint credit cards. I let Vivian know via text. Vivian called me later that night. Since my ill-advised adventure in Atlanta on Monday, I'd allowed London to answer the phone as soon as I saw Vivian's image pop up on the screen. London let me know that Vivian would be calling me back later. As she headed up the stairs to get ready for bed, I wondered whether she'd figured out that things had changed between her mother and me or that we were no longer going to be a family. While I waited for her call, I didn't want to get my hopes up, but I couldn't help it. I would imagine hearing her apologize or say that she was coming home. And yet, like the turbulence of my emotions, those thoughts would be replaced with the memory of what Liz had told me, or that the only reason Vivian was calling was because I'd canceled the credit cards, and she wanted to let me know how angry she was. The push and pull left me exhausted, and by the time the phone finally did ring, I had little emotional energy to expend, no matter what she might say. I let the phone ring four times before finally connecting the call. Hi, I said. London said you'd be calling. Hi, Russ, she said. Her voice was calm, as if nothing had changed between us at all. How are you? I wondered if she really cared or was simply being polite. I wondered why I felt the need to try to read her instead of letting the call simply unfold. I'm fine, I forced out. You? I'm okay, she said. London sounds like she might be coming down with a cold. She didn't say anything to me. She didn't to me either. I could hear it in her voice, though. Make sure she's taking her vitamins and maybe get her some orange juice in the morning. She'll probably need some children's cold medicine, too. How can she get a cold? It's almost 90 degrees outside. She's in school. New kids, new germs. It happens in every school at the beginning of the year. All right, I said. I'll have to run out to get some orange juice and the medicine, but she's been taking her vitamins. Don't forget, she said. And anyway, I was calling for a couple of reasons. First, I'm coming to Charlotte this weekend. I really miss London, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to spend some uninterrupted time with her. But not me. Of course, I said, keeping my voice steady. She'd love that. She misses you too. Good. Thank you. I could hear her relief and wondered why she'd anticipated any other reaction. But here's the thing. I don't think it's a good idea for me to stay in a hotel. I think that would be very strange for her. I frowned. Why would you stay at a hotel? You can stay at the house. We have a guest room. I think she'd notice if I slept in the guest room. Even if she doesn't notice, I don't think we should put her in the position where she asks the three of us to do things together. 
I would really like it to be just the two of us, for her sake, so she doesn't get confused. What are you saying? Would you mind staying with your parents, or maybe with Marge and Liz, on Friday and Saturday night? I could feel my blood pressure spike. You're kidding, right? No, Russ, I'm not. Please. I know I'm asking a lot, but I don't want to make things any harder on London than they already are. Or maybe, I thought, you'd rather it not be any harder on you. I let the silence crackle between us. Yeah, I finally said. I guess I can ask Marge. My parents are going to be out of town. I'd appreciate it. Remember that London has dance on Friday night and then art class on Saturday morning, so you probably won't have time to do yoga. I've always put my daughter first, Russ, you know that. You've been a great mom, I conceded. Oh, for art class, you'll need to bring the vase she made last week. This weekend she'll be painting it. Where is it? I put it in the pantry, top shelf on the right. Got it, she said. Oh, one last thing. Yes? I was wondering if you had time for a late lunch tomorrow, around one thirty. We need to talk before I have to pick up London from school. Despite everything, I felt my heart skip a beat at the thought of sitting across the table from her. Of seeing her. Of course, I said. Where? She named a place we both knew. A place we'd eaten many times before. Including, once, on our anniversary. I hung up the phone, wondering if it was an omen. Of course you can stay with us, Marge said into the receiver. I'd just returned from the grocery store and was putting the orange juice into the refrigerator before calling her. You'll have to promise not to walk around in your droopy underwear or drink your coffee at the table without a shirt on, though. In fact, don't even pack any droopy underwear, okay? Do you even know me? Of course. Why do you think I'm pointing these things out? I promise. We won't be around on Saturday, though. You'll be on your own. A friend of ours is having a housewarming party. No wife, no London, no parents, and now no sister to see on the weekend. I wondered when the last time was that I was utterly on my own, figuring it had been years since something like that had happened. No worries. I have work. I'll still call you just to make sure you're okay. But back to Vivian, are you sure lunch is such a good idea? Why wouldn't it be? Whenever someone says we need to talk, it's never a good thing. Believe me when I say I'm not expecting much. I'm glad, she said. You remember what Liz said, right? She's not going to tell you that she wants to come back. Liz told you what we talked about? Of course not, she said. But I know you, and it's not too hard to figure out what you might ask her. And because I know her, I also know what she told you. It's not as if the two of us haven't had a million discussions about what's going on. It's been a hot topic around the old homestead these days. There are better things for the two of you to discuss than my marriage. And you'd be right 99% of the time, she said. But lately, we're definitely in that pesky 1%. What else are you saying to each other? We talk about how much you're hurting, and that we don't know what to say or do to make it better. You're such a good man, such a good father. It isn't fair. I couldn't help but choke up a bit. You don't have to worry about me. Of course I do. Big sister, remember? I hesitated. Do you think Vivian is struggling? I'm sure she is. You can't do what she did and not feel at least a little bit of guilt. But I'm not sure she dwells on her feelings the way you do. My sense is that you two are just wired differently. That made sense. But I still care about her, I offered. She's been a wonderful wife. Marge breathed into the receiver. Are you sure about that? Vivian had been right about London. When she woke Friday morning, her voice had a raspy edge to it, and on our way out the door, she began wiping at her nose. I wondered how long it would take for the medicine to kick in. After drop-off, I tossed some clothes in a duffel bag and drove to the office. Still no phone calls for the Phoenix Agency. But on the upside, the receptionist was getting used to my presence and had even started saying, Good morning, Mr. Green. I spent most of the morning working with my tech guy. Together we discussed and made decisions on the overall plan, then moved toward discussions of internet prioritization, targeted banner ads, and a social media campaign. We spent almost three hours together, and by the end I felt like he had more than enough work to keep him busy for a couple of weeks. As did I. Once that was done, I sent confirmation emails regarding the third commercial I'd filmed for Taglieri the following Friday. 
then left a message for the surgeon asking for the names of patients who might be willing to provide on-camera testimonials. As I worked, I noticed the tension in my shoulders and back seemed to be intensifying, and it dawned on me that I was nervous at the thought of seeing Vivian. Despite her betrayal, despite asking me to make myself scarce all weekend, I wondered if I would meet with a Vivian who was willing to try to work things out. While I knew that Marge and Liz were trying to keep me grounded in reality with what to expect, the heart wants what it wants. Hope might leave me crushed in the end, but losing all hope somehow seemed even worse. I ended up leaving the office at half past noon and arrived at the restaurant 15 minutes early. I'd made reservations and the waiter led me to a table near the window. Most of the other tables were already occupied. I ordered a cocktail, hoping that it would keep me calm. I wanted to approach the lunch in the same way I had the phone call, but as soon as Vivian entered the restaurant, I held my breath, releasing it only when she approached the table. Dressed in jeans and a red blouse that accentuated her figure, she looked effortlessly chic, as always. She propped her sunglasses on her head and offered a quick smile as I stood. When she was close, I wondered whether or not to kiss her on the cheek, but she didn't give me the opportunity. Sorry for being late, she said as she sat down. I had trouble finding a place to park. Friday at lunch is always busy here. I think a lot of people are getting an early start to the weekend. I'm sure, she said. She pointed to my cocktail, which was nearly finished. I see you're doing the same thing. Why not? I'm a free man this weekend. Maybe so, but you still have to drive. I know. She deliberately unfolded her napkin, taking her time and avoiding my gaze. How's work? Better. I landed another client, plastic surgeon. I'm glad it's working out for you. Oh, by the way, did you remember to give London some medicine? I did, and orange juice. And she knows I'm picking her up today, right? Yes, I said, and the guest room is ready to go, too. Would you care if I slept in the master bedroom? I'll change the sheets first, obviously. No, I don't mind. We're still married. I thought I saw a flash of exasperation, but it vanished as quickly as it had come. Thanks, she said. I just want London to have a nice weekend. I'm sure she will. She turned toward the window, taking in the street, then seemed to remember something. Reaching for her handbag, she pulled out her phone and tapped in the code. She tapped a button, used her finger to scroll, and tapped another couple of times. She scrolled some more. In the silence, I took another drink, finishing the cocktail. Finally setting the phone aside, she offered a pinched smile. Sorry, just checking up on work. I was on the phone for almost the entire drive to Charlotte. That was the drive. With the weekend on tap, traffic was heavy, and we didn't get in until late last night. We flew in from Houston, and the night before that we were in Savannah. I can't tell you how happy I am to have a relaxing weekend on tap. I tried to ignore the word we. It was better than Walter, but it still stung. I said nothing, and Vivian reached for the menu. I couldn't remember a conversation with Vivian that ever felt more stilted. Have you decided what you're going to have? She asked. I'll probably just order some soup. I'm not that hungry. She looked up, and for the first time she seemed to really see me. You've lost weight, she observed. Are you still jogging? Every morning, and I'm down almost 15 pounds. I didn't tell her that much of the weight loss was both recent and due to her, since my appetite was largely non-existent. You can see it in your face, she said. You were getting some jowls, but they're almost gone now. It was odd, I thought how she could offer a compliment while still getting in a dig at the same time. I wondered whether she was still working out with Spannerman, and whether she ever mentioned to him that he had jowls. Probably not. Have you decided what you're going to do this weekend with London? I asked. Not really. It's kind of up to her, obviously. I want to spend a lot of time doing what she wants to do. She perused the menu. It didn't take long. Even I knew she was going to order a salad, and the only question was which one she'd want. Soon after she set the menu aside, the waiter appeared at the table. She ordered an unsweetened iced tea and an Asian salad. I ordered a bowl of the vegetable beef. When the waiter left, Vivian took a sip from her water, then traced her finger through the condensation. Like me, she seemed to be at a loss for words, the elephant in the room being what it was. So, I said finally, you said you needed to talk to me. It's mainly about London, she said. I've been worried about her. 
she isn't used to me being gone so much. I know it's been hard for her. She's doing okay. She doesn't tell you everything. I just wish there was a way I could be with her more. I could have pointed out that she could come home, but she probably already knew that. I can imagine, I offered. I've been talking to Walter, and given the amount of travel I have ahead of me in the next few months, there's just no way that I can bring her to Atlanta just yet. I'm still out of town three or four nights a week, and I haven't even had time to get a room set up or even begin looking for a nanny. I felt a surge of relief, but wanted to make sure I'd heard her right. So you're saying that you think it's best if London stays with me? Only for a while. I'm not abandoning my daughter, and you and I both know that daughters need their moms. They need their dads, too. You'll still be able to see her. I'm not the kind of mother who would keep her child from seeing the father. And you and I both know that I was the one who raised her. She's used to me. Her child. Not, I noticed, our child. It's different now. She's in school and you're working. Be that as it may, she said. I wanted to talk to you about what's going on right now, okay? And even though I'm traveling a lot, I still want to be able to see her as much as I possibly can. I wanted to make sure that you didn't have a problem with that. Of course not. Why would you think I'd have a problem with it? Because you're angry and hurt, and you might want to try to hurt me back. I mean, you didn't even call to talk to me about canceling the credit cards. You just up and did it. You do know you should have called first, right, so we could discuss it? I blinked, thinking about the secret bank account she'd set up. Seriously? I'm just saying you could have handled it better. Her chutzpah was staggering, and all I could do was stare at her. The waiter arrived with her iced tea, and as he set it on the table, her phone rang. Checking the screen, she stood from the table. I've got to take this. I watched her walk from the table and head outside. From my seat, I could see her, though I forced myself to look away. I munched a couple of ice cubes until the waiter came by with a basket of bread and some butter. I nibbled on that, absently listening to the drone of conversations around me. In time, Vivian returned to the table. Sorry, she said. That was work. Whatever, I thought. I didn't bother responding. The waiter brought our food and she dressed her salad before dicing it into bite-sized portions. The aroma of the soup was tantalizing, but my stomach had locked down. The small amount of bread had taken up all the room. I nonetheless forced myself to take a bite. There's something else I think we need to discuss, she said finally. What's that? What we're going to say to London. I was thinking that we should probably sit down with her on Sunday before I leave. Why? Because she needs to know what's going on, but in a way that she can understand. We need to keep it as simple as possible. I don't know what that even means. She sighed. We tell her that because of my job, I'll have to live in Atlanta and that she's going to stay with you for a while. We explain that no matter what happens, we both love her. It's not really necessary to go into long explanations, and I don't think that's a good idea anyway. You mean like explaining that you're in love with another man, you mean? I can talk to Liz. She might be able to give me some do's and don'ts. That's fine, but be careful. Why? She's not your therapist. She's your sister's partner. I assume she's taken your side in all this and wants you to believe that I'm the bad guy. But you are the bad guy. She wouldn't do that. Just make sure, she warned. I also don't think it's a good idea to tell her what's happening between you and me. It would be better if she gets used to the two of us being apart first. Then it won't come as such a shock when we do tell her. Tell her what? That we're getting divorced. I set my spoon aside. Though I suspected she'd say the word eventually, in the here and now it still shocked me to hear it aloud. Before we start talking about divorce, don't you think it might be a good idea for the two of us to talk to a therapist? To see if there's any way to salvage what we have? Keep your voice down. This isn't the time or place to talk about this. I am keeping my voice down, I said. No, you're not. You can't hear yourself when you get angry. You're always loud. I pinched the bridge of my nose and took a deep breath. All right, I said, forcing myself to speak even more quietly. Don't you want to even try to make it work? I could barely hear myself above the din of the lunch crowd. You don't have to whisper, she retorted. I was just asking you to keep your voice down. People could hear you. I got it, I said. Stop changing the subject. Russ, I still love you. I'll always love you. And I just told you that this isn't the time or place for this. 
Right now, we're here to talk about London and why she should probably stay here for the time being and what we are going to say to her on Sunday night. We are not here to talk about us. Don't you want to talk about us? I can see that trying to have a normal conversation with you wasn't a good idea. Why can't we discuss things like adults? I am trying to talk to you. She took a bite of her salad. She'd barely eaten any to that point, and then placed her napkin on the table. But you never listen. How many times do I have to tell you that this isn't the time or place to talk about you and me? I said it nicely. I thought I was being clear, but I guess you had other ideas. So for now, I think it's best if I probably leave before you start yelling at me, okay? I just want to have a pleasant weekend with my daughter. Please, I said. You don't have to leave. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to upset you. I'm not the one who's upset, she said. You are. With that, Vivian rose from the table and strode for the exit. When she was gone, I sat in shock for a couple of minutes before finally signaling for the waiter to bring the check. Rehashing the conversation, I wondered whether I really had been too loud, or whether it had been an easy excuse for Vivian to bring the lunch to an early conclusion. There was, after all, no reason for her to stay. Not only was she in love with another man, as far as the weekend went, she'd gotten everything she'd wanted from me. Chapter 16 The Sun Also Rises I liked Liz as soon as I met her, but I'll admit that I was amazed that my parents felt the same way. While they accepted the fact that Marge was gay, I often sensed that they weren't exactly comfortable with the women Marge dated. There was a generational aspect to it. They'd both grown up in an era in which alternative lifestyles were typically kept in the closet. But it also had to do with the kind of women that Marge originally seemed to favor. They struck me as a bit on the rough side, and were often prone to profanity in casual conversation, which had a tendency to make both my mom and dad go red in the face. Marge told me that she'd met Liz at work. Accounting offices, I think most would agree, aren't your usual pickup joints. But Liz had recently joined a new practice and was in need of an accountant. Marge happened to have an opening in her afternoon schedule, and by the time Liz left the office, they'd made arrangements to meet for a glass of wine before dropping by an art opening in Asheville. You're going to an art gallery? I remember asking Marge. We'd met at a bar after work, the kind of place with neon beer signs and the slightly rancid smell of too many spilled drinks. At the time, it was one of Marge's favorite watering holes. Why wouldn't I go to an art gallery? Maybe because you don't like art? Who says I don't like art? You did. When I tried to show you some pictures of Emily's art, you said, and I quote, I don't like art. Maybe I've matured in the past few years. Or maybe Liz just blew your socks off. She's interesting, Marge admitted. Very smart, too. Is she pretty? What does that matter? I'm just curious. Yes, she's very pretty. Let me guess, the art opening was her idea? As a matter of fact, it was. Does she drive a motorcycle and favor leather jackets? How would I know? What does she do? She's a marriage and family therapist. You don't like therapists either. I didn't like my therapists. Well, the last one was okay, but I didn't much like the others. Of course, there were a few years there where I was pretty angry, and I'm not sure I would have liked any therapist. Have you told Liz about your anger issues? That's all in my past. I'm not like that anymore. Good to know. When can I meet her? It's a little early, don't you think? We haven't even gone out yet. All right, so after you do go out, when can I meet her? It ended up being a little less than two weeks. I invited the two of them over to my apartment and grilled a few steaks on my pint-sized patio. Liz brought dessert and the three of us split a bottle of wine. It took me all of 30 seconds to feel at ease with Liz, and it was clear that she already cared deeply for my sister. I could see it in the attentive way she listened whenever Marge spoke, her easy laughter, and how attuned she seemed to Marge's hidden emotional side. When it finally came time for them to leave, Marge pulled me aside. What do you think of her? I think she's fantastic. Too fantastic for me? What are you talking about? I don't totally get what she sees in me. Are you kidding? You're awesome. You had her laughing all night long. Marge didn't seem convinced, but she nodded anyway. Thanks for having us over, even if you did burn the steaks. They were purposely charred, I explained. It's supposed to add flavor. Oh, it did. Burned is often the goal of world-class chefs. Goodbye, Marge, I said. And you're welcome. Love you. That's only because I put up with you. 
Marge didn't introduce Liz to my parents until another month had passed. It was a Saturday afternoon, and within minutes of her arrival, Liz disappeared into the kitchen to help my mom. The two of them chatting as if they were old friends. My dad sat with Marge watching a ball game. I was sitting with them too, not that either of them seemed to notice. What do you think, Dad? Marge asked during one of the commercials. About what? Liz, Marge said. She seems to be getting along with your mom pretty well. Do you like her? My dad took a sip of his beer. It doesn't matter what I think. You don't like her? I didn't say that. What I said was that it doesn't matter how I feel about her. The only thing that really matters is how you feel about her. If you know why you like her and she's good enough for you, then she'll be good enough for your mom and me. Then the game came back on and my dad descended into silence. All I could think was that my dad was, and always will be, one of the smartest men I've ever known. After my lunch with Vivian, I went back to work, but my thoughts were jumbled and I felt out of sorts. The feeling intensified as three o'clock came and went, and I began to feel the loss of London's company. As important as it was for London to spend time with Vivian, I wasn't convinced that I had to be invisible the entire weekend for their time together to be meaningful. I wondered why I hadn't protested more strongly when Vivian had suggested it, but deep down my problem was me. I knew I still wanted to please her, and as much as that suggested a flaw in my character, that flaw was exacerbated by the obvious. If I hadn't been able to please her before, why on earth would I think I was able to please her now? It was, I think, the first time I realized the depth of that particular problem. Even I had trouble making sense of it. Logically, I knew it was both ridiculous and unlikely. Why, time after time, did I continue to try? I wished I could be another person. Or better yet, I wished I could be a stronger version of me and I wondered whether I needed professional help. I wondered if professional help would change anything. Knowing me, I'd end up trying to please my therapist. It's been said that parents always screw up their kids and since I've been a people pleaser for as long as I can remember, it logically flowed that it was all my parents' fault. Why then, I wondered, did I feel the need to visit them so regularly? Why did I try to visit with my dad during ball games, or tell my mom that her meals were delicious? Because, I thought to myself, I wanted to please them too. I finally left the office a little after five and drove to Marge's. I told myself that I would keep talk about Vivian to an absolute minimum, even I was tired of her, a goal that lasted all of twelve seconds. I wind my way through dinner and Marge and Liz were supportive as always. If I was a broken record, they were too, and while they assured me repeatedly that I would be okay, I still wasn't sure whether to believe them. They dragged me to a movie, and we had our pick of the late summer blockbusters still lingering in theaters. We chose something fun, one of those stories with flawed heroes battling really evil bad guys intent on destroying the planet, and lots of action, but even so it was hard for me to relax and enjoy it. I found my thoughts drifting to how Vivian and London had spent the afternoon and what they'd had for dinner. I wondered if my wife was sitting in the family room and flipping through a magazine after London had gone to bed. I wondered whether she'd called Spannerman, and if so, how long they'd talked. After the movie, I tried to do some reading. My sister had a few books in the spare bedroom, but trying to lose myself in a novel was impossible. I gave up and turned out the light, and spent hours tossing and turning before finally falling asleep. I woke two hours before dawn. At a quarter to eleven on Saturday morning, my cell phone rang. I'd already jogged, showered, had coffee with Marge and Liz, and started to put together the questions for the patient testimonials. It is easy to accomplish a lot when one wakes up in what feels like the middle of the night. When I pulled the phone from my pocket, I saw it was Vivian and I hit the magic button. Hello? Hi, Ross. Are you busy? Not really, I said. I'm at my sister's. What's up? Is London all right? She's fine, but I forgot to bring the vase to art class, and I was wondering if you might swing by the house and bring it here. I'm almost at the studio, and if I turn around and go back, she's going to be really late. Yeah, I said. No problem. I'll be there as quick as I can. I hung up the phone and grabbed my keys. I'd placed them in a basket on the table by the door. Behind me, I heard Marge call out, Where are you going? Vivian called. I need to bring London the ceramic vase she made last week. Then you better get to it, seal. Seal? She commands and you comply. If you're lucky, maybe she'll toss a fish at you. It's for London, not Vivian, I snapped. Keep telling yourself that. 
Though I was annoyed by her comment, it passed in the rush to get to my house and then to London's class. Marge lived ten minutes away, and if I hit more green lights than red, I'd be there shortly after class started. I wondered, absently, whether London had told Vivian about the yellow flowers and pink mouses. I smiled. Mouses. It had sounded so cute coming from her. I just didn't have the heart to correct her. I wanted to see my daughter, even if only for a few seconds. Though it had only been a day, I missed her. I got home, grabbed the vase, and was fortunate to hit one green light after another, the man upstairs obviously understanding the urgency of my mission. I pulled into the lot and spotted Vivian standing outside the studio. When I parked, she was already approaching my car, motioning me to roll down the window. I did and passed the vase to her. Thanks, she said. Let me get back in there. I felt myself deflating like an old balloon. Before you go, did you two have a good time yesterday? She was already backing away. We had a terrific time. I'll call you tomorrow to let you know what time you should come over to the house. Can you send London outside so I can say hi? She can't. They've already started painting, she said. She turned and vanished into the studio without another word, and I thought to myself that seals were actually lucky. At least they got a treat. I didn't want to return to Marge's right away. Vivian's demeanor put me in a pissy mood, one intensified by the fact that I hadn't slept much. Caffeine, I thought. I needed caffeine. And I pulled in a few doors down from the studio and parked in front of the coffee shop. No doubt Vivian would rather I had gone somewhere else for a nice tea on the off chance that London might see me. But in a rare turn, I told myself that I didn't care whether she might get angry or not. I actually wanted her to be angry with me. Maybe, I thought, that was the first step in correcting my need for Vivian's approval. After all, Marge had been right about my reasons for racing to the studio earlier. Even after yesterday's lunch, I'd still wanted Vivian's approval, not London's. If there was anything positive to come out of it, it was that I realized that Vivian was making it easier for me to not want her approval. Why try when it simply wasn't possible? And if she happened to give it, I doubted whether that would change anything. I pushed through the door wondering if this was the first step in fixing this particular character flaw of mine when I heard my name being called out. Russ? I recognized the voice and spotted Emily waving from a table, a newspaper spread before her, a glass of tea on the table. With her luxurious hair curling in the heat and a casual low-cut t-shirt tucked into faded jeans, shorts, and sandals, she was beautiful in an earthy, natural way. The sight of her made my irritation melt and I realized that she was the very person I'd wanted to see, even if I hadn't been consciously aware of it. Oh, hey, Emily, I responded, unable to suppress a smile. Instead of getting in line, I found myself heading toward her table, almost on autopilot. Long time no see. How are you? I'm good, she said with a genuine smile. My schedule's been crazy for the past few weeks. Mine too, I thought. What's been going on? I had to finish some pieces for the gallery, but David's been in town, too, and that meant a whole lot of running around. You mentioned that he'd be around. How much longer is he staying? It's his last weekend. He'll be flying back to Sydney on Tuesday. As she spoke, I caught the glint of reflected light in her hazel eyes, triggering memories that seemed to make the years roll backward. I motioned toward the counter and the words were out before I could stop them. Will you be here for a few minutes? I was thinking about getting some iced tea. I'll be here, she said. The raspberry tea is fantastic. I went to the counter and ordered. I took her advice, and when it was ready, I brought my glass to the table. She'd just finished folding up the paper, making room as I took a seat. Anything interesting in the paper? A lot of bad stuff. It gets old. I wish there were more stories about good things. That's why they have the sports section. I suppose. But only if your team wins, right? If they lose, I skip the sports section. It wasn't particularly funny, but she laughed anyway. I like that. What's been going on with you? She asked. I haven't seen you in forever. I wouldn't even know where to start. Did you film those commercials like you wanted? For the lawyer? I did. They're being finalized in the editing room now, and the first one will hopefully air in about two weeks. I'm filming another one for him next week, and I also signed a plastic surgeon as a client. Is he any good, in case I need his services? I hope so. I said, but you don't need any work done. Good answer, she said, even if it's not true. 
and congratulations on the new account. I know you were worried, and I'm glad it's working out for you. I'll need another few clients before I breathe a sigh of relief, but I do feel like I'm finally on the right track. And you've lost some weight, I notice. Fifteen pounds. Did you want to lose weight? Because I didn't think you needed to lose any in the first place. I couldn't help comparing her response to Vivian's when she'd mentioned my jowls. I'm still a few pounds from where I want to be. I've started running again, doing push-ups, all that good stuff. Good for you. I can tell it's working. You look great. You too, I said. So, what have you been up to? You said you had to finish some gallery pieces? I've been working non-stop. For some reason, virtually all of my pieces at the gallery sold in just a few days last month. Different buyers, different states, I don't know why. Maybe it has something to do with the cycle of the moon or whatever, but the gallery owner called me and asked if I had more work to display. Long story short, I had a bunch of partially completed paintings, and I decided to try to finish them. I completed eight, but the others, they're going to take more time. I spent a lot of time staring or repainting or adding different media. It's like they're trying to tell me that they should end, but for some reason I'm just not able to hear all of them. They do wonderful things with hearing aids these days. Really, she said, feigning wonder. I didn't know that. Maybe that's the answer. It's about as much help as I can offer. I'm not an artist. She laughed. How was London this morning? Bodhi couldn't wait to see her. I'd say he has a crush on her, but he's too young for something like that. It would have been easy to lie and say something innocuous, but sitting across from Emily, I didn't want to. I don't actually know how she was. She was with Vivian this morning. Then what are you doing here? Vivian forgot to bring the vase she was supposed to paint. I had to bring it to her. Yeah, Emily nodded. I heard about that project as soon as I got there. We weren't here last week, so I guess Bodhi will be making his vase today. He's in there with David right now, and I guess they're kind of on their own. I suppose I should ask why you're here, then. I brought Bodhi. David met us here. He's been staying at one of those extended stay hotels since he's been in town, which is fine for him, but Bodhi doesn't sleep well at that place. So Bodhi's at my house every night, which has meant a lot of back and forth since David's been in town. On the plus side, I've had plenty of time to work since David's spending a lot of time with him, trying to make as many memories as possible, I guess. Like today, they're going go-karting after they finish up here. That's a good thing, isn't it? Of course, she said, with less enthusiasm than I'd expected. What David doesn't understand is that it's going to make it that much harder for Bodhi when he leaves again. Bodhi was finally getting used to him not being around, and I'm going to have to help pick up the pieces. Did you tell him that? How can I? Even though he wasn't a good match for me, he's actually a pretty loving dad. And he's also not a bad person. He made it possible for us to stay in the house and for Bodhi to be able to go to the right school. He was more than generous in our divorce settlement. As she said the word divorce, I thought about the conversation Vivian and I had at lunch and I must have flinched. I'm sorry, Emily said quickly. I really am doing my best not to talk about David. I don't know why his name seems to enter every conversation. It's not that, I said. I clutched my glass of iced tea with both hands. Vivian left me. Emily's mouth widened into an O. Oh. oh my God, she finally breathed. That's awful. I'm not sure what else to say. There's not much you can say. Are you sure you're not just taking some time apart? Like separation? I don't think so. At lunch yesterday, she said we were getting divorced, and she wants us to sit down and talk to London tomorrow night. What happened? I mean, does it bother you if I ask? You don't have to answer, obviously. She's in love with her boss, Walter Spannerman. And she's now living in Atlanta. Oh, boy. Now there was an understatement. Yeah. How are you doing? Okay, sometimes. Not so well at other times. She nodded, her expression soft. I understand exactly what you mean. When did all this happen? And again, you don't have to tell me if you'd rather not. I thought about it before taking a sip of my tea. Though I'd talked endlessly with Marge and Liz, I still felt the need to process it verbally. I'm not sure why, other than that people cope in different ways, and for me, I had to talk, reprise, question, wonder, whine, repeat, repeat, repeat. My sister had been more than patient with me since Vivian had left, but I felt bad that I'd needed her ear to the extent I had. Same with Liz. 
and yet I still felt compelled to process. I felt an overwhelming desire to go through all of it once more. I'd like to tell you about it, but I'm not sure even where to start, I said. I stared out the window. Emily leaned across the table. What are you doing this afternoon? she asked. No plans, I said. Do you want to go for a walk? Or at least get out of here? A walk sounds great. I followed Emily, even though I wasn't sure where she was going. Other than that, it was in the general direction of her place. In time, she turned onto a private drive that led to a private country club, with a membership fee that was a bit out of my league. She pulled into a shady spot not far from the practice putting green, and I parked beside her. This okay? A golf course? It's a gorgeous walk. I'm out here three or four times a week, usually in the mornings. I take it you're a member? David loved to golf, she said. We stepped onto the cart path and began making our way down one of the lush green fairways. As I took in the surroundings, I realized Emily had been right. The fairways and greens were immaculate and generously lined with dogwoods, magnolias, and live oaks. There were neatly trimmed azalea bushes and ponds that sparkled beneath blue skies. A steady breeze kept the temperature tolerable. What happened? She asked. And over the course of the nine or ten holes we traversed, I told her everything. Maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe I should have been more reticent. But once the flow of words started, I seemed unable to stop. I talked and talked, answering Emily's questions whenever they came up. I told her about our marriage and the early years with London. I told her how important it had been to make Vivian happy, my never-ending desire to please her. I spoke about the last year and went into detail describing what an emotional basket case I'd been since Vivian had walked out the door. As I spoke, I was alternately confused and sad, enraged and frustrated, but mainly, I was still at a loss. I felt like someone who thought he'd known the rules of the game he'd been playing, only to learn that the wrong rules had been placed in the box. I appreciate you listening, I said as I came to the end of my sorry tale. I was glad to, she said. I've been through it too, and I get it, believe me. The year that David moved out was the hardest year of my life, she said. And yes, the first couple of months were excruciating. All day, every day, I wondered whether I'd done the right thing by telling him to go. And after that, I'm not saying that I was Mary Poppins. It took probably another four or five months before I began to feel a little bit like my old self again some of the time. But by then, I also kind of knew that Bodie and I were going to make it. How are you now? Better, she said. She cracked a wry smile. Well, most of the time. It's strange, but the more time passes, the less I can remember the bad things while the good memories still linger. Before Bodhi, we used to lie in bed on Sunday mornings and have coffee and read the paper. We didn't even talk that much, but I still recall how comfortable those mornings felt. And like I said, David was always a good father. It would be so much easier if I forgot the good stuff instead. It sounds like it was really hard. It can be awful. Arguing about money is often the worst part. When money's involved, it can get vicious. Was it like that for you? No, thank God. David is more than fair with alimony and child support, and we couldn't make it if he weren't. It doesn't hurt that his family is as rich as Midas and he earns a lot of money, but I also think he felt guilty. It's not that he's a bad guy. He's just not a particularly good husband unless you don't mind constant philandering. I can see how that might be a problem for some. I felt her eyes drift toward me. She might come back, you know. Sometimes they do. I reflected on Friday's lunch and the way she'd acted when I handed off the vase. I remembered what Liz had told me. I don't think so. Even if she realizes she made a mistake? I still don't know that she'd want to come back. I get the sense that she's been unhappy with me for a long time. I tried to be the best husband and father I could be, and it never seemed to be enough. You sound like you're not sure whether I'll believe you. Do you? Of course. Why wouldn't I? Because she left me. That was her decision, and it says less about you than it does about her. I still feel like a failure. I can understand that. I felt the same way. I think most people do. I'm not sure Vivian does. She doesn't seem to care at all. She cares, Emily said, and she's hurting too. Walking away from a marriage isn't easy for anyone. But she's also in love with someone new and that's a big distraction. 
she isn't thinking about the two of you as much as you are, which means she's not hurting as frequently as you are. I think I need a distraction. Oh yeah, that's exactly what you need. Maybe some mid-twenties cheerleader type, right? Or an aerobics teacher? Or maybe a dancer? When I raised an eyebrow, she shrugged and went on. Those were David's preferences. Of course, if push came to shove, he'd sleep with anyone. Sorry. I'm not. He's not my problem anymore, she said. He's dating someone back in Sydney. He told me he's actually thinking about marriage. Already? It's his life, she shrugged. If he asked me, I'd tell him that he should probably give it more time, but he didn't ask, so I didn't offer. And besides, we're divorced. He can do what he wants. I put a hand in my pocket as I walked beside her. How can you do that? Not let it bother you, I mean. When I think about Vivian and Walter, I get so angry and it hurts. I can't disengage. It's still too new, she said. But as tough as I sound and as much as I meant what I said about David, it still hurt when he told me. No one likes to feel they're easily replaced. For a long time, even though I told people that I wanted David to be happy after we'd separated, what I really wanted was for him to sit at home like a hermit, feeling awful about himself and grieving for everything he lost. I imagine Vivian like that. That sounds good. How can we convince them to do that? She laughed. If only it were that easy, right? Exes are never easy. Last weekend he actually hit on me. Seriously? What about his girlfriend? She didn't come up, and I'll admit there was a minute or so where I considered going through with it. He is handsome, and we used to have a good time together. How did it happen? Alcohol, she said, and I laughed. Anyway, he'd been out all day with Bodhi, and when he brought Bodhi home, Bodhi went right to bed. I was having a glass of wine, and I offered him one. One glass led to the next, and he was being his regular charming self, and the next thing I knew his hand was on my knee. I knew what he wanted, and... I waited as she collected her thoughts. She looked over at me. I knew it was a terrible idea, but I still liked the way he made me feel. It's crazy, but that's how it was. It's been a long time since I felt desired and attractive. Part of it's my own fault, of course. It's not like I've really put myself out there in the last year and a half. I've gone on a few dates, and the guys were nice. But I figured out pretty quickly that I wasn't ready to start another relationship which meant that when they called a second time, I always put them off. Sometimes I wish I were the type of person who could sleep around without feeling guilty or like I'm a tramp, but I'm not wired that way. I've never had a one-night stand. Wait, I thought there was this guy in college once. That doesn't count, she said with an airy wave. I have erased that evening from my memory, so it never happened. Ah, I said. Anyway, David started to kiss my neck, and part of me was thinking, oh, why the hell not? Fortunately, I came to my senses. On the plus side, he handled the rejection gracefully. No temper tantrums, no argument, just a shrug and sigh, like I was the one who was really going to be missing out. She shook her head. And I can't believe I just told you all that. It's no big deal. If it makes you feel better, I probably won't remember it. The tornado of emotions I'm living in is wreaking havoc with my memory. May I ask a question? Go ahead. What about London? That's more complicated, I admitted. For now, Vivian thinks it's best that London stay with me since she's traveling so much and hasn't had time to get her place set up. But she was pretty clear that after that she wants London to move to Atlanta. How do you feel about that? I don't want her to go, but I also know that she needs her mom. What does that mean? I don't know. I guess it's something we'll be discussing. To be honest, I don't know anything about this entire process. Have you spoken to an attorney yet? No, I said. She didn't mention divorce until yesterday, and before that I was in no condition to do much of anything. By then I could see the clubhouse in the distance. I wasn't sure how far we'd walked, but we'd been out there for over an hour. My stomach gurgled. Emily must have heard it. Are you hungry? Why don't we grab a bite to eat? I don't think we're dressed for the country club. We'll sit in the bar area. It's casual. It's where golfers end up after they finish their rounds. As much as the walk with Emily had felt necessary, having lunch, just the two of us, at the club, made me feel as though I was crossing a boundary of sorts. I was still married. Vivian and I weren't even legally separated. Hence, this was wrong. And yet, the other side of the equation was obvious, even to me. What would Vivian say to me if she found out? 
that I was crossing a line? That rumors would start? I cleared my throat. Lunch sounds great. The clubhouse was imposing and somewhat stuffy on the outside, but the interior had been recently renovated and was lighter and airier than I'd expected. Windows lined two of the walls, offering a spectacular view of the 18th hole. I spotted a foursome making their way to the putting green, as Emily pointed to a table in the corner, one of the few that wasn't already occupied. How about over there, she said. Fine. I followed her to the table, my eyes drifting lower to the once familiar contours of her legs. Glad she was in shorts. They were tan and lean, the kind of legs that had always caught my eye. After we sat, she leaned across the table. I told you we wouldn't be underdressed. That group just came in from the tennis courts. I didn't notice, I said, but good to know. Have you ever eaten here? Once in the dining room. Jesse Peters has a membership here and we met with a client. I see him every now and then, or used to anyway. I would catch him staring at me. That sounds like him. Oh, if you're interested, the burger here is out of this world, she said. The chef actually won a burger competition on one of those shows on the Food Network. It comes with some amazing sweet potato fries. I haven't had a burger in a long time, I said. Is that what you're getting? Of course. I couldn't help noting that Vivian would never have ordered a burger, nor would she have approved if I'd ordered one. The waitress came by with menus, but Emily shook her head. We're both getting the burgers, she said, and I'd like a glass of Chardonnay. Make it two, I said, surprising myself. Of course, the whole afternoon had been bewildering to that point, but in a good way. Emily, I noticed, was gazing out the window, toward the putting green before she turned back to me. I guess our children are done with our class by now. What do you think London is doing? Vivian probably took her out to lunch. As for what's next, I have no idea. Didn't she tell you? No, I said. Our lunch on Friday was a little tense, so we didn't get around to discussing their plans. They were tense with David, too, for a long time. It's just a hard and awful thing for anyone to live through, even if it has to be done. And only people who've gone through it can understand how terrible it really is. That's not very encouraging, I said. It's true, though. There's no way I could have made it without the support of some really good friends. I probably talked to both Marguerite and Grace on the phone two or three hours a week, maybe more in the beginning. And what was strange was that prior to my divorce, I wasn't particularly close to either of them. But I ended up leaning on them, and they were always there to prop me up when I needed it. They sound like lifesavers. They are. To this day, I'm not sure why they were there for me the way they were. And I'm guessing that you'll probably need the same thing. Two or three people that you can really talk to. It was strange. I thought that my sister Jess or Diane, who was probably my best friend at the time, would be my stalwarts. But it didn't work out that way. What do you mean? It's hard to describe, but Marguerite and Grace always knew how to say the right thing at the right time, in just the right way. Jess and Diane didn't. Sometimes they offered advice I didn't want to hear, or they questioned whether I was doing the right thing when what I really needed was reassurance. Considering this, I wondered who I would lean on. Marge and Liz, obviously, but they sort of counted as one person. I already knew my mom would get too emotional and my dad wouldn't know what to say. As for friends, it dawned on me that I didn't really have any. Between work and my family, I'd let most of my friendships wilt on the vine in the years since London was born. Marge and Liz have been great, I said. I figured they would be. I always liked Marge. The feeling is mutual, I thought. The waiter delivered two glasses of wine. Emily reached for her glass. We should make a toast, she said. To Marge, Liz, Marguerite, Grace, Bodie, and London. The kids, too? Bodie was the real reason I didn't fall apart. Because of him, I couldn't. It'll be the same with London. I knew she was right as soon as she said it. All right, but then I feel like I have to put you in there, too. You've been pretty supportive so far. And you can always call me any time. We fell into small talk then. I told her about London while she spoke about Bodhi. She told me about some of the places she'd traveled in the years since we'd last seen each other. Perhaps because we'd already spoken exhaustively about Vivian and David, their names didn't come up. And for the first time since Vivian had walked out the door, the anxiety I'd been feeling seemed to dissipate entirely. The burgers eventually arrived and we each ordered a second glass of wine. 
The burger, as she'd predicted, was among the best I'd ever had. It was stuffed with cheese and topped with a fried egg, but because my recent lack of appetite had made my stomach shrink, I couldn't eat more than half. Our plates were cleared, but we lingered at the table, finishing our wine. She told me a story about Bodhi giving himself a haircut, laughing aloud when she showed me the picture on her cell phone. He'd lopped off nearly down to the roots an inch-wide chunk of hair in what used to be his bangs. His forehead shone through like a gap between teeth, but what made the photo priceless was his grin. That's great, I laughed. How are you? Initially, I was upset, not only about his hair, but that he'd gotten hold of the scissors in the first place. When I saw how proud of himself he was, though, I started to laugh. The next thing I knew, we were laughing together. Then I grabbed my phone. Now this photo is framed and sits on my bedside table. I'm not sure how I would have reacted if London had done that. And one thing I can say for sure, Vivian would not have laughed. No? She wasn't a big laugher. In fact, I couldn't remember the last time I'd heard her laugh. Even with Marge? Marge used to crack me up all the time. Especially with Marge. They don't really get along that well. How is that possible? Does she still tease you? Mercilessly. Emily laughed again, and I was reminded of how much I had always liked the sound of her laugh, melodic and genuine at the same time. You know what, she said. This day turned out a lot better than I thought it would. If you hadn't come along, I don't know what I'd be doing, probably staring at my paintings in frustration or cleaning the house. I'd probably be working. This is way better. Agreed. Would you like another glass? Of course, she said, but I won't. I have to drive, but go ahead if you want one. I'm fine, too. What are you doing tonight? Like you, I'll be hanging out with my sister. You remember Jess? She and Brian invited me to dinner. That sounds fun. Hmm, not so sure. I sometimes wonder if Brian thinks I'm putting ideas in Jess's head, like about getting divorced. Are they having troubles? All married couples have troubles now and then. It kind of goes with the institution itself. Why is marriage so hard? Who knows? I think it's probably because people get married without knowing who they really are in the first place, or how they're crazy. Are you crazy? Of course. And I don't mean crazy crazy. I mean in the way that everyone is. One person might be too sensitive to perceived slights, or another might get really angry when they don't get their way. Another shuts down or holds grudges for weeks. That's what I'm talking about. We all do things that are unhealthy in relationships, but I'm not sure people recognize that unless they're really self-aware. And when you consider that each partner brings his or her own set of issues, it's a miracle that any marriage has lasted the duration. That's a little pessimistic, don't you think? Your parents have been married forever. Mine have too. But are they happy with each other? Or are they together out of habit? Or because they're afraid to be alone? In the coffee shop earlier, I was watching this older couple a few tables over. They may have been together for 50 years, but I don't think they said a single word to each other. I thought about my parents, remembering that Marge and I had wondered the same thing. Do you think you'll ever get married again? I don't know, she said. Sometimes I think I want to, but other times I think I'm happy being alone, too. And with Bodhi, it's not as though I have a lot of energy to devote to finding a new life partner. What I can say is that I'm a lot clearer on the kind of person that I want if it ever comes to that. I've decided to be very picky. I was quiet, suddenly returning to Vivian, bringing with her an almost physical weight. I don't know what's going to happen with Vivian, and I still don't know why she was so unhappy with me. Maybe she was just unhappy, and maybe she just thinks she's happier with someone new, but sustained happiness isn't something someone else can deliver. It comes from within. That's why there are antidepressants. That's what people hopefully learn in therapy. That's very zen. It took me a while to finally accept that David's philandering wasn't about me, or whether I was pretty enough or affectionate enough. It was about David's need to prove to himself that he was desirable and powerful, and the way he did that was by sleeping with other women. In the end, I know I did my best to make our marriage work, and I know that's all I can ask of myself. She reached across the table and put her hand on my arm. The same goes for you too, Russ. When she removed her hand, the warmth and comfort of her touch lingered, a physical affirmation of her words. Thank you, I managed to say. You're welcome, and I mean it. You're a good guy. 
you don't know me that well anymore. Actually, I think I do. You're pretty much the same guy you always were. And I blew it with you. You made a mistake. I know you didn't do it to hurt me, and again, I've forgiven you. You still need to forgive yourself. I'm working on it, but you're kind of making it hard since you're being so nice about it. Would you rather I be cruel and vindictive? If you were, I'd probably crumble. No, you wouldn't. You're stronger than you think. We'd finished our wine, and by unspoken agreement, we rose from the table. A glance at my watch showed that we'd spent nearly three hours together, which didn't seem possible. We started toward the exit and made our way to our cars. Remember what I said about finding a couple of good friends to lean on? You're probably going to need them. Are you volunteering? I already did, remember? And I hate to tell you this, but if my experience is any guide, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. I can't imagine how it can get worse. I hope for your sake that it doesn't. I reached for her door, opening it for her. Me too. Rewind and start from the beginning, Marge said. You went for a long walk and then had lunch with Emily? And you drank wine? She and Liz had gotten home a few minutes earlier. On the way, they'd called asking what I wanted for dinner. They were planning to pick up Mexican takeout, and when I told her that I wasn't hungry, Marge said she'd pick something up for me anyway. In the to-go box was a burrito the size of a softball, along with rice and refried beans. Marge and Liz had both ordered taco salads, and we took our seats at the table. Yeah, I said. What's the big deal? Marge paused and took a puff from her inhaler before smirking. Let's just call it an act two twist I never saw coming. Really? Liz asked between bites. They did have that date at Chick-fil-A, remember? Would you stop with the date talk? We walked, we talked, we had lunch. That's what a date is. But fine, my question is whether you think you'll call her again. Her son Bodie is London's best friend. If we have to set up a play date, I might have to. That's not what I meant. I know what you meant, I said. I have no interest in dating anyone. Right now I can't imagine wanting to date ever again. What I didn't say was that even though I didn't want to date, I didn't much like the concept of being alone either. What I wanted was for Vivian and me to go back to what we had before. I wanted to rewind and start over. Marge seemed to read my mind. Have you heard from Vivian about what time you can go home tomorrow? Not yet. I'm going to call London later. I figure she'll tell me then. Marge pointed to the burrito. You're not eating. I wouldn't be able to finish this if I were stranded on a desert island for a month. Why don't you at least try a bite? I did as she asked. While it was tasty, I was still full from the hamburger, and I turned toward Liz. Did you learn any Mexican recipes in your class? Liz nodded as she poked at her salad. A few. I could have made you something, but I was feeling kind of lazy, and I would have had to run to the store. Do you have some easy and healthy recipes? Meals that London would enjoy? Plenty. Do you want me to pick a few favorites? Would you? I want to keep things normal, but I'm not very experienced in the kitchen. I do want to keep London on a good schedule, though, which includes dinner. I'll have some recipes for you by tomorrow. I appreciate it, I said. How was the housewarming party? It was a lot of fun, Liz said. The house is very stylish. Even though our friends just moved in, they had all their paintings hung. It was actually pretty impressive. Automatically, I wondered whether they owned any of Emily's. I wondered, too, how Emily's night with her sister Jess was going. Under Marge's scrutiny, I forked another piece of the burrito. Today was the first time I didn't think about Vivian every waking minute. Marge offered a thoughtful expression. What was that like? Strange, I said. But I think it was good for me. I don't feel quite as anxious now. You're beginning to heal, Russ, Marge said to me. You're stronger than you think. I smiled, remembering that Emily had said exactly the same thing. After dinner, I dialed Vivian using FaceTime, and she answered on the second ring. Hey there, she said. London and I are cuddled up watching a movie. Can she call you back a little later? Hi, Daddy, I heard London call out. Nemo and Dory are with the sharks. Yeah, sure, I said. Did you two have a good time today? We had a lot of fun, Vivian said. She'll call you back, okay? I love you, Daddy, London shouted. Miss you. A sound of her voice made my heart ache. That's fine, I said. I'll be around. I carried my phone with me while I helped Marge and Liz in the kitchen. 
I kept it on the table beside me when Marge brought out the Scrabble board. Liz, I learned, took the game seriously, and she was good. By the end, she'd outscored both my sister and me combined, but the game was a lot more fun than I remembered. It was almost enjoyable enough, in fact, to make me forget the fact that London didn't call back. Almost. But not quite. In the morning, I received a text from Vivian. Can you come by at 6.30? Let me know if that works for you. It struck me as kind of late, especially since she had to drive back, but I wasn't going to point that out. She was trying to spend as much time with London as she could, but because I was still annoyed that I hadn't had a chance to talk to London, I put my phone aside without responding. I didn't text her back until almost two in the afternoon. My run that morning was nearly eight miles, and when I got home, I did a hundred push-ups. Only when I'd showered did my irritation begin to wane. Liz put together a small recipe book of about 15 recipes, most with no more than six different ingredients. Afterward, she showed me how to meal plan, and we went to the grocery store to stock up on everything I would need. Though Marge and Liz would disagree, I nonetheless felt a bit like a third wheel, and after lunch I hopped in the car and drove to the bookstore. I had never been a big reader, but I found myself wandering to the relationship section of the bookstore. There were a few shelves of books about coping with divorce, and I thumbed through all of them before finally selecting a few. When I was checking out, I was sure that the clerk would read the titles before glancing at me with pity, but the teenage girl with pink hair behind the register simply scanned the books before shoving them into a bag and asking me whether I'd like to pay in cash or with credit. Afterward, I decided to swing by the park, on the off chance that London would be there. If she was, I wasn't sure whether I would intrude, but I wanted to see her. It occurred to me that I was behaving like an addict who was suffering from withdrawal, but I didn't care. When I got to the park, there was no sign of Vivian in London. I pulled in anyway. With the temperatures cooling off a bit this weekend, there were more kids there than usual. I took a seat on the bench and opened one of the books. I began to read, at first because I thought I should, but after half an hour because I wanted to. What I learned was that Marge, Liz, and Emily had been right. Though it may have felt otherwise, what I was going through wasn't unique. The emotional swings, the self-blame, the circular questions and sense of failure were par for the course when it came to most divorces. But reading about it, as opposed to simply hearing it, made it seem more real somehow. And by the time I finally closed the book, I felt a little better. I thought about returning to Marge's, but instead I spotted a boy who resembled Bodie, and I reached for my phone. When Emily picked up, I rose from my seat, inexplicably nervous. I walked toward the fence that lined the perimeter. Hello? Hey there, I said. It's me, Russ. What's going on? You doing okay? I'm fine, I said. Just missing London and had to get out of the house. How are you doing? About the same. David and Bodie are at the movies right now. I think they're going out for pizza later, which means that I've been staring at my paintings again. Have you deciphered the whispers yet? Working on it. What have you been up to today? I ran eight miles. Felt pretty good, too. I hung out with Marge and Liz, went to the bookstore. Now I'm just killing time and thought I'd call to say thanks for yesterday. My pleasure. I had a great time, she said. I felt a strange sense of relief at that. How was dinner with your sister last night? She and her hubby had been arguing before I got there. Though they kept it mostly in check, I still noticed a lot of glaring and heard more than half a dozen deep sighs. It was kind of like a stroll down memory lane, what with David and all. I laughed. That sounds awful. It wasn't pretty. But Jess called this morning to apologize. And then, right after, she launched into yet another story about how Brian seemed intent on antagonizing her. We continued to chat while I circled the park, and more than once I caught myself smiling. I had forgotten how easy Emily was to talk to, how intently she listened, and how freely she volunteered information about herself. She never seemed to take too much too seriously, a trait she had always possessed but now felt seasoned by maturity. It made me wish I could be more like her. After forty minutes, we finally ended the call. Like yesterday, the time seemed to pass effortlessly. As I walked back to my car, I wondered why Vivian and I hadn't been able to talk with the same ease, and by allowing her name to slip into my consciousness, I felt another burst of frustration that I hadn't been able to speak to London. Preventing my daughter from talking to her mother was something I'd never done, not since Vivian had walked out the door. Emily, I thought to myself, would never do something like that. 
and as I slid into the car, I found myself thinking about how naturally beautiful Emily was. No makeup masking skin with a slightly olive undertone. No expensive highlights or collagen fillers. She was more beautiful now, I thought to myself, than she'd been when we'd dated. Emily, I realized, had sounded happy to hear from me, and I couldn't deny that it made me feel better. People-pleasing is best when it happens easily, after all, and where I constantly felt like I was struggling to please Vivian, it seemed that with Emily, all I had to do was be me, and that was more than enough. And yet, as much of a distraction as Emily had been, I hadn't been lying to Marge or Liz. As an old friend, and an attractive one at that, it was understandable that I'd enjoyed spending time with Emily, and it probably made sense that I'd called her. I felt comfortable with her, just as I always had. What it didn't mean was that I was ready or even interested in a relationship. After all, healthy relationships required two well-adjusted people, and at the present time I wasn't enough for her. I said as much to Marge before I left for home, but she just shook her head. That's Vivian's voice you're hearing in your head, she said to me. If you saw yourself the way everyone else does, you'd know what a catch you really are. I arrived at the house at half past six and hesitated at the door, wondering if I should knock. It was ridiculous, of course, and the fact I felt that way led to a growing sense of frustration, one that was directed more at myself than at Vivian. Why did I still care so much about what she thought? Habit, I silently heard myself answer, and I knew that habits could take a long time to break. I opened the door and stepped inside, but there was no sign of London or Vivian. I heard sounds coming from upstairs and I moved toward the steps when Vivian rounded into view, holding a glass of wine. She beckoned to me, and I followed her into the kitchen. Glancing around, I noticed pans and plates piled in the sink, and neither the stove nor the counters had been wiped. There was half a glass of milk and a placemat that still sat on the table, and I knew in that moment that she had no intention of cleaning the kitchen before she left. I felt as though I no longer knew her, if I ever did. London's upstairs in the bath, she said without preamble. I told her that I'd come and get her in a few minutes because we needed to talk to her, but I thought we should get on the same page first. Didn't we already cover this on Friday? Yes, but I wanted to make sure you remembered. Her comment felt like an insult. I remember. Good, she said. I also think it'll be easier for London if I take the lead because you don't want her to know about Walter, right? This is your show, I said. What's that supposed to mean? Just what I said, I said. You're making all the decisions. You've yet to ask what I might want. Why are you in such a cranky mood? Was she serious? Why didn't you have London call me back last night? Because she fell asleep. Not ten minutes after you called, she was sound asleep on the couch. What was I supposed to do, wake her up? You see her every day, I don't. That was your choice. You're the one who walked out. Her eyes narrowed, and I thought I saw in them not simply anger, but hatred. She kept her voice steady. I was hoping we'd be able to behave like adults tonight, but it seems pretty clear that you have different plans. You're trying to blame all this on me? I just want you to hold yourself together while we talk to our daughter. The other option is to make it as painful as possible for her. Which would you prefer? I would prefer not to be doing this at all. I would prefer you and I had an honest discussion about salvaging our marriage. She turned away. There's nothing to talk about. It's over. You should be receiving the settlement agreement this week. Settlement agreement? I had my attorney put it together. It's pretty standard. By standard, I'm sure it stipulated that London was living with her in Atlanta, and I felt my insides twist. All at once, I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to lose my wife and daughter. I didn't want to lose everything, but I was nothing but a bystander, watching my life unravel in ways that seemed entirely beyond my control. I was exhausted, and when the nausea finally passed, my body felt as if it might dissolve. Let's just get this over with. London handled it better than I thought she would, but then again it was clear to me London was so exhausted that her attention seemed to wander. Add in her ruddy nose and I had the sense that what she really wanted was to go to sleep. As I'd expected, Vivian omitted much of the truth and kept the conversation so short that I found myself wondering why she deemed it so critical in the first place. By the end, I suspected London had no idea that anything was actually changing between Vivian and me. She was as used to Vivian traveling as I was. 
The only time she became upset was when it came time for Vivian to leave. Both she and Vivian were in tears as they hugged goodbye in the driveway, and London's sobs grew worse as Vivian finally pulled away. I carried her inside, my shirt growing damp in spots from her tears. Her bedroom smelled like a farm. In addition to cleaning the kitchen, I would have to clean the hamster cage. I gave London some additional cold medicine, put her in bed. She scooted closer to me and I slipped my arm around her. I wish Mommy didn't have to leave, she said. I know it's hard, I said. Did you have a good time this weekend? When she nodded, I went on. What did you do? We went shopping and watched movies. We also went to the petting zoo. They had these cute goats that fall over onto their sides when they get scared. But I didn't scare them. Did you go to the park or ride your bike? No, I rode the carousel at the mall, though. I rode a unicorn. That sounds fun. She nodded again. Mommy said you have to remember to clean the hamster cage. I know, I said. The cage is kind of smelly tonight. Yeah, she said. Mommy didn't want to hold Mr. and Mrs. Sprinkles because they were smelly too. I think they need a bath. I don't know if hamsters can take baths. I'll find out. On the computer? Yes. The computer knows a lot of stuff, she said. It sure does. Hey, Daddy? Yes? Can we go bike riding? How about we give it a couple of days until you feel better? You also have dance class, remember? I remember, she said without enthusiasm. Trying to keep her slightly improved mood from going downhill, I brightened. Did you get to see Bodhi this weekend? He was in art class. I painted my vase. With yellow flowers and pink mouses? Can I see it? Mommy took it with her. She said it was really pretty. I'm sure it was, I said, trying to hide my disappointment. I wish I could have seen it. Do you want me to make you one? I can. And I think I can paint my mouses even better. I'd love that, sweetie. I cleaned the hamster cage in the kitchen. Though I hadn't noticed earlier, I also had to straighten up the family room. Barbies and their accessories had been strewn about, blankets needed to be folded and returned to the appropriate chest, and a half-eaten bowl of popcorn had to be emptied into the trash before being washed and dried. Remembering I still had dinners my mom had prepared, I moved a few Tupperware containers from the freezer to the refrigerator. I also unloaded the groceries I'd picked up with Liz and Marge earlier. Later, I crawled into bed and caught the scent of perfume, one that I knew Vivian had been wearing. It was light and flowery, but otherwise unknown to me, and I knew I'd never sleep. I stripped the bedding and put clean sheets on the bed. I wondered if she'd intended any message by leaving behind dirty sheets or a messy house. It might have been anger, but I didn't think so. My gut was telling me that she no longer cared how I might feel, because she no longer cared about me at all. Chapter 17. Moving Forward and Backward When I was dating Emily before I did something stupid, we spent the first week of July in Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. With two other couples, we'd rented a house close enough to the water that we could hear the waves breaking in unrelenting rhythm. Though we'd split the rent three ways, it was still a stretch for all of us, so we'd brought coolers packed with food we'd purchased at the grocery store. We planned to cook instead of going out to restaurants, and as the sun started to go down, we'd fire up the grill and start our feast. In the evenings, we'd drink beer on the porch to the sound of the radio, and I can remember thinking that it was the first of many such vacations Emily and I would end up taking together. The 4th of July was particularly special. Emily and I woke before the others, walking the beach as the sun began to rise. By the time everyone got out of bed, we'd set up our spot on the beach, complete with a steamer I'd rented to cook the scallops and shrimp that had been unloaded at the docks only a few hours earlier. We supplemented the seafood with corn on the cob and potato salad, and set up an inexpensive volleyball net. When our friends finally joined us, we spent the rest of the day in the sun, kicking back, wading in the surf and coating ourselves with sunscreen. There was a carnival in town that week, set up in the main traffic circle near the beach, about a quarter mile from where we were staying. It was one of those traveling carnivals with rickety rides, overpriced tickets, and games that were almost impossible to win. There was, however, a Ferris wheel, and half an hour before the fireworks were supposed to start, Emily and I ditched the group and climbed aboard the ride. I figured we'd have plenty of time to rejoin our friends afterward, but as fate would have it, the ride broke down just as Emily and I reached the apex. While stalled at the top, 
I could see workers tinkering with either the engine or the generator. Later I saw someone race off, only to return carrying a large and obviously heavy toolbox. The ride operator shouted up to us that we'd have the ride working again shortly, but warned us not to rock the carts. Though the day had been sweltering, the wind was gusting, and I slipped my arm around Emily as she leaned into me. She wasn't frightened, nor was I. Even if the engine was fried, I was sure there was some sort of manual hand crank they could use to eventually unload everyone. From our vantage point in the sky, we watched people as they moved among the carnival booths and stared at the carpet of house and streetlights that seemed to stretch for miles. In time, I heard the familiar thwump of a firework being launched from a barge offshore, just before sparkling fingers of gold and green and red expanded across the sky. Wow, Emily breathed, something she repeated throughout the hour and a half we remained stuck on the Ferris wheel. The wind was pushing the scent of gunpowder down the beach, and as I pulled Emily closer, I remember thinking that I would propose to Emily before the year was up. It was around that time that our friends finally spotted us. They were on the beach, people in miniature, and when they figured out that we were stuck, they began to whoop and point. One of the girls shouted up to us that if we planned on spending the night up there, we should probably order a pizza. Emily giggled before growing quiet. I'm going to pretend that you paid the workers down there to stall the Ferris wheel on purpose, she finally said. Why? Because, she said, for as long as I live, I don't think another Fourth of July will ever measure up to this one. On Monday morning, London woke with a red nose and continuing sniffles. Though she wasn't coughing, I debated whether to send her to school, but when I suggested as much, she began to fuss. The teacher is bringing in her goldfish today, and I get to feed him. Plus, it's coloring day. I wasn't sure what coloring day entailed, but it was obviously a big deal to her. I gave her some cold medicine at breakfast, and she skipped off to class. I noticed when dropping London off that the teacher had a cold, too, which made me feel better about my decision. On my way back to the car, I caught myself wondering what Vivian was doing, and immediately shoved the thought away. Who cares? I reminded myself. But more important, I had a commercial to film later that week and another client I needed to impress. At the office, I was swamped with work. I confirmed everything I needed to film Taglieri's third commercial on Friday. I touched base with the tech guy for the plastic surgeon, and even managed to meet with an animal trainer, who claimed to have just the dog I needed to film the fourth commercial for Taglieri. We set a date for filming on Thursday of the following week. Which meant, fortunately, that I didn't have time to think about Vivian much at all. The settlement agreement was delivered via FedEx on Tuesday afternoon. It also came via email, but I couldn't bring myself to read either version. Instead, I called Joey Taglieri and asked if he would look it over. We agreed to meet at an Italian restaurant not far from his office the following day. I found him at a booth in the corner, the table topped with a red and white checkered tablecloth and a manila folder lying on a pad of yellow legal paper. He was drinking a glass of mineral water, and when I sat, he slid a piece of paper toward me, along with a pen. Before we get into this, you need to sign a retainer agreement. I told you that I don't do family law anymore, but I can make an exception for you. I can also recommend some attorneys, including the guy who handled my second divorce, but I'm not sure how much they'll be able to help you for reasons I'll get to in a moment. The point is, no matter who you choose, everything you tell me will be covered by attorney-client privilege, even if you ultimately decide to work with someone else. I signed the retainer agreement and slid it back to him. Satisfied, he leaned back. You want to tell me what happened? I told the same story I had to Marge and Liz and my parents and Emily. By then, I felt as though I'd told the story a hundred times. Taglieri jotted notes along the way. When I finished, he leaned back and said, All right. I think I got it. I also reviewed the document, and I guess the first thing that you should know is that it looks like she intends to file for divorce in Georgia, not North Carolina. Why would she do that? Georgia and North Carolina have different laws. In North Carolina, a couple has to be legally separated for a year before divorce can be granted. That doesn't mean you have to live in separate places, but both of you have to understand that you're separated. After the year is up, one of you files for divorce. The other side then has 30 days to file an answer, but that can be sped up a bit, at which point you get on the court calendar. When your time comes, divorce is granted. In Georgia, there is no separated for a year requirement. 
There is, however, a residency requirement. Vivian can't file for divorce until she's been a resident of the state for six months. But after that, it can be granted in 30 days, assuming everything has been worked out between the two of you. In essence, because she's been living in Atlanta since September 8th, or maybe even before that, she'll be able to obtain a divorce next March or April, instead of next year around this time. In other words, she cuts six months off the process. There are a couple of other differences concerning fault and no fault that I doubt will pertain to you. I'm guessing she'll file no fault, which essentially means the marriage is broken. So she's in a rush to dump me, huh? No comment, he said with a grimace. Anyway, that's one of the reasons I've decided to offer my services if you want them. I passed the bar in Georgia as well as North Carolina. Go Bulldogs! While the attorneys I use for my divorce haven't. In other words, it's either work with me or get an attorney in Georgia. Also, I made some calls this morning. Apparently, Vivian's attorney is a real piece of work. I've never dealt with her, but she has the reputation of being a bully who likes to wear down the other side until they just throw in the towel. She's also very selective when it comes to clients, so my guess is span them and pulled some strings to get her to agree to represent your wife. What do I do? I have no idea where to start. Just what you're doing right now. You've retained legal counsel. And trust me, nobody knows what to do in the beginning unless they've been through it before. Long story short, in Georgia there are documents that will have to be filed, everything from disclosure statements, marital settlement agreements, to an affidavit regarding custody. Her attorney will probably press to have everything ready by the six-month mark, so there's going to be a lot of back and forth between counsel. What about the settlement agreement she sent? That's essentially a contract between the two of you. It covers alimony and property division, things like that. What about London? That's where it can get tricky. The courts retain the right to make decisions regarding custody, visitation, and child support. Now, the two of you can come to an agreement and the court will take that into account, but they're not bound by it. If it's reasonable, though, the court will usually go along with what the two of you decide. Because London is so young, she won't have much of a say at all. That's probably for the best. I suspected he'd have to go over all of this again. What did Vivian want? Taglieri reached into the folder and pulled out the agreement. He began to flip through the pages. As far as property division goes, for the most part she wants half. That's half the equity in the house, half the money in your banking and investment accounts, half of your retirement. She wants the SUV and half of the value of the contents of the house in cash. She also wants an additional chunk of change, which I'm guessing is half the total you invested in your business. I suddenly felt as though I'd been donating blood for a week. Is that all? Well, there's also alimony. Alimony? She earns more than I do right now and she's dating a billionaire. I'm not saying she'll get it. I suspect she'll use it, along with the rest of the proposed property division, as leverage to get what she really wants. London. Yeah, he said. London. After my meeting with Taglieri, there was no time to return to the office. Instead, I drove to the school and got there early. I was at the front of the car line. I was looking over the separation agreement to crowd it out all other thoughts when I heard a tapping on my window. Emily. She was wearing tight faded jeans with tears at the knees, along with a form-fitting top, and the sight of her made something lift inside me. Opening the door, I stepped out into the sunlight. Hey there, I said. How are you? I feel like I'm supposed to ask you that question. I've been thinking about you the last few days, and wondering how Sunday night went. It went as well as something like that could, I guess. Vivian did most of the talking. How's London doing? She seems all right, other than the fact that she's still getting over a cold. Bodhi, too. He just came down with it yesterday. I think more than half the class is sick right now. It's like a leper colony in there. She seemed to study me for a moment. Other than that, how are you holding up? So-so, I admitted. I had to meet with an attorney today. Oh, yuck, she said. I hated that part of it. It wasn't a lot of fun, I said. It still feels like a dream. Like it's not really happening. Even though I know that it is. She looked straight at me and as she held me in her sights, I was struck by the length of her eyelashes. Had they always been that long? I found myself struggling to remember. Did you have your questions answered? She asked. I wasn't even sure what questions to ask. That's what I was looking over in the car, 
Vivian sent a proposed separation agreement. I'm not a lawyer, but if you have questions, you can call. I might not be able to answer all of them, of course. I appreciate that, I said. I could see more cars pulling into line, a steady flow now. As far as I could tell, I was the only male in the pickup line. As I faced Emily, I suddenly heard Vivian's voice in my head. Rumors. And wondered if any of the mothers in the car line were watching us. Automatically, I took a slight step backward and slipped my hand into my pocket. Did David leave for Australia? She nodded. Yesterday evening. Was Bodhi upset? Very. And then, of course, he wakes up sick as a dog. And no word when he'll be back? He said that he might be able to visit for a few days around Christmas. That's good. Sure, if he actually shows. He said the same thing last year. He's good at saying things. The problem is he's not always so good at follow-through. I wondered where London would be this Christmas. I wondered where I would be. Uh-oh, she said, tilting her head. I said something wrong, didn't I? You sort of drifted off there. Sorry, I was just thinking about some of the things the lawyer said to me today. It looks like I might have to sell the house. Oh no, really? I'm not sure there's another option. It's not as though I have enough cash on hand to simply pay Vivian off. That was putting it mildly. If I gave in to all her demands, I'd be flat broke. Add in alimony and child support, and I wasn't even sure whether I could afford a two-bedroom apartment. It'll all work out, she said. I know it's sometimes hard to believe, but it will. I hope so. Right now, I just want to... Escape, you know? You need a break from all this, she said, putting her hands on her hips. Why don't you guys come with Bodhi and me to the zoo in Ashboro this Saturday? What about art class? Please. She tossed the length of her thick hair over her shoulder. The kids can skip a day, and I know Bodhi would be thrilled. Has London ever been there? No, I said. The directness of her offer was disarming, and I struggled to come up with a response. Was she asking me on a date? Or was this more about Bodhi in London? Thanks, I said. I'll let you know. By then, I could see teachers beginning to congregate near the door, students assembling by classroom. Emily noticed it, too. I should get back to my car, she said. I don't want to hold up the line. It takes them long enough as it is. Good seeing you, Russ. She waved. You too, Emily. I watched her walk away, trying to decipher the meaning of her invitation. But as she drew farther away, I felt the distinct urge to see more of her. I may not be ready, and it might be too soon. But I suddenly wanted that more than anything. Hey, Emily! I called out. She turned. What time are you thinking of leaving? When we got home, London was feeling a little better, so we went for a bike ride. I let her take the lead, following along as we traversed the streets of the neighborhood. Her biking ability was improving with every ride. I still had to caution her to move to the side of the road when a car approached, but kids on bicycles were a common sight in the neighborhood, and most drivers gave us a wide berth. We rode for an hour. Once home, she ate a snack and went upstairs to dress for dance. It seemed to take forever, and after a while I went up to check on her. I found her sitting on the bed, still wearing the same outfit she'd worn earlier. I took a seat beside her. What's wrong, sweetie? I don't want to go to dance tonight, she said. I'm sick. Her cold hadn't adversely affected her bike ride, so I knew something else was going on. Namely, that she didn't like dance class or Miss Hamshaw. And who could blame her? If you're too tired or still feeling sick, you don't have to go. Really? Of course not. Mommy might get mad. Your mom left us, I thought but I didn't say that. I'll talk to her. If you're sick, you're sick. But is there something else going on? No. Because if there is, you can tell me. When she added nothing else, I put my arm around her. Do you like going to dance? It's important, she said, as if reciting a sacred rule. Mommy used to dance. That's not what I asked. I asked if you like it. I don't want to be a tree. I frowned. Honey? Can you tell me a little more about what's going on? There's two groups in my class. One group is going away to dance at the competition. They're the good dancers. I'm in the other group. We have to dance too, but only for our parents. And I have to be a tree in the dance we're doing. Oh, I said. And that's bad? Yes, it's bad. I'm just supposed to move my arms when the leaves grow and fall. Can you show me? With a sigh, she got up from the bed. 
She made a circle with her arms above her head, her fingertips touching. Then, separating her arms, she wiggled her fingers as she lowered her hands to her side. When she finished, she took a seat beside me on the bed again. I wasn't quite sure what to say. If it makes you feel any better, you were a very good tree, I finally offered. It's for the bad dancers, Daddy, because I'm not good enough to play the frog or the butterfly or the swan or the fish. I tried to imagine what those animals would be doing and how the dance would unfold, but what was the point? I figured I'd see it soon enough. How many other girls are trees? Just me and Alexandra. I wanted to be the butterfly, and I practice really hard, and I know all the moves. But Miss Hamshaw said that Molly gets to be the butterfly. In the world of a five-year-old, I supposed this was a very big deal. When is the show? I don't know. She told us, but I forgot. I made a note to check with Miss Hamshaw. Before or after class, obviously, so I didn't offend or disrupt her. Do you want to go to the zoo this weekend? With me and Bodie and Miss Emily? What? The zoo. Miss Emily and Bodie are going. She invited us. But I don't want to go if you'd rather not. A real zoo? With lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. She furred her little brow. Why did you say oh my? She finally asked. It's from a movie called The Wizard of Oz. Have I seen it? No, I said. What's it about? It's about a girl named Dorothy. Her house gets picked up by a tornado and she lands in a place called Oz. She meets a lion and a tin man and a scarecrow, and they try to find the wizard so she can go back home. Is there a bear and a tiger in the movie too? Not that I can recall. Then why does the girl say it? That's a good question. I don't know. Maybe because she was afraid she might run into them. I'm not afraid of bears, but tigers are scary. They can be really mean. Yeah? I learned that when I watched The Jungle Book. Ah, uh, I said. Is Mommy going to come to the zoo too? No, I said. She's working. She seemed to consider that. Okay, she said. Since Bodie's going, we can go too. When Vivian FaceTimed later that evening, I noticed she was dressed as though she were about to go out to dinner, no doubt with Spannerman. I said nothing to her about it, but as she visited with London, the thought stewed in the back of my mind. Eventually, London wandered back to me, holding out the phone. Mommy needs to talk to you. Okay, sweetie, I said, taking it. I waited until she was gone before raising the screen. What's up? I asked. I wanted to let you know that I'm going to be out of town this week and it might be hard to reach me. Every part of me wanted the details, but I forced myself not to ask. Okay. She had apparently expected me to press for more information as my single-word answer seemed to throw her off. All right, she went on after an awkward pause. Anyway, I'll definitely be in Charlotte to see her next weekend, and I'd like to stay in the house again. Without me, I said. I tried hard not to appear wounded. I'm thinking about London here, so yes, without you. And of course, her birthday is two weekends after that, and I'd like to do the same thing. Stay in the house, I mean. Her birthday's on a Friday, but I want to put together a birthday party with her friends on Saturday. You should obviously come to her party, but after that, it would probably be best if you let us have the rest of the weekend to ourselves. It's her birthday weekend, I protested. I'd like to spend time with her, too. You're with her all the time, Ross, she said, raising her chin. She's in school and at her activities. You might think I get a lot of downtime with her, but I don't. She gave an annoyed sigh. You get to see her every night. You get to read to her. You get to see her every single morning. I don't. Because you left, I said, enunciating slowly. Because you moved to Atlanta. So you'd keep me from seeing my daughter? What kind of father are you? And on that subject, you shouldn't have let her miss dance class today. She has a cold, I said. She was tired. How is she supposed to improve if you keep letting her miss class? The accusatory tone made my back stiffen. This is the first one she missed. It's not the end of the world. Besides, I don't think she even likes dance class. You're missing the point, Vivian said, narrowing her eyes at me. If she wants a bigger role the next time they have a show, she can't miss classes. You're setting her up to be disappointed again. And my point was, I don't think she'll care since she doesn't like dance in the first place. I could see her chest rise and fall, a flush creeping up past the neckline of her black cocktail dress. Why are you doing this? What am I doing now? What you always do, finding fault, trying to pick a fight. 
Why is it that when I tell you what I think or offer an opinion that's different from yours, you accuse me of trying to pick a fight? Oh, for God's sake. I'm just so sick and tired of your crap. I can't even tell you. With that, she disconnected the call. It bothered me more than it should have, but I noted with grim satisfaction that it bothered me less than it would have had we still been together. In fact, it bothered me less than it would have yesterday. Perhaps that was progress. At work for the next two days, I hopped from one project to the next, just like earlier in the week. I touched base with the patients that the plastic surgeon had recommended and scheduled times on October 6th to get them on camera. That was going to be a long day. On Friday, I filmed the third commercial, making sure to place the camera below desk level so we could shoot the young actress from below. This way, her age was emphasized to comic effect. The takes were so good that even members of the camera crew laughed. Perfect. That evening, I brought London to dance class as usual. Despite a clear lack of enthusiasm, she'd come downstairs dressed in her outfit and reminded me that we shouldn't be late. I didn't ask again whether it was something she wanted to do. I'm sure that Vivian had rebuked London just as she had me, and I had no desire to put London in an awkward position. I, more than anyone, knew how guilty Vivian could make someone feel. Seeing her sitting on the couch in the family room with her shoulders slightly caved in, I took a seat beside her. What would you like to do after dance? I asked. I don't know, she mumbled. Because I was thinking that maybe, just maybe, you and I could... I stopped. A couple of seconds passed before she looked over at me. What could we do? It's nothing, I said. Never mind. What is it? Well, the thing is, you might not want to do it. I pretended to lose interest. Tell me, she pressed. I forced out a long exhale. I was thinking that since Mommy isn't here, maybe you and I could have a date night. London knew all about our date nights, even if she wasn't aware of all that transpired between Vivian and me. Her expression was one of wonder. A date night? Just you and me? That's what I was thinking. After dance, we can get dressed up and cook dinner together, and then after that we could either color or do some finger painting or maybe even watch a movie. But only if you want to, I said. I want to. You do, huh? What do you want to eat? She brought a finger to her chin. I think I want chicken, she said, and I nodded. That sounds delicious. That's just what I wanted, too. But I don't want a finger paint. It might get on my dress. How about coloring? I'm not very good, but I can try. She beamed. It's okay that you're not very good, Daddy. You can practice. That sounds like a great idea. For the first time since I'd started ferrying London to and from her activities, she was in a good mood on the way to dance, though the class had nothing to do with it. Instead, I listened to a constant stream of ideas about what she could wear that evening. She debated which dress to wear and whether to pair it with a sparkly hair clip or bow and what shoes would match best. Once inside, Miss Hamshaw motioned for her to proceed to the floor, but she suddenly turned around and ran back to envelop me in a hug before dashing to the door. Miss Hamshaw evinced no reaction, which I suppose was as much as she could offer in the way of kindness. While London was in class, I ran to the grocery store and picked up the makings for dinner. Knowing that we had an early morning the following day, we would meet at Emily's at 8, I opted for a rotisserie chicken from the deli, canned corn, sliced pears, applesauce from a jar, and clear grape juice. If we started eating at half past 6, she could still be in bed close to her normal bedtime. What I hadn't factored in was that 5-year-olds can take a long time to get dressed for date nights with their dads. At home after class, London raced up the stairs and forbade me to help. I went to my closet and got dressed up as well, even donning a blazer. I prepared dinner, which took all of five minutes, and then set the table using our good china. Candles completed the picture once I poured the grape juice into wine glasses. Then I leaned against the counter to wait. I eventually moved to the table and sat. After that, I wandered to the family room and turned on ESPN. Every now and then, I would walk to the stairs and call up to her. She would insist that I stay downstairs, that she was still getting ready. When she finally descended the stairs, I felt a prick of tears behind my eyes. She'd chosen a blue skirt along with a blue and white checkered top, white stockings and shoes, and a matching blue hairband. The gray snoat was the imitation pearl necklace she'd put on. Whatever my reservations about Vivian's frequent shopping expeditions with our daughter, even London knew that she'd made an impression. You look beautiful, I said, rising from the couch. I shut off the television. Thank you, Daddy, she said as she carefully approached the dining room table. The table looks really nice. 
Her attempt to be as adult-like as possible struck me as almost unbearably adorable. I appreciate that, sweetie. Would you like to eat? Yes, please. I went around the table and pulled out her chair. When she was seated, she reached for her glass of grape juice and took a sip. This is very tasty, she said. I served and brought the plates to the table. London carefully spread her napkin in her lap, and I did the same. How was school today? I asked. It was fun, she said. Bodhi said he wants to see the lions tomorrow at the zoo. I do, too. I like lions, but I hope they don't have any mean ones like Scar. I was referring, of course, to the villain in the movie The Lion King. They won't have any lions like Scar, Daddy. He's just a cartoon. Oh, I said. That's right. You're silly. I smiled as she daintily picked up her fork. I've heard that. After dinner, we colored. London happened to have a coloring book that featured zoo animals, and we spent an hour at the kitchen table creating animals that could only have existed in rainbow-filtered worlds. Though she'd only been in school for a few weeks, I noticed that her coloring had improved. She was able to stay inside the lines and had even taken to shading various parts of the pictures. Gone were the smears and squiggles of only a year ago. My little girl was slowly but surely growing up, which for some reason made my heart ache in places I didn't know even existed. Chapter 18. It's Not a Date A month after I graduated from college, I attended the wedding of a former fraternity brother named Tom Gregory in Chapel Hill. Tom was the son of two physicians, and his bride-to-be, a waifish brunette named Claire Devane, had a father who owned 56 Bojangles restaurants, fast food places specializing in fried chicken and biscuits. The business might not have had the elite ring associated with investment banking, but it minted money, and as a wedding gift, Claire's father had already given the couple a mini mansion, along with a Mercedes convertible. The wedding was, of course, a black tie affair. I had just started work at the Peters Group and had yet to receive my first paycheck. It went without saying that I was usually broke. While I had enough money to rent a tuxedo, I had to crash at another fraternity brother's place. His name was Liam Robertson, and he was about to start law school at UNC. Though he was also from Charlotte, we'd never been particularly close. He was the kind of guy who took delight in abusing the pledges and fed jello shots with Everclear to freshman girls. But Alpha Gamma Rows stick together. To that point, I'd worn a tuxedo only once in my life. I'd rented a navy blue tuxedo for my senior prom in high school, and the photo of me and my prom date graced the mantle of the fireplace at my parents' house until I married. That tuxedo, however, had a clip-on bow tie, while the tuxedo I'd rented for the wedding had one that I actually had to tie. Unfortunately, Liam Robertson had no more idea of how to tie the thing than I did, and as our departure time drew near, I'd already made half a dozen failed attempts. It was at that point that the front door to Liam's house flew open and Emily walked in. I'd seen her before but had never been introduced. She and Liam had grown up in the same neighborhood and were supposedly just friends. Nonetheless, she was going to the wedding as Liam's date so she can put in a good word for me in case I meet someone. As soon as I saw her, I did a double take. It wasn't the Emily I'd seen in Liam's company before, the bohemian with long skirts and Birkenstocks, usually sans makeup. Instead, the woman who stood before me was sheathed in a cocktail dress with a plunging neckline and high-heeled black pumps, an elegant look accentuated by tasteful diamond studs in both ears. The mascara she wore called attention to her striking eye color, and her lips, accentuated with red lipstick, were full and rich. Her hair fell in rippling waves well past her shoulders. Hey, Emily, I heard Liam shout. Russ needs help getting dressed. Nice to see you too, Liam, she said sardonically. And yes, thank you, I appreciate the compliment. You look great, by the way, Liam added. Too late, she muttered under her breath as she glided toward me. He's always been clueless, she observed, almost to herself. I take it you're Russ? I nodded, trying not to ogle. I'm Emily, she said. Technically, I'm Liam's date, but not really. He's more like a self-absorbed younger brother to me. I heard that, Liam shouted. Of course you did, but only because I was talking about you. Their easy familiarity made me feel like a bystander, despite the fact that our faces were now only inches apart. What have we got here? she said, wrestling the bow tie free before draping it around my neck again. I noticed that she was only a little bit shorter than I and was wearing a heady floral scent. 
I appreciate this, I said. How do you know how to do this? I had to help my dad when I was growing up, she said. He never quite got the hang of it either. It always ended up crooked. She tugged and adjusted the bow tie, her long fingers doing secret things out of eyesight. Our faces were so close it made me feel as though I was about to kiss her, and I thought again how beautiful she was. My eyes were drawn to her lips, then to the line of her neck. Her dress was cut low in the front, revealing a tiny lace bow at the front of her bra. Like what you see? She teased. I felt myself flush as I hastened to stare straight ahead, like a cadet at the Citadel. She smiled. Men, she said, you're all the same. I continued to stand at attention, silent as she finished. Then with a gentle tap to my chest with both hands and a wink, she went on. But since you're kind of cute, I'll forgive you. When I pulled into Emily's driveway the following morning, I immediately spotted her loading a small cooler into her SUV. Getting out of the car, London scampered toward her and gave her a hug. Where's Bodie? I heard my daughter ask. He's in his room, Emily said. He's picking a couple of movies to watch on the way. Do you want to go up and help him? Yes, ma'am, London said, racing toward the front door before vanishing inside. Emily watched her go before turning toward me. She was dressed in shorts and a sleeveless top, and she'd tamed her hair into a ponytail. Despite the casual mom-at-the-park wardrobe, she seemed to glow with health and vitality. I couldn't stop staring at her thick hair and unblemished skin. Ma'am? she asked, referring to London when I was close. She's very polite, I said, hoping my scrutiny wasn't too obvious. I like it, she said. I've tried that with Bodie, but it's never seemed to take. With the kids in the house, she seemed as youthful as the girl I once knew, giving rise to an internally disorienting sense of time warp. It should be fun today, I commented. London's been excited about it. Bodie, too, she said. He wants London to ride with us. That's fine, I said. I can follow. You'll ride with us, too, dingbat. There's no reason for both of us to have to drive, and there's no way I want to be trapped with those two without assistance. Besides, it'll take us two hours to get there, and this baby, she said, nodding at the SUV, can play DVDs for the kids. Her playful ribbing transported me back to the first time I'd ever spoken to her, and how nervous I'd been. You want me to drive? I offered. Unless you'd rather be in charge of the snacks. Of course, that means bending and twisting and unwrapping food every few minutes. I remembered my dad's comment about family trips. No, I'm good, I said. It's probably better if I drive. Before we had even left the neighborhood, Bodie asked if they could watch Madagascar 3. Let's wait until we get on the highway, Emily said over her shoulder. Can I have a snack? Bodie asked. You just had breakfast. But I'm hungry. What do you want to eat? Goldfish, he demanded. Vivian had never allowed that particular treat into our home, but it was a staple of my own childhood. What's a goldfish? London asked. It's a cheesy cracker shaped like a fish, Emily said. It's really good. Can I have one, Daddy? My eyes flicked to the rearview mirror, and I wondered what London was thinking about the fact that I was up front with Emily and not her mom, or whether it mattered to her at all. Of course you can. The drive to the zoo passed quickly. In the back seat, the kids were happily engrossed in the movie, but since they were within earshot, we didn't mention Vivian or David nor did Emily and I touch on our shared past. Instead, I told her what I'd been doing at work, and she talked about her paintings and the fact that she had a show coming up in mid-November, which meant she'd be busier than usual until then. We also caught up on our respective families, the conversation and laughter flowing easily as though we'd never lost contact with each other. Yet despite our familiarity, the outing still felt new and a little strange. It wasn't a date, but it wasn't something I could have envisioned even a month ago. I was on a road trip with Emily, kids in tow, and though I initially expected to feel a vague sense of guilt, I didn't. Instead, I found myself glancing at her in quiet moments and wondering how David could have been so stupid. And of course, why I'd been so stupid so long ago. They're going to be exhausted, Emily predicted, shortly after we arrived at the zoo. Since we parked, they'd raced each other from the parking lot to the ticket booth, and once inside to the water fountain and back, then ricocheted back to the gift shop. 
London, I was proud to note, must have inherited some of those track and field genes because to my eyes they ran neck and neck. London and Bodie were studying the gift shop racks as we ambled toward them. I'm already exhausted just watching them. Did you get your run in this morning? Just a short one, four miles or so. Better than me, hoofing it around here will be my exercise for the day. How do you stay so fit? Pole dancing, she said. At my startled expression, she laughed. You'd probably like that, wouldn't you? She nudged my shoulder. I'm kidding, you dork. But you should have seen your expression. It was priceless. I do try to make it to the gym a few times a week, but mainly, I was blessed with good genes and I watch what I eat. It's easier than having to exercise all the time. For you, maybe. I like eating. London skipped toward me as we entered the shop. Daddy, look, butterfly wings, she cried, holding up a pair of lacy, semi-translucent wings, large enough for her to wear. Very pretty, I said. Can we get them, in case I get to be the butterfly at the dance? For Miss Hamshaw, with the kids who didn't make the cut for the competition. The performance in which London was supposed to be a tree. I don't know, sweetie, I said. Please, they're so pretty, and even if I'm not the butterfly, I can wear them today and make the animals happy and I can show them to Mr. and Mrs. Sprinkles when I get home. I wasn't so sure about that, but I checked the price, relieved that they weren't exorbitant. You really want to wear these today? Yes, she pleaded, bouncing up and down. And Bodie wants the dragonfly wings. I felt Emily's gaze on me, and I turned toward her. It might make them easier to spot if they run off, she pointed out. All right, I said, but just the wings, okay? And only if you put on sunscreen, Emily added. Unlike me, she'd remembered to bring some. Oops. After paying, I helped London slip the wings on. Emily did the same with Bodie. Spreading enough lotion on their skin to enable them to slither through tiny pipes, we watched as they ran off again, with their arms outstretched. The zoo was divided into two major areas, North America and Africa. We visited North America first, wandering through various exhibits and marveling at everything from harbor seals and peregrine falcons to alligators, muskrats, beavers, a cougar, and even a black bear. In each case, the kids reached the exhibit before we did, and by the time Emily and I arrived, they were usually anxious to move on. Fortunately, the crowds were light, despite the glorious weather. The temperature was mild, and for the first time in months, the humidity didn't feel oppressive, which didn't, however, stop the kids from asking for popsicles and sodas. Whatever happened to Liam? I asked Emily. I haven't heard from him in ten years. Last I heard, he was practicing law in Asheville, and he was already on his second marriage. He's still practicing law, she said, but his second marriage didn't last either. She was a cocktail waitress too, right? When they met? He has a type, she said with a smile. No question about it. When was the last time you heard from him? Maybe seven or eight months ago. He heard I was getting divorced, and he asked me out. He wasn't one of the nice guys you never called a second time. Liam? Oh, God, no. We'd known each other growing up, but you know. He's always been a little too into himself for my taste. And in college, we hung out more out of habit than actual friendship. And by habit, I mean he came on to me at least once a semester, usually when he was drinking. I always wondered why you tolerated him. I mused. Because my parents were friends with his parents and lived across the street from each other. My dad thought he had his act together, but my mom saw right through him all along, thank God. The point is, it had more to do with the fact that he was always there. On campus, at home. Back then, I hadn't developed the ability to just cut people off, even if they were jerks. If it wasn't for him, though, we'd never have met. She smiled wistfully. Do you remember when you asked me to dance at the wedding? I do, I said. It had taken more than an hour for me to work up the courage, even though Liam had by then zeroed in on a woman who would later become wife number one. You were afraid of me, she said with a knowing grin. I was acutely aware of how close she was. Up ahead, London and Bodie were walking beside each other as well, and I flashed on the book I read nightly to London, the four of us walking two by two, because no one should have to walk alone. I wasn't afraid, I clarified. I was embarrassed because you'd caught me ogling when you helped me with my bow tie. Oh, stop. I was flattered and you know it. We've been over this before. I'd asked Liam about you, remember? He said that you were too nerdy for me, and not handsome enough, and not rich enough. Then he hit on me again. I laughed. It's coming back to me. 
Do you stay in touch with friends from college? She squinted as if trying to recall faces. We used to see your buddies pretty regularly when we were together. Not really, I said. Once I got married and London came along, I sort of lost track of most of them. You? I have a few friends from college and a handful that I knew growing up. We still talk and get together, but probably not as much as we should. Like it did with you, life just got busy. I noticed the lightest spray of freckles across her cheeks and nose, so faint as to be invisible in anything but perfectly angled autumn sunlight. I didn't recall her having those fifteen years ago. They were another surprising feature of this once familiar Emily. For a moment I wondered what Vivian would think if she saw Emily and me together right now. Suddenly the whole situation struck me as surreal. Me with Emily at the zoo with the kids, Vivian in Spannerman's arms somewhere else. How had things come to this? And where had my life taken this unforeseen U-turn? Emily's hand on my arm startled me out of my reverie. You okay? She studied me. You went away there for a second. Yeah, sorry. I tried for a smile. Sometimes it just hits me at random moments. How odd and inexplicable it all is, I mean. She was silent for a moment, letting her hand fall away. It's going to be that way for a while, she said, her tone soft. But if you can, try to let whatever comes, come. And whatever stays, stay. And whatever goes, just let it go. That's beyond me right now. Right now being the operative words. You'll get there. A dull ache of missing Vivian stirred within me then. But it didn't linger. It was a rabbit punch, without the strength of an uppercut. And I understood that it was due to Emily. Given the choice, I realized that it was better to spend the day with a fun and compassionate friend than a wife who seemed to despise me. It's been a long time since I did something like this, Emily reflected. When I looked at her inquiringly, she continued, Hang out with a friend of the opposite sex, I mean. It was before David, that's all I know. It might have even been before you and I were together. Why is that? Because we were married. But I know other married people who have friends of the opposite sex. I'm not saying that it can't happen, I conceded. It's just that it can get tricky, and I think most people know that. Human nature being what it is, and given how hard marriage is, the last thing any spouse needs is an attractive alternative. It can make the other party look bad. She made a wry face. Is that what I'm doing? She asked. No, don't answer. That was inappropriate. She smoothed some stray hairs into her ponytail. It's not my intent to make anything worse between you and Vivian. I know that, I said. Then again, I'm not sure you could make it any worse. For all I know, she's off in Paris with the guy right now. You don't know? The only time we spoke this week was when she told me she wanted to see London two of the next three weekends, including her birthday weekend, then yelled at me for allowing London to miss dance class. She also said it would be hard to reach her, whatever that means, and that I should sleep at Marge's or my parents when she's in town because she wants the house. Oh, and that she's sick of my crap. Emily winced. It wasn't my favorite phone call, I admitted. But you know she shouldn't get to see London every single weekend, nor should you have to leave the house. She says she wants to make it easier for London. It sounds to me like she just wants what she wants. That too, I said. But at the same time, I can see her point. It would be disruptive for London to have to stay in a hotel when her mom's in town. Her life has already been disrupted, Emily pointed out. Why can't she just sleep in the guest room? She thinks that might confuse London. So suggest that she go to bed after London is asleep and then set an alarm so she's awake before London. When you're together, just be cordial to one another. I know it's hard when emotions are high, but it's not impossible. And it's better than you getting kicked out of your own house every time she comes to visit. That's just wrong, and you don't deserve to be treated that way. You're right, I acknowledged, but I was already dreading the argument that would inevitably ensue. More than anyone, Vivian knew how to hurt me when she didn't get her way. When we met in the coffee shop that first time, I told you that I'd seen you dropping off London, remember? I remember. What I didn't say is that I watched you for a while. I saw the way you are with her, the way she hugged you and told you she loved you. It's obvious to everyone that you are the apple of that girl's eye. Inexplicably, I felt myself blush with pleasure. Well, I'm pretty much the only parent she has right now. It's more than that, Russ, she interrupted. For little girls, their first love should always be their dad. But that isn't always the case. When I saw you two saying goodbye that day, 
I was struck by how loving and close you seemed. Then I recognized you and I just knew I had to say hello. So I followed you. Come on. Scout's honor, Emily said, making the Boy Scout sign. You know me. I live by my instincts. Artist, remember? I laughed. Yeah, I said, meeting her determined gaze and feeling flattered, although for what reason I wasn't sure. I'm glad you did. I don't know what kind of shape I'd be in right now if you hadn't. You've been a big help to me. Yep, that's what I do, she said with a playful, aw shucks grin. You know what's strange? What's that? I don't have any memories of what you were like when you were angry. I can't even recall any serious fights between us. So tell me, do you get angry? Of course. And I can be scary, she warned. I don't believe you. Then don't ever test it. I'm like a grizzly bear and jackal and great white shark all rolled into one. She gestured at our surroundings. I thought animal metaphors would be appropriate, since we're here at the zoo, I mean. After viewing the animals of North America and the aviary, the four of us had lunch. Despite a steady stream of snacking during the previous four hours, Bodhi managed to finish a plate of chicken nuggets and fries, along with a chocolate milkshake. London consumed about a third as much, but for her, that was a lot. Neither Emily nor I were hungry, both of us opting for a bottle of water. Can we go see the lions now? Bodhi asked. Not until we put on more sunscreen, Emily answered, and the kids popped out of their seats. Again, Emily slathered them up. You're very good at remembering that. I forget every time. You never saw David's extended family. They lived in the outback, like the outback outback and you could have measured the depth of their wrinkles with a wooden ruler. A lot of people here get too much sun, but seeing those relatives at our wedding really made an impression on me. I barely leave the house without sunscreen these days. That's why you have the skin of a twenty-year-old. Ha, ah, nice try, but a lovely thought nonetheless. I was tempted to explain that I was sincere, but opted instead to start gathering our food trays. Who's ready to head to Africa? I asked. I admit that I found the Africa part of the zoo more to my liking. Growing up, I'd seen alligators in the Cape Fear River, muskrats and beavers, all sorts of birds, including that majestic bald eagle and even a bear. When I was a kid in Charlotte across the street from my elementary school, a bear was spotted crossing the road and eventually ended up in the branches of an oak tree. It was a juvenile bear, and while the sighting was definitely uncommon, everyone knew that bears weren't really that rare in North Carolina. The largest black bear on record, in fact, was killed in Craven County. The point is, the animals of North America that we'd seen earlier didn't strike me as terribly exotic. Never once, however, had I spotted a zebra or giraffe or a chimpanzee. I'd never come face to face with baboons or elephants either. Maybe I'd seen them at the circus. My family went to the circus every year when it was in town. But seeing the animals in a setting that was somewhat reminiscent of the wilds of Africa was enough to make even the kids stop and stare for a while. Handing London my phone, she took more than a hundred photos, which added to her excitement. Because we took our time, we didn't finish up at the zoo until late afternoon. By the time we trekked back to the car, the kids were trailing behind us. It's like the tortoise and the hare, I said to Emily. Except the hares back there probably ran three times as fast as we walked. Well, at least they'll sleep well. I just hope that Bodhi doesn't fall asleep in the car. If he naps for two hours, he'll be awake until midnight. I didn't think about that, I said, suddenly concerned about London's schedule as well. Kind of like remembering to bring sunscreen or bringing snacks for the trip. Obviously, I'm a work in progress when it comes to child rearing on my own. We're all works in progress, she said. It's the definition of being a parent. You seem to know what you're doing. Sometimes, she said. Not always. This week when Bodhi was sick, I couldn't decide whether to baby him or treat his cold like an everyday occurrence. I know how my parents would have reacted, I said, unless I was bleeding profusely or had broken bones protruding from my skin or a fever high enough to fry my brain, they would have shrugged and told me to tough it out. And yet you turned out just fine, which means that maybe I was too soft on Bodhi. Maybe he'll learn to like being sick because it gets him special treatment. Why is it so hard to be a really good parent? You don't have to be a really good parent, she said. All you have to do is be good enough. As I pondered her words, I realized why my parents and Marge had liked Emily so much. Like them, Emily was wise.
Chapter 19 Finding My Own Way It was the wedding in Chapel Hill that cemented my resolve to see Emily again. By the time the cake had been cut and the bouquet had been tossed, Emily and I had danced to more songs than I could keep track of. When the band took a break, we stepped out on the balcony for a breath of fresh air. Above us, a big orange moon hung low in the sky, and I could see Emily staring at it with the same sense of wonder I felt. I wonder why it's orange, I mused aloud. To my surprise, I heard Emily answer. When the moon is low in the sky, the light scatters because it has to pass through more layers of the atmosphere than when it's overhead. By the time the light reaches our eyes, the blue, green, and purple parts of the spectrum have scattered, leaving only yellow, orange, and red visible to us. How do you know that? I marveled, turning to her. My dad explained it to me every time we saw one of these, she said, nodding at the glowing orb hovering over the horizon. I guess over time it just stuck. I'm still impressed. Don't be. If you ask me anything else about the night sky other than the location of the Big Dipper, I wouldn't be able to help you. For instance, I know that one or two of those stars out there are probably planets, but I couldn't tell you which ones they are. Scanning the sky, I pointed. That one over there, right above the tree? That's Venus. How do you know? Because it's brighter than the stars. She squinted. Are you sure? No, I admitted, and she laughed. But my dad told me that. He used to wake me in the middle of the night so the two of us could watch meteor showers. A nostalgic smile crossed her face. My dad did that with me too, she said. And whenever we went camping, he'd stay up with Jess and me for hours, and we'd watch for falling stars. Jess? My older sister. Do you have any siblings? I have an older sister too, Marge. I tried to picture Emily as a girl with her family. I'm having a hard time imagining you camping. She knitted her brows. Why? I don't know, I said. I guess maybe because you strike me as more of a city girl. What does that mean? You know, coffee shops, poetry readings, art galleries, joining protests, voting socialist. She laughed. One thing's for sure, you don't know me at all. Well, I said, gathering my courage. I'd like to know you better. What do you like to do for fun? Are you asking me out on a date? Her gaze left me feeling a bit flustered. If your idea of fun is skydiving or shooting apples off my head with a bow and arrow, then the only reason I'm asking is for the sake of conversation. But if it's dinner and a movie, she arched an eyebrow. That's more my style. She brought a hand to her chin and slowly shook her head. No, dinner and a movie is just too... cliched, she said finally. How about a hike? A hike? Eyeing her stiletto heels, I had trouble picturing her outdoors, communing with nature. Yeah, she said. How about Crowder's Mountain? We can follow the Rock Top Trail. I've never been there, I said. In fact, I'd never heard of it. Then it's a date, she said. How about next Saturday? I looked at her, suddenly wondering whether I'd asked her out or if she'd asked me, or even whether it really mattered, because I could really tell that Emily was extraordinary, and I knew without a doubt that I wanted to get to know her better. On Sunday, when I had spare time, I worked on the third commercial and shipped it off to the editor, which took less time than I thought it would. It had to take a little time, since the rest of my day was spent with London. It may not be politically correct to say, but the fact that London was going to school made my life better, too. As much as I loved my daughter, Sunday wore me out, and I was looking forward to heading to work, if only because it seemed somehow easier than entertaining a five-year-old for sixteen straight hours. My good mood, however, ended even before I got to the office on Monday morning. i just dropped London off when I fielded a call from Taglieri, asking if it was possible for me to swing by his office. Half an hour later, I was sitting across from him in his office. His jacket was off and his sleeves were rolled up. On his desk were messy piles of what I assumed to be ongoing cases. Thanks for making time this morning, he said. I connected with Vivian's attorney on Friday. I wanted to get a sense of her and see if there was a way to make all of this proceed as smoothly as possible. And? Unfortunately, she was exactly as billed. After hanging up, I went to her firm's website because I had to see what she looked like. During our call, I kept picturing an ice statue instead of a real person. I mean, she was sub-zero. His description conjured up a number of future scenarios, none of them particularly good for me. What does that mean? 
it means it's probably going to be harder for you than it should be, depending on how forcefully you intend to fight. I don't care about the money as much as I care about London. I want joint custody. I hear you, he said, raising his hand. And I know that's what you want, but I'm not even sure what that means. Vivian's living in Atlanta, and because she wants residency in Georgia, she's not coming back here. My question to you is whether you're willing to move to Atlanta. Why do I have to move? My house is here, my family is here, my job is here. That's my point. Even if you received joint custody, how would that work? It's not like you'd have the chance to see London very much, which is why I assume Vivian is asking for sole custody, as well as physical custody. She's willing to grant you visitation. No, I said, cutting him off. That's not going to happen. I'm her father. I have rights. Yes, you do. But we both know that courts tend to favor women. And Vivian's attorney is telling me that Vivian was the primary caregiver until only a few months ago. I work so she could stay at home. Joey raised his hands, even as his voice adopted a soothing cadence. I know that, he said, and I don't think it's fair either. But in custody battles, fathers are at a real disadvantage, especially in situations like these. She's the one who moved out. She left us. According to Vivian's attorney, it was because you left her with no other choice. You were no longer able to support the family and you drained a big chunk from the savings account. She was forced to get a job. That's not true. Vivian took the job because she wanted to. I didn't make her do anything. Taglieri fixed me with a sympathetic look. I believe you. I'm on your side, Russ. I'm just relaying some of the things Vivian's attorney said to me. By the way, that woman may be an ice queen and a bully, but I'm not afraid to take her on. She's never had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bulldog, and I'm good at my job. I just wanted to update you in person and prepare you for what comes next. This thing is already ugly, and it's probably going to get even uglier over the next few months. What do you need me to do? For now, nothing. It's still early. As for the settlement agreement she sent, just pretend it doesn't exist. I'll draft a response for you to look over, and I already have some ideas on that. That said, my court schedule is full for the next couple of weeks, so you won't see anything from me right away. I don't want you to worry if you don't hear from me. There's always a tendency in these situations to want to get everything done as quickly as possible, but it generally doesn't work that way. What I do want is to touch base with her and have a longer conversation, but even then, there's no reason to rush. Right now, London is still living with you. That's a good thing, and the longer it goes on, the better it is for you. Also, keep in mind that Vivian can't file for divorce until next March at the earliest, so we still have time to work out a settlement that's agreeable to both parties. Until then, you might want to check if it's possible for you and Vivian to work something out that's acceptable to both of you. I'm not saying that she'll go for something like that. In fact, I doubt that she will, but it's worth a try. And if she doesn't want to work something out, then just keep doing what you're doing with London. Be a good father, spend time with your daughter, Make sure London gets to school and eats and sleeps right. I can't stress how important that is. Keep in mind that we can always bring in a psychologist to talk to London and present a report to the court. No, I said, interrupting. I'm not going to put London in the middle of all this. She's not going to have to choose between her mother and father. His eyes dropped. You might not think it's a good idea, but Vivian may insist on it in the hope that it will benefit her case. She wouldn't do that, I said. She adores London. It's precisely because she adores London, he said, that you shouldn't be surprised by anything she's willing to do in order to gain custody. After the meeting with Taglieri, I was more angry and frightened than I'd been since Vivian had walked out the door. In my office at work, I fumed. I called Marge and repeated what Taglieri had said. Marge was as livid as I was. When she referred to Vivian with a term synonymous with female dogs, I echoed the sentiment. But talking to Marge did little to make me feel better, and in the end I called Emily and asked if she could meet me for lunch. Considering how furious I was, I wanted to avoid going to a restaurant. Instead, I asked her to meet me at a park near the house, where there was a scattering of picnic tables. Not knowing what she would want, I ordered two sandwiches from the deli, along with two different kinds of soup. I added some bags of chips to the order, along with two bottles of Snapple. Emily was already seated at one of the tables when I pulled into the gravel lot. Parking beside her, I grabbed the food and strode to the table. 
I must have looked upset as I approached, because she rose from her seat and gave me a quick hug. She was wearing shorts, a peasant blouse, and sandals, similar to what she'd worn when we'd walked the golf course together. I'd ask how you were doing, but it's pretty clear it's a bad day, huh? Definitely a rough one, I admitted, more affected by the feeling of her body against mine than I felt comfortable acknowledging. Thanks for meeting me here. Of course. She sat as I laid out the food on the table and took a seat across from her. Behind us, preschoolers were clambering over a small wooden structure featuring low slides, bridges, and swings. Mothers either stood nearby or sat on benches, some fiddling with their phones. What's going on? I ran through the conversation I'd had with Taglieri. She listened with a frown of concentration, inhaling sharply at the end, her eyes slitted in disbelief. Would she really do that? Put London in the middle of a fight between the two of you? Taglieri seemed to think it wasn't just possible. He believes it's probable. Oh boy, she said. That's terrible. No wonder you're upset. I'd be furious. That's an understatement. Right now I can barely stand the thought of her. Which is strange because ever since she left it seems like all I've wanted was to see her. It's really hard, she said. And until you go through it you can't know what it's like. David wasn't like this, was he? You said that he was generous when it came to money and you got custody of Bodhi. It was still terrible. When he walked out the door, he was seeing someone, and for the next month, I kept hearing from people I knew who'd seen him out and about with this woman, acting like he didn't have a care in the world. It was totally demoralizing, evidence that ending the marriage and losing me mattered not at all to him. And while he was generous in the end, he didn't start out that way. He talked at first about bringing Bodhi with him to Australia. He couldn't do that, could he? Probably not. Bodhi's an American citizen, but even the threat caused me a few weeks of sleepless nights. I couldn't imagine not being able to see my son. It was a sentiment I could fully relate to. After lunch, I returned home instead of going back to the office. On the mantel and walls were dozens of photographs, mostly of London. What I hadn't noticed in all the years that I lived there was how many photos of London included Vivian, almost all professionally shot while only a few candid ones of London and me graced our home. Staring at them, I wondered how long Vivian had considered me so marginal to my daughter's existence. Perhaps I was reading too much into it. While Vivian was with London, I'd been at work, so of course there were more photos. But why hadn't she noticed and rectified the situation? Why hadn't she tried to memorialize more moments with the three of us, so that London could see for herself that I loved her as much as Vivian did? I wasn't sure. What I did know was that I didn't want to be constantly reminded of Vivian, which meant some things had to change. With newfound resolve, I walked through the house, removing the photos that included Vivian. I had no intention of throwing them away. I put a number of them in London's room while I stacked others in a box that Vivian could take back to Atlanta with her, stowing the box in the foyer closet. Afterward, I changed into a t-shirt and shorts. Heading to the family room, I began to rearrange the furniture. Couches, chairs, lamps... I even moved a painting from the den to the living room and vice versa. By the time I was done, I couldn't claim that it looked better. Vivian did have good decorating sense, but it definitely looked different. I did the same in the den, moving the desk to an alternate wall, shifting the bookshelf and flipping the location of two paintings. In the master bedroom, I kept the bed in the same place, but moved all the other furniture I could, and then switched out the duvet on the bed for another that I found in the linen closet, one that hadn't been used in years. In another closet, I found assorted household goods, and I spent a few minutes switching out vases and lamps, along with some decorative bowls. One good thing about Vivian's shopping over the years, I suppose, was that my overstuffed closets held the equivalent of a department store. As soon as London got home from school, she took in her surroundings with wide eyes. It looks like a new house, Daddy. A little bit, I admitted. Do you like it? I like it a lot, she exclaimed. Though her endorsement made me feel good, I suspected that it never occurred to London not to like it. With the exception of dance class, London seemed to like everything. I'm glad, I said. I didn't move anything in your room. You could have moved the hamster cage if you wanted to. Do you want me to? They're still kind of noisy at night. They run on that wheel as soon as it gets dark. That's because they're nocturnal. She looked at me like I was crazy. Of course they're not turtles. They're hamsters. Nocturnal, I said, slowly enunciating the word. That means they like to sleep during the day. 
You mean so that they don't miss me while I'm at school? I smiled. Exactly. She was quiet for a few seconds. Hey, Daddy. I loved the way she said those words when she was about to ask me for something, and I wondered how old she would be when it finally stopped, or if by then I'd even notice. Yes,、yeah, sweetie. Can we go for a bike ride? Between my workout that morning and redecorating efforts, I was already exhausted, but Hey Daddy won out, as it usually did. For the first time, I remembered to slather sunscreen on my daughter. It was, however, the end of September and relatively late in the afternoon, so it probably fell into the category of too little, too late. London donned her helmet, and as soon as I helped her get going, she still couldn't do that part on her own. I hopped onto my bike and pedaled quickly to catch up to her. While the roads near our house offered wonderfully flat, long stretches, the streets on the far side of the neighborhood had hills—not big hills, mind you. In my youth, I probably would have considered them boring. I preferred racing down the steepest hills. The kind that made me squeeze the handlebars so tight I'd lose feelings in my fingers. But London and I were different in that regard. The thought of going faster and faster without pedaling made London nervous, and so far we'd avoided the hilly roads. It was the right thing to do, especially early on. But I felt that she'd reached the point where she could handle a shallow downslope, and we rode in that direction. Unfortunately, the mosquitoes were out in force, and I watched as London slapped at her arm. Her bike wobbled slightly as she temporarily released her grip on the handlebars, but she didn't seem to be in danger of falling. My little girl had come a long way since that first bike ride, and I sped up, pulling beside her. "You're such a good rider now," I called out. "Thank you," she said. "Maybe we could bring Bodie for a bike ride sometime." He doesn't know how yet. He's still using the training wheels. As soon as she said it, I remembered Emily telling me the same thing. "Do you think you're ready to try some hills?" I don't know," she said, giving me a sidelong look. "They're kind of scary. They're not too bad," I said, "and it's kind of fun to go even faster." Letting go of the handlebar again, she reached over and scratched at her opposite arm. Again, the bike wobbled. "I think I got stung by a mosquito." "Probably," I said. "But mosquitoes bite; they don't sting." "It's itchy." "I know. When we get back home, I'll put some hydrocortisone cream on your arm, okay?" We eventually made our way to the hillier section of the neighborhood, pedaling up a gradual incline. The opposite side was shorter and slightly steeper, and when we reached the top, London slowed her bike to a stop and put her feet down. "What do you think?" I asked. "It's kind of big," she said, an anxious tremor in her voice. "I think you can do it," I said encouragingly. "How about we give it a try?" As a kid, I barely would have considered the slope a hill. Of course, I was remembering something from a quarter century earlier, and in my mind, I had always known how to ride a bike. Perhaps I'd forgotten the uncertainties of being a beginner. I say this now because of what happened next. I'll also say that had there not been a specific chain of unpredictable events, one leading to the next in a domino effect, then most likely everything would have been fine. But it wasn't. As soon as London got the bike moving again. She wobbled and swerved from the middle of the road to the left-hand side. It was a bigger wobble and more of a swerve than I'd seen in a while, and she probably would have righted herself were it not for the car that began to back out of the driveway twenty yards up. I doubted the driver had seen us. Hedges surrounded the yard, and London was small. Furthermore, the driver seemed to be in a hurry based on his speed, even in reverse. London locked onto the side of the car and swerved farther left. Simultaneously, she slapped at another mosquito bite. Directly ahead of her loomed a mailbox mounted on a sturdy base. Her front tire hit the shoulder where the asphalt met the dirt. "Watch out!" I screamed as the bike wobbled hard. London tried to get her other hand back on the handlebars, but it slipped off the grip. By then, I knew what would happen, and I watched in horror as the front wheel suddenly jerked. London catapulted over the handlebars. Her head and upper body smashing into the mailbox with a sickening thud. I was off my bike and racing toward her, screaming her name even as her front tire continued to spin. I vaguely noticed the look of surprise on the driver's face before I crouched beside London's limp form. She was face down, unmoving, utterly silent. Panic flooded every nerve as I gently turned her over. So much blood! Oh God! Oh God! Oh God! I don't know whether I was saying the words or hearing them in my mind as my insides turned to jelly. Her eyes were closed. 
Her arm had simply flopped to the ground when I'd rolled her like she was sleeping. But she wasn't sleeping, and her wrist looked as though someone had stuffed half a lemon under the skin. In that instant, my fear was as all-consuming as anything I'd ever experienced. I prayed for a sign that she was still alive, but for what seemed an eternity, there was nothing. Finally, her eyelids fluttered and I heard a sharp intake of breath. The scream that followed was ear-shattering. By then, the driver was gone, and I doubted whether he'd even seen what happened. I didn't have my phone, so I couldn't call 911. I thought about rushing to a house, any house, to use their phone to call an ambulance, but I didn't want to leave my daughter. Those thoughts raced through my head in the blink of an eye, and she had to get to the hospital. The hospital. I scooped her into my arms and began to run, cradling my injured daughter in my arms. I tore through the neighborhood, feeling neither my legs nor my arms, hurtling forward with single-minded purpose. As soon as I reached our house, I opened the car door and laid London on the back seat. The blood continued to flow from a gaping wound on her head, soaking her top as if it had been dipped in red paint. I raced into the house to grab my keys and wallet and rushed back to the car, slamming the front door of the house so loudly that the windows rattled. Jumping behind the wheel of the car, I turned the key, my tires squealing. On the seat behind me, London was no longer moving, and her eyes were closed again. My senses sharpened with adrenaline. I had never been more aware of my surroundings as I edged the accelerator higher. I flew past houses and rolled through a stop sign before gunning the engine again. Hitting the main road, I passed cars on the left and right. At a red light, I came to a stop, then rolled through, ignoring the sounds of honking horns. London lay silent and terrifyingly inert. I made the 15-minute drive in less than seven minutes and slammed to a halt directly in front of the emergency room. Again, I cradled my daughter in my arms and carried her into the half-full waiting area. The intake nurse knew an emergency when she saw one and was already rising as she called out, This way! Directing me through the double doors. Rushing her into an examination room, I laid my daughter on the table as a nurse hustled in, followed a moment later by a doctor. I struggled to explain what had happened while the doctor lifted her eyelids and shone a light at her pupils. His movements were efficient as he barked commands to the nurses. I think she was unconscious, I said, feeling helpless, to which the doctor responded tersely with some medical jargon that I couldn't hope to comprehend. The blood was wiped from London's face and her wrist briefly examined. Is she going to be okay? I finally asked. She needs a CAT scan, he replied, but I've got to staunch the bleeding first. Time seemed to slow down as I watched the nurse clean London's face more thoroughly with an antiseptic pad, revealing a half-inch gash directly above her eyebrow. We can stitch this, but I'd recommend that we get a plastic surgeon in here to do it so we can minimize the scarring. I'll see who's available unless you prefer to call a surgeon you know. My new client. I mentioned the doctor's name and the ER doctor nodded. He's very good, he said before turning to one of the nurses. See if he can make it here. If not, find out who's on call. As two more nurses entered with a gurney, London stirred and began to whimper. In an instant, I was at her side, murmuring to her but her gaze seemed unfocused and she didn't seem to know where she was. Everything was happening so fast. As the doctor started to question her gently, all I could think was that I'd convinced her to ride down the hill. What kind of father was I? What kind of father would urge his child into such a risky situation? I was sure that the doctor was asking himself the same questions when he looked at me. I watched as gauze pads and bandages were plastered on my daughter's head. We're going to need to take her now he said. And without waiting for my response, London was wheeled from the room. I filled out the insurance paperwork and used the hospital phone to call Marge. She agreed to swing by my house and grab my phone before coming to the hospital. She also said she would call Liz and my parents. In the waiting room, I sat with hands together and head bowed, praying for the first time in years, praying that my little girl would recover and hating myself for what I'd done. My dad was the first to arrive. He'd been working a job just a few blocks away, and he strode into the waiting room, his face tight with worry. When I filled him in, he didn't offer or expect a hug. Instead, he took a seat in the chair beside me. Or rather, he nearly collapsed into it. I watched as he closed his eyes, and when he finally opened them, he couldn't meet my eyes. I realized then that he was as terrified as I was. Liz arrived next, then my mom, and finally Marge, who looked paler than usual. 
Unlike my dad, they all wanted and needed to be held after I shared what I knew. My mom cried. Liz clasped her hands together as if praying. Marge wheezed and coughed and took a puff of her inhaler. My dad finally spoke. She'll be all right, he said. But I knew he said it because he wanted to believe it, not because he actually thought it was true. My client, the plastic surgeon, arrived soon thereafter and I rose from my seat. Thank you for coming, I said. I can't tell you how much this means to me. You're welcome. I have kids too, so I understand. Let me head back and see what I can do. He disappeared through the double doors. We waited, then waited some more, an agonizing limbo. In time, the doctors finally appeared. I tried and failed to read their expressions as they motioned for us to follow them back. Leading us into one of the patient rooms, they closed the door behind us. I'm pretty certain she's going to be all right, the ER doctor said without preamble. The CAT scan showed no signs of any subdural hematomas or other brain injuries. London is fully conscious now and was able to answer questions. She knew where she was and what had happened to her. Those are all good signs. It felt as though my entire body released a breath I hadn't known it was holding. That said, she was unconscious for a while, so we're going to keep her overnight for observation. It's just a precaution. In rare cases, swelling can occur later, but I'm not expecting to see that. We just want to make sure. And of course, she'll have to take it very easy for the next few days. She can probably go back to school on Wednesday, but no physical activity for at least a week. How about the gash on her head? My client answered. It was a clean gash. I stitched it on the inside and the outside. There's going to be a light scar that may last for a few years, but it should fade over time. I nodded. And her arm? It was her wrist, the ER doctor answered. The x-ray didn't show a break, but there's so much swelling we can't be sure. There are a number of small bones in the wrist, so there's no way to tell right now whether anything is broken. Right now, we're thinking that it's just a nasty sprain, but you'll have to bring her in for another x-ray in a week or two to be sure. The splint is fine until then. Unconscious. Scarred. A wrist that may be sprained or worse. The information left me feeling depleted. May I see her? Of course, he said. She's getting a splint put on her wrist right now, and will be moved to a private room, but that shouldn't take long. All in all, considering what happened, she was lucky. It's a good thing she was wearing a helmet. It could have been a lot worse. Thank God Vivian had insisted that I make London wear a helmet, I thought. Vivian. I'd completely forgotten to call her. How are you feeling, sweetheart? I asked. London looked better than when I brought her into the emergency room, but she certainly wasn't the little girl who'd hopped on her bike earlier that afternoon. A large white bandage obscured her forehead, and her wrist looked tiny in its bulky splint. Pale and fragile, she appeared as though she were being swallowed by her bed. My mom and dad, along with Liz and Marge, had crowded into the room, and after the hugs and kisses and tales of worry, I'd taken a seat on the bed beside London. I reached for her good hand and felt her squeeze it. My head hurts, she said, and my wrist hurts too. I know, I said. I'm sorry, baby girl. I don't like sunscreen. She protested, her voice weak. It made my handlebars slippery. I flashed on the image of her scratching at the bites on her arms. I didn't think about that, I said. We probably don't need too much sunscreen anyway now that the summer is done. Is my bike okay? I realized I'd left both bikes where they lay. I wondered if someone had removed mine from the road, suspecting that someone had. Maybe even the driver. I was also pretty sure that the bikes would be there until I returned to pick them up. It was that kind of neighborhood. I'm sure it is, but if it isn't, we can fix it. Or get a new one. Is mommy coming? I really, really need to make that call, I thought. I'll find out, okay? I'm sure she'll want to talk to you. Okay, daddy. I kissed the top of her head. I'll be right back, okay? The rest of my family crowded around the bed while I stepped into the hallway. I made for the elevator, seeking privacy. What I hadn't wanted was anyone in my family, London especially, listening in on a conversation that I was dreading. When I checked my phone, I noticed that Vivian had already called twice, no doubt wanting to speak with London. I connected the call and felt my stomach begin to clench. London? She asked, picking up. No, it's me, Russ, I said. I wanted to let you know right off the bat that London is fine, 
I'll put her on the phone in a few minutes, but you should know that she's okay first. Why? What happened? Vivian's fear came through like an electric current. We were bike riding and she crashed. She sprained her wrist and cut her forehead and I had to bring her to the hospital. The hospital? Yeah, I said. Let me finish, okay? I drew a breath and launched into a description of what had happened. Surprising me, she didn't interrupt, nor did she raise her voice. But her breathing was ragged and erratic, and when I was done, I could tell she'd begun to cry. And you're sure she's okay? You're not just saying that? I promise. Like I said, I'll get you on the phone with her in just a minute. I stepped out of the room to call you. Why didn't you call me earlier? I should have, and I'm sorry. I was in such a panic that I wasn't thinking straight. No, I get it. I, um... She hesitated. Hold on a second, okay? It was more than a second. I was on hold for almost a minute before she finally came back on the line. I'm heading to the airport now. I want to be with her tonight. I was about to tell her that there was no need for her to come, but if our positions were reversed, I know I would have moved mountains to reach London. Can I talk to her now? Of course, I said. I walked back down the hallway and entered London's room. Handing over the phone, I watched London press the phone close to her ear, but I could still make out what Vivian was saying. She never mentioned me. Her focus was entirely on London. Toward the end, I heard Vivian ask to speak to me again. This time, I didn't feel the need to leave the room. Hey there, I said. She sounds good, Vivian said with palpable relief. Thanks for putting her on. I'm in the car now and should be there in less than a couple of hours. Thanks to Spannerman's private jet, no doubt. Which was no doubt the reason she'd put me on hold earlier. So she could ask him. I'll be here. Let me know when you land. Will do. Vivian texted when she touched down. For a moment I wondered whether my family should stick around, but then I chided myself. London was in the hospital, and they would stay until visiting hours were over. But that's what family was supposed to do. End of subject. However, I suspected that my family harbored a natural curiosity regarding Vivian. My parents hadn't seen her for over a month, since the day London started school, and it had been even longer for Marge and Liz. I'm sure they were wondering whether the new Vivian differed from the one they'd known for years, and how, of course, we would all treat each other. A nurse came in to check London's vitals. The doctor followed and asked London questions again. Though my daughter's voice was weak, she answered them correctly. He told us that he would continue to monitor her condition regularly for the next few hours. When he left, I found a channel on the TV that was showing Scooby-Doo. Though London was watching, she looked as though she might soon fall asleep. Vivian arrived a few minutes later, in faded jeans that were torn at the knees, black sandals and a thin black sweater. She was her usual chic self, though she looked harried. Hey, everyone, she said, sounding out of breath and distracted. I got here as fast as I could. Mommy. She rushed to London, covering her with kisses. Oh, sweetie, you were in an accident, huh? I have a cut on my forehead. Vivian took a seat beside London, her eyes gleaming with unshed tears. I know. Your dad told me. I'm glad you were wearing a helmet. Me too, she said. Vivian planted another kiss on the top of her head. Let me say hi to everyone, okay? And then I want to sit with you for a while. Okay, Mommy. Rising from the bed, she approached my parents. Right away, she embraced them, as well as Marge and Liz. I realized later that I'd only ever seen her touch Marge and Liz a few times in my life. To my amazement, she wrapped me in a brief hug as well. Thank you all so much for coming, she said. I know it made London feel better to have you all here. Of course, my mom answered. She's a tough little girl, my dad pronounced. Visiting hours are almost over, Marge said. So Liz and I are going to take off. We'll let the three of you visit for a while. Us too, my dad nodded. We'll leave you alone. I watched as they gathered their things and then followed them into the hallway. Like Vivian, I hugged them all and thanked them for coming. In their eyes, I could see the questions they wanted to ask but didn't. Even if they had asked, I doubt that I would have had any answers. Returning to the room, I saw that Vivian was perched beside London on the bed. London was telling her about the car that backed out and how the sunscreen had made her handlebars slippery. It must have been scary. It was very scary. But I don't remember after that. You were very brave. Yeah, I am. 
I had to smile at her matter-of-factness. Then, I'm glad you're here, Mommy. I am, too. I had to come because I love you so much. I love you, too. Vivian lay down next to London on the bed and slipped her arm around her, both of them watching Scooby-Doo. I took a seat in the chair and watched them, relieved, somehow, that Vivian had come. Not simply for London's sake, but because a part of me still wanted to believe in Vivian's goodness, despite all she'd done to me. Observing the two of them, I did believe in that goodness, and I also noted Vivian's forlorn expression, recognizing how hard it was for her to be separated from London. I sensed her anguish at being so far away when the accident had happened, despite how quickly she'd been able to get here. I could see London's eyelids drooping, and rising from the chair, I crossed the room and turned out the light. Vivian offered me the slightest of smiles, and I was struck by the melancholy thought that the last time that the three of us had been alone together in a hospital room, London was not yet a day old. On that day, I would have sworn on my life that the three of us would always be united in the love we felt for each other. We were a family then, the three of us together. But it was different now, and I sat in the darkness wondering if Vivian felt the loss as deeply as I did. Mid-morning the next day, London was discharged from the hospital. I'd already called the school and the piano teacher, explaining her absence and canceling her lessons for the week. I also let London's teacher know that she shouldn't be active at recess once she returned to school. Thankfully, the nurses had given me some disinfectant wipes to clean the back seat of the car, because I hadn't wanted London to see the bloody mess. As I signed the discharge papers, I glanced over at Vivian, noticing how tired she looked. Neither of us had slept much. Throughout the night, the nurses and doctor had come into the room to check on London, waking all three of us in the process. London, I assumed, would sleep for most of the day. I was wondering, Vivian said, sounding uncharacteristically tentative, if I could come back to the house for a while, so I can spend some more time with London. Would you mind? Not at all, I said. I'm sure London would like that. I'm probably going to need a nap and a shower, too. That sounds fine, I said. When do you have to go back? I'm flying out tonight. Walter and I have to be in D.C. tomorrow. More lobbying. Always busy, I remarked. Too busy sometimes. I analyzed her comment on the drive home, wondering at the hint of weariness in her tone. Was she just tired, or was the jet-set lifestyle beginning to feel less exciting than it once had? It was a mistake to try to read meaning into every word, tone, and nuance, I told myself. What had Emily said to me? If it comes, let it come. If it stays, let it stay. If it goes, let it go. When we reached the house, I carried London inside. She'd already begun to doze off, and I brought her straight up to her bedroom. Vivian followed us up, and after I got London tucked in bed, I watched as Vivian went to the guest room. Though I'm sure she noticed that I'd rearranged the furniture, she said nothing to me about it. My car was too small to load my bike in the trunk, but I squeezed London's bike into the back. Someone had leaned the bikes against the mailbox. I drove London's bike home, put on my running gear, and ran back to the same mailbox. It was while grabbing mine that I saw the blood that had dried on the asphalt, and my stomach did a flip-flop. I rode my bike home, went for a run, and took a cooling shower. Both London and Vivian were still sleeping, so I went back to the bedroom for a nap. I drew the shades and slept like the dead. When I awoke, I found Vivian in London watching a movie in the family room. Though wearing the same clothes she'd arrived in, Vivian had showered, the tips of her hair still wet, and London was curled up next to her on the sofa. On the coffee table were the remains of London's snack, turkey and pear slices, most of which she had eaten. How are you feeling, London? Good, she said without looking up. How did you sleep? Vivian asked. I was struck by how ordinary she sounded. Well, I needed it. I motioned to the plate. I know London just had a snack, but what are you thinking for dinner? Do you want me to make something? I think it might be easier if we just order something, don't you? Unless you're really in the mood to cook. I wasn't. Chinese? She squeezed London closer to her. Do you want Chinese food for dinner? Okay, London said, still absorbed in the movie. The bandage on her head, along with a splint on her arm, made me wince. Though I wanted to visit with London, part of me wondered whether she was angry with me for what had happened. I didn't want to do anything that might upset the detente that seemed to currently exist between Vivian and me. 
Instead, I went to the kitchen and ate a banana, then wandered to the computer in the den, trying to lose myself in work but feeling distinctly unfocused. In time, I called the Chinese restaurant and went to pick up the food. We ate on the back porch, just like old times. Afterward, London took a bath and dressed in her pajamas. As bedtime approached, Vivian and I slipped into our familiar roles. She read first, followed by me. But when I finally came back downstairs, Vivian had already shouldered her handbag and was waiting near the door. I need to get going, she said. Did I detect a hint of resignation in her voice? I reminded myself again that it was pointless to read anything into it. I figured. She adjusted the strap of her handbag, as if stalling would help her find the words she needed. I noticed that you rearranged the house and took a lot of the photos down. The ones that included me, I mean. I was going to say something earlier, but I didn't think it was the right time. For whatever reason, I didn't want to admit that I'd done so in a fit of anger. But I didn't feel I was wrong, either. I knew I would do the same thing again. Like you, I'm just trying to move forward, I stated. But I put some of the family photos in her room. Because we'll always be her parents. Thank you, she said. That was thoughtful of you. I put the other photos in a box if you want to bring them with you. There are some fantastic ones of you in London. That would be great. I went to the closet and retrieved the box. As I held it beneath my arm, her eyes flashed to the photos. I felt acutely, perhaps more than ever, that our era as a couple had really and truly come to an end, and I had the sense she was thinking the same thing. Let me get my keys and I'll put this in the trunk, I said. I can carry it, she said, reaching for the box. You don't need to drive me. There's a car waiting out front. I handed it over. A car? It's not like we can leave London here alone, right? Right, I thought, wondering how I'd overlooked something so elementary. Being around Vivian, a Vivian who reminded me of the woman I had married, the very same Vivian with whom I had no future, seemed to have thrown me. All right, then, I said. I put a hand in my pocket. About this weekend, I started and me having to stay at Marge's or my parents. You don't have to, she said, cutting me off. I realize today that there's no reason for you to do that. It's not fair to you. I'll just stay in the guest room if that's okay. It's fine, I said. But you know I still want to spend as much time with London as I can, just the two of us. I know that may not seem fair, but right now I really don't want to confuse her. Of course, I said. That makes sense. She shifted the box beneath her arm, and I wondered whether to offer a hug or a kiss on the cheek. As if anticipating my action, she turned toward the door. I'll see you in a few days, she said, and I'll call London tomorrow. Sounds good, I said, opening the door for her. Behind her, idling on the street, was a limousine. Vivian started toward it, and I watched as the driver quickly exited the car to help her carry the box. He opened the door and put the box on the seat. Vivian waited for him to move aside, then got into the car. I couldn't help thinking that it all seemed as natural as breathing for her, as though she'd always had a car and driver, had always been the lover of a billionaire. I couldn't see her through the darkened glass of the car, and I wondered whether she was watching me, but in the end, I simply turned away. Stepping into the house, I closed the door behind me, feeling strangely sad. For a moment, I hesitated. Then I reached for my phone. Emily answered on the second ring. We were on the phone for nearly two hours, though I did most of the talking, working through my sense of loss. She managed to make me smile and laugh more than once. And every time I wondered aloud if I was a good person, she assured me that I was blameless. I needed to hear that, somehow. And when I finally turned in for the night, I closed my eyes wondering how I'd been lucky enough to rediscover Emily, who was exactly the kind of friend I needed most. Chapter 20 Autumn I love autumn, Emily said to me. It wins you over with its mute appeal to sympathy for its decay. Excuse me? I was talking about autumn, Emily said. I got that. I'm just trying to understand what you said. Not me, Robert Browning. Well, kind of. I might have gotten a few words wrong here or there. He was an English poet. I didn't know you read poetry. It was October 2002 a few months after Emily and I had been stuck on the Ferris wheel. It was also less than a few weeks after the great mistake, the one involving the woman I'd met in the bar. 
Marge had already warned me more than once not to say a thing to Emily, but I was still agonizing over my terrible secret. We were, in fact, on a double date with Marge and Liz. We'd taken a trip to the Biltmore House in Asheville, which was for a long time the largest private home in the world. I'd been there before as a child, but had never gone with Emily. It had been her idea to go, and also to invite Marge and Liz. When Emily had begun to quote Browning, the four of us were savoring wine from the Biltmore Winery. I majored in art, but I had to take other classes, too, Emily pointed out. I did, too, but I never took one that included poetry. That's because you majored in business. Exactly, Marge cut in. Just because you botched your education, there's no need to put Emily on the defensive. I'm not putting her on the defensive, and I didn't botch my education. I was just making conversation. Don't let him scare you off, Emily, Marge said. He might be a bit lowbrow, but he's got good qualities, too. Emily laughed. I hope so. It's been more than two years. I'd hate to think I've been slumming with him all this time. I'm right here, I said to both of them. I can hear you. Emily giggled, this time joined by Marge. Liz wore a benevolent expression. Don't let them get to you, Russ, Liz said, laying a hand on my arm. If they keep picking on you, then you and I can go toward the greenhouse and we'll hold hands and make them jealous. Did you hear that, Marge? I said. Liz is hitting on me. Good luck, Marge shrugged. I know her type, and you're not it. You've got a little too much of those Y chromosomes for her. That's a shame, because I know a hundred guys who would probably jump at the chance to go out with her. Marge smiled at Liz. Of that I have no doubt. Liz blushed, and I caught Emily's eye. In response, she leaned over and whispered in my ear, I think they're perfect together. I know, I whispered back. I do too. Even as I said it, guilt began to eat away at me with renewed fury. Less than a week later, I told her about the mistake. Why couldn't I have kept my mouth shut? No bruising, no cuts or blood or frantic calls to 911. After I dropped London off at school the next day, I found Marge waiting in my kitchen. I'd called her that morning to tell her about my visit with Vivian, but she told me to hold off because she wanted the full account in person. London's still sore, but she's doing fine. I wasn't talking about London, I meant you. Or I guess I should have been talking about Vivian, too, depending on how angry she made you. It was good, I assured her. Surprisingly pleasant, in fact. What does that even mean? She wasn't angry, and she didn't make me feel like the accident was my fault. She was... nice. You do understand that it wasn't your fault, she said. That's why they call them accidents. I know, I said, wondering whether I fully believed it. Marge turned and coughed. When she reached for her inhaler, I noticed that she looked a little drawn. Are you okay? You were coughing a lot the other night, I said, frowning. Tell me about it. Last week, I spent two days locked in a room with a client who was sick as a dog. Then, swell guy that he was, he called to let me know he had bronchitis. Have you seen a doctor? I went by the urgent care over the weekend. The doctor thinks it's probably viral, which means he didn't prescribe anything. I'm just hoping I have it completely behind me by the time Liz and I leave for Costa Rica. When is that trip again? The 20th until the 28th. I wonder what it would be like to have time for a vacation, I mused feeling a little sorry for myself. It's wonderful, Marge shot back. Whining, on the other hand, is less than appealing. How are you and Emily getting along? Did you tell her what happened to London? I spoke with her last night, after Vivian left. Ah. What do you mean by ah? You know the old saying, the quickest way to get over someone is to get over someone else. Classy. Don't blame me, she said. I didn't invent the expression. And we both know it goes for women, too. As in, the quickest way to get over someone is to get under someone else. Emily and I are just friends. She reached over and gave my shoulder a squeeze. Keep telling yourself that, little brother. After Marge left, getting to the office was easy. But immersing myself in work was more elusive. While the emotional intensity of the last two days didn't come close to rivaling the days immediately following Vivian's announcement that she was in love with Spannerman, my reserves were low. Too much had happened in too short a time. It hadn't even been a month since all the upheaval began. Nonetheless, there were things to do. At the top of the agenda was ensuring that the filming of Taglieri's fourth commercial was on track. By the time I reconfirmed everything, 
I was surprised to see an email from the editor stating that the editing for the third commercial, the one featuring the child actress, was complete. Because the third commercial had turned out so well, my instincts were to start airing both the initial one as well as the third right away. I left a message at Taglieri's office suggesting that, and soon received the go-ahead. As I locked in the schedule with the cable company, I felt a familiar thrill at the thought that my work and my company would soon reach hundreds of thousands of people. On a less thrilling note, I also left two messages at the dance studio. Miss Hamshaw had yet to return my call. London was all smiles when I spotted her at pickup amongst her classmates, and though she walked more slowly than usual to the car, I could tell already that she'd had a good day. Guess what, she said as soon as she climbed into the car. My teacher let me be her helper today. It was so much fun. What did you do? I got to help her hand out papers, and I got to collect them, and I got to clean the whiteboard with the eraser during recess. But then she let me color on it, and I got to erase that too, and I got to wear a badge that said, Teacher Helper, all day. And you could do all that with your sore wrist? I just used my other hand, she said, demonstrating. It was easy. And at the end of the day, I got a lollipop. That sounds like a pretty amazing day. Do you need my help buckling yourself in? I'd had to do it for her that morning. No, she said. I think I can do it now. I had to learn to do a lot of stuff with one hand. I watched as she tugged at the seatbelt. Though it took a bit longer than usual, she was finally able to manage. I pulled out of the lot and was beginning to accelerate on the road when I heard her voice again. Hey, Daddy? My eyes flickered to the rearview mirror. Yes, sweetheart? Do I have to go to dance tonight? No, I said. The doctor said that you should probably take it easy this week. Oh, she said. How is your head today? And your wrist? My head didn't hurt at all. My wrist hurts sometimes, but I tried to be strong like Bodhi. I smiled. Is Bodhi strong? He's very strong, she said, nodding. He can pick up everyone in the whole class, even Jenny. I gathered Jenny was big for her age. Wow, I said. I didn't know that. Do you think I can go over to Bodhi's house? I want to see Noodle again. I flashed to an image of Emily. I'll have to ask Bodhi's mom, but if it's all right with her, it's all right with me. Not this week, though. Maybe next week, okay? Since you should be resting. Okay, she said. I like Miss Emily. She's nice. I'm glad, I said. And it was fun going to the zoo with her and Bodhi. Can I see the pictures I took on your phone? I handed my cell phone back to her and she began scanning through the pictures. She reminisced about the animals she'd seen and what they'd been doing. And as she chattered on, I noticed that London didn't mention her mother at all, even though she'd seen Vivian the day before. London, I realized, had grown accustomed to spending time with me alone, for better or for worse. Because she'd watched television for much of the day before, I didn't want to park London in front of the electronic babysitter again. At the same time, I had to limit her activity, and we'd already done the coloring thing not too long ago, so I was at a bit of a loss. On a whim, I decided to swing by Walmart on the way home from school. There, I chose a board game called Hoot Owl Hoot. The box explained that the goal of the game was to help the owls fly back to their nest before the sun came up. Each player drew a color card and flew an owl to a color tile on the way to its nest. But if a player drew a sun card, the game moved one step closer to sunrise. All the players won if the owls made it back to their nests in time. I figured that it was something both of us could handle. London was thrilled to visit the toy section of the store, and she wandered from one side of the aisle to the other, enthralled by one item after the other. More than once, she pulled an item from a shelf or rack and asked if she could have it. While I was tempted to give in, I didn't. Nearly everything she'd shown me would have held her interest for only a few minutes after we returned home, and her toy box and shelves were already bursting with neglected stuffed animals and knickknacks. The game ended up being a hit. Because the rules were simple, London got the hang of it quickly and she was alternately overjoyed or despondent, depending on whether the owls appeared as if they would make it home in time. We ended up playing four games at the kitchen table before she began to tire. Afterward, I relented when she asked if she could watch TV for a while, and she lay on the couch, yawning. Maybe it was just Vivian's voice harping in the back of my mind, but I felt that I still needed to let Hamshaw know about the accident. Because she hadn't returned my call, however, I felt like I had to do it in person. I told London about swinging by the studio, loaded her in the car, and spotted Miss Hamshaw in what I assumed was her glass-walled office. London elected to stay in the car, 
Miss Hamshaw had looked over at me as soon as I entered, but took her time before finally making her way over to me. London wasn't in class on Monday, she observed, arching an eyebrow in apparent displeasure before I even had a chance to speak. She was in a pretty bad accident on her bike, I said. I left you a couple of voicemails. She ended up at the hospital. She's recovering, but she won't be in class today or Friday either. Miss Hamshaw's expression did not change. I'm glad to hear she's all right, but she has a performance coming up. She still needs to attend class. She can't. The doctor says she has to take it easy this week. Then, unfortunately, she can't perform in the recital next Friday night. I blinked. Excuse me? London has already missed two classes. If she misses a third, she's not eligible to perform. You may feel that to be unfair, but it's one of the ground rules of the studio. She was informed of that when she signed up. She was sick the first time, I said, with dawning incredulity. On Monday, she was unconscious. I'm sorry to hear of her misfortune, Miss Hamshaw said, sounding anything but. As I said earlier, I'm glad she's recovering, but rules are rules. With that, she crossed her skinny arms. Is this because she needs to practice? She's one of the trees, and she showed me what she's supposed to do. I'm sure if she's here next week, she'll have more than enough time to master it. You're missing the point. Miss Hamshaw's mouth was a thin line. I have rules for the studio because parents and students will always find a reason not to come to class. Someone is sick or a grandparent is visiting or there's too much homework. I've heard every excuse imaginable over the years, but I can't foster a culture of excellence unless everyone shows commitment. London's not participating in any competitions, I reasoned. She hasn't been chosen to do so. Then perhaps she should practice more, not less. I squelched the urge to let Miss Hamshaw know what I thought of her ridiculous little quasi-military operation, and instead said patiently, What do you suggest that I do, since her doctor told us to limit her activity? She can come to class and sit in the corner and watch. Right now her head hurts and she's exhausted, and on Friday she'll just be bored if she sits and watches. Then she can look forward to the Christmas show. Where she'll be a tree again? Or maybe an ornament? Miss Hamshaw straightened, her nostrils flaring. There are other dancers in her class who demonstrate much greater commitment. This is ridiculous, I blurted out. That's what people generally say when they don't like the rules. I brought London home and we ate the leftover Chinese food. Vivian called, and by the time the FaceTime session had ended, London could barely keep her eyes open. I made the executive decision to skip her bath and got her into her pajamas. I read a short book to her in bed and she was asleep moments after I turned out the light. Descending the stairs, I told myself that I should use the rest of the evening to get some work done, but I simply wasn't in the mood. Instead, I called Emily. Hey there, she said as soon as she answered. How are things? Not too bad, I guess. How's London? Bodhi said she got to be the teacher's helper, so she must be recuperating nicely. Yeah, she was pretty excited about that, I said. And she's fine, really. Just a little tired. What did you end up doing today? Worked on one of the paintings for my show. I think I'm getting closer, but I'm just guessing. I could probably work on this one forever and never think it's done. I want to see it. Anytime, she said. Thankfully, the other paintings I've started are going well. So far, anyway. She smiled. How are you holding up? I can't imagine how scared you must have been. I'd probably still be traumatized. It was pretty bad, I admitted and tonight wasn't so relaxing. What happened? I replayed my conversation with Miss Hamshaw. So she can't do the recital? Emily asked when I was finished. I don't think she was all that excited about it anyway, I said. I just wish Vivian weren't so hell-bent on having her go there. I don't think London enjoys it at all. Then let her quit. I don't want another reason to argue with Vivian, and I don't want London in the middle of it. Did you ever think that by continually appeasing Vivian, you're just adding fuel to the fire? How do you mean? If you give in every time Vivian gets angry, then she knows that all she has to do is be angry to get what she wants. I mean, so what if she gets angry? What's she going to do? She didn't add the question, divorce you? But the obvious truth of her observation startled me. Was that the reason things had started going downhill in the first place? Because I'd never stood up to Vivian? because I wanted to avoid conflict? What had Marge once said to me? Your real problem is that you're too damn nice for your own good. At my silence, Emily went on. 
I don't know if what I said has any bearing, I could be wrong, and I'm not saying this because I want the two of you to argue. I'm just saying that you're London's father, and you have just as much right as Vivian when it comes to making decisions as to what is best for London. Lately, you have even more rights than she does since you're the one who's taking care of her. You're the primary parent these days, not her, but you still seem to trust Vivian's judgment more than your own. To me, London seems like a very happy little girl, so it's clear you've been doing something right. So, what do you think I should do? I asked, trying to digest what she'd said. Why don't you talk to London and ask her what she wants to do, and then just trust your instincts? You make it sound so easy. Other people's problems are always easier to solve. Haven't you learned that yet? She laughed, a sound at once reassuring and refreshing. I have to say, sometimes you remind me a lot of Marge. I'm going to take that as a compliment. It is. Emily and I chatted for another hour, and as always, after speaking with her, I felt better. More grounded. More like myself again, and it was enough to spur me to spend an hour on the computer, getting a jump on the next day's work. In the morning, while London was eating her cereal, I explained what Miss Hampshaw had said. You mean I can't be in the recital? I'm sorry, sweetie. Are you mad you can't dance in the show? London's reaction was immediate. It's okay, she said with a shrug. I didn't want to be a tree anyway. If it makes you feel better, I thought you were a very good tree. She looked at me as though I had corn stalks growing out of my ears. It's a tree, Daddy. The butterfly gets to move around. Trees don't. Hmm, I said, nodding. Good point. Do I have to go to dance on Friday? Do you want to go? When she shrugged instead of answering, it wasn't hard to read between the lines. If you don't want to go, then I don't think you should go. You should only go to dance because you like it and you want to go. For a moment, London studied the floating marshmallows in her bowl of Lucky Charms, and I wondered if she had heard me. Then, I don't think I want to go anymore. Miss Hamshaw doesn't like me very much. Fine, I said. You no longer have to go to dance. London hesitated, and when she looked up at me, I thought I detected a trace of anxiety in her expression. What's Mom going to say? She'll probably get angry, I thought. She'll understand, I said, trying to sound more confident than I felt. After dropping London off at school, I went to the studio, where I met the animal trainer and Gus, a bull mastiff. The commercial would emphasize tenacity, and the plan was to have Gus tugging relentlessly on a dog toy. Intercut with the images of the dog would be four screenshots with the following captions. When you've been injured on the job, you need a determined and relentless attorney. Call the offices of Joey Taglieri. He won't stop until you get the money you deserve. Gus the Bull Mastiff ended up being quite a talented actor, and filming wrapped well before noon. London wasn't quite as chipper when I picked her up from school as she'd been the day before. Limiting activity in TV required a bit of creativity, and I decided to bring her to the pet store. I needed shavings for the hamsters anyway, but I thought she might enjoy looking at the fish. There were more than 50 different aquariums. Each aquarium had placards that listed the specific types of fish. London and I spent more than an hour moving from tank to tank and naming the various kinds of fish. It wasn't quite SeaWorld, I'll admit, but it wasn't a bad way to spend a quiet afternoon. On the way out, she spent some time playing with a few Cocker Spaniel puppies that were tumbling around in a low pen. They were very cute, and I breathed a sigh of relief when she didn't ask for one. That was fun, Daddy, she said as we headed to the car. I had the bag of shavings and hamster food tucked beneath my arm. I thought you might like that. We should get some fish. Some of them were really pretty. Aquariums are even harder to clean than hamster cages. I'm sure you could figure it out, Daddy. Maybe but I don't know where we would put the aquarium. We could put it on the kitchen table. That's an idea, but where would we eat? We could eat on the couch. I couldn't suppress a smile. I loved talking to my daughter. I truly did. On the way home, I swung by the grocery store. Using one of the recipes that Liz had given me, I picked up the ingredients for chicken quesadillas. I let London pretty much fix dinner on her own, I walked her through each step, and I sliced the chicken after she'd sautéed it. But aside from those things, London did everything herself. She cooked the chicken, added the slices to tortillas, added the grated cheese, and folded the tortillas before putting each one into a pan so it could toast on both sides. When the meal was ready, 
she directed me to the table and brought over two plates of food, utensils, and two glasses of milk. This looks delicious and it smells great, I commented. I want to take a picture for Auntie Liz and Auntie Marge before you start. Okay, I said. I handed my phone to her and she snapped pictures of both plates, then texted them to both. Where did you learn how to text? I asked, amazed. Mommy showed me. Bodhi, too. He showed me on Emily's phone. I think I'm old enough for a phone. You might be, but I'd rather talk to you in person. She rolled her eyes, but I could tell she thought it was funny. You can eat now if you want, she said. I cut a piece with my fork and took a bite. Wow, I said. This is very tasty. You did a fantastic job. Thank you, she said. Don't forget to drink your milk. I won't, I said. I couldn't remember the last time I'd had a glass of milk. It tasted better than I remembered. This is amazing, I said. I can't believe how big you're getting. I'm almost six. I know. Do you know what you want for your birthday? She thought about it. Maybe an aquarium, she said, and lots of pretty fish. Or maybe a poodle like Noodle. Maybe, I thought to myself. Spending the day at the pet store hadn't been such a good idea. After London had gone to bed, I gave Emily a call. I caught her while she was lying in bed, and as always we drifted into an easy conversation that was a mixture of reminiscing about our earlier years and discussing details of our current lives. The call lasted for nearly 40 minutes, and when I hung up the phone I realized that talking to Emily was not only becoming part of my routine, but one of the brightest spots of my days. On Friday afternoon, Vivian texted that she would be arriving between 9 and 10, which was well past London's normal bedtime. After receiving the text at work, I took a moment to wonder what, if anything, would be expected of me when she arrived, since London might not be awake. Would Vivian finally want to talk? Watch TV in the family room with or without me? Or would she head straight to the guest room? And what was I going to do all weekend? I tried to repeat Emily's Zen mantra, but it didn't help. Part of me, I knew, was still trying to figure out how to please Vivian. Old habits die hard. With dance class off the schedule, I opted for another date night with London, with the idea of keeping her awake until Vivian arrived. I thought bringing her to dinner and a movie would be fun, and I was able to find a kid's movie that would end in time to have us home by nine. After that, London could hop in the bath and put on her pajamas, and with any sort of luck, Vivian would arrive right around then. I revealed my plans to London when I picked her up from school, and as soon as we got home, she raced up the steps to start getting ready. You have plenty of time, I called after her. We don't have to leave until 5.30. I want to start now, she called back. She was fully dressed by four and found me in the den, working on the computer, finalizing the still shots I planned to intercut in the dog commercial. She'd chosen a white blouse, white skirt, and white shoes and stockings, her hair held back with a white headband. You look very beautiful, I said, mentally crossing off all Italian restaurants from the list of possible dinner destinations. A single slip in her outfit would be massacred. Thank you, she said, but I don't like the bandaid on my forehead or my splint. I didn't even notice them, I said. I'm sure you'll be the prettiest girl in the whole restaurant. She beamed. When are we going to leave? We still have an hour and a half. Okay, she said. I can go sit in the family room until we're ready. You could play with your Barbies, I suggested. I don't want to get my dress wrinkled. Of course. What would you like to do? I don't know, but I don't want to get dirty. I thought about it. Would you like to play Hoot Owl Hoot again? She clapped her hands. Yes! We played for an hour before I went to change. Like the last time, I donned slacks and a blazer along with a stylish new pair of loafers. London was waiting for me in the foyer and trying to add a bit of ceremony to the occasion. I bowed before opening the door for her. We had dinner at an upscale steakhouse, and after a couple of minutes of adult-like conversation, London slipped back into little girl mode. We talked about Bodhi and her teacher in school, and about the kind of fish she wanted in the aquarium. Afterward, we went to the movie, which left London energized, perhaps it was the Raisinets, and eager to see her mom. Hurrying upstairs when we got back home, she quickly bathed and slipped into her pajamas. Vivian arrived at the house not long after I'd begun to read. London jumped from the bed and ran down the stairs. I followed, watching as London threw herself into her mother's arms, Vivian's eyes closing in contented delight. I'm so glad I got to see you before you went to sleep, Vivian said. Me too, 
Daddy and me went on a date. We had dinner and we saw a movie and we talked about my aquarium. Aquarium? For her birthday, I said. How are you? Good. That's a long drive, especially when it starts at rush hour. I nodded, feeling strangely out of place. I motioned upstairs. I've already read to her if you want to go up. She faced London again. Do you want mommy to read you a few stories? Yes, London cried. I watched as the two of them climbed the stairs. And though I was in my house with my wife and daughter, I suddenly felt very much alone. I retreated to the master bedroom. I didn't want to talk to Vivian, nor did I think she wanted that either. Instead, I read in bed and tried not to think about the fact that Vivian would be spending the night under the same roof. I fantasized briefly about her sneaking into my bedroom and wondered what I would do. Would I acquiesce with the excuse that we were still married? Or even as a last hurrah? Or would I have the resolve that Emily showed when David had made a pass at her? I wanted to think I'd be more like Emily, but I wasn't sure I was as strong as she'd been. Nonetheless, I had a feeling that neither of us would be happy afterward. I was no longer a part of her future, and it would only reinforce the hold that Vivian still had over me, despite all she'd done. Moreover, I suspected that I'd feel guilty, because as I imagined making love to Vivian again, I realized with sudden clarity that what I wanted even more than that was for it to be Emily instead. In the morning, I rose early and went for a long run. I showered, made myself breakfast, and was on my second cup of coffee when Vivian found me in the kitchen. She was in long pajamas, a set I'd bought her for her birthday a couple of years back. She went to the cupboard and pulled out a tea bag, then added water to the tea kettle on the stove. Sleep well? I asked. I did, thanks. The mattress in the guest room is better than I remembered, but I might just be tired. Have you decided what you want to do with London today? After art class, I mean? I don't want to do anything too demanding. She should still take it easy. We could go to Discovery Place, but I want to see what London wants to do. I'm going to the office, I informed her. I want to get as much done for the plastic surgeon as I can, especially since he dropped everything to help London. Tell him thank you from me. He did a very good job. I peeked at it last night. The tea kettle whistled and she added hot water to her cup. She seemed to debate whether or not to join me at the table before finally taking a seat. There's something I need to tell you, I said, about dance. What about dance? Vivian took a tentative sip from her steaming cup. I recapped everything for her, trying to keep it as succinct as possible, including the fact that London wasn't going to be allowed to dance at the recital. Huh, Vivian said. And you told her that London was in the hospital? I told her. It didn't matter. And then London told me straight up that she doesn't want to go anymore. She doesn't think Miss Hamshaw likes her. If she doesn't want to go, then don't make her go. It's just dance. Vivian gave an elaborate shrug. She spoke without the slightest acknowledgement of her previous insistence that London attend in the first place. There was no reason to bring it up, but it made me wonder whether I'd ever be able to understand what made Vivian tick, and whether I'd ever really understood her at all. London came downstairs while we were still in the kitchen. She wandered over to the table, still dopey with sleep. Hi, Mommy and Daddy, she said, giving both of us hugs. What can I get you for breakfast? Vivian asked. Lucky charms. Okay, sweetie, Vivian said. I'll get it for you. I folded my newspaper and stood, trying to mask my amazement at how easily Vivian had acquiesced to London's request for a sugary cereal. Have fun today, ladies, I said. I spent nearly the entire day on the computer, finalizing everything I could do for the tech aspect of the plastic surgeon's ad campaign aside from the posting of the patient videos to the website. I forwarded the information to my tech guy and also emailed reminders to the patients about filming on Tuesday. It was nearly six when I finally looked up. I texted Vivian asking what time London would be going to bed because I wanted to read to her. Vivian answered immediately with the time. Because I'd worked through lunch, I grabbed a sandwich at the deli across the street and decided to give Emily a call. Am I catching you at a bad time? I asked, idly cleaning up my desk. Not at all, she said. Bodie's playing in his room and I was just cleaning the kitchen. How's the weekend going? So far, so good. I was at the office all day. Got a ton of work done. I'm going to head home in a bit to read to London. I saw her today when I dropped Bodie off at art. Vivian, too. How'd that go? I didn't stick around to chat, she said. 
Good plan. I'll probably find a way to hide from Vivian after I read to London, too. No reason to press my luck. What are your plans for tonight? Nothing. Finish cleaning the kitchen, watch TV. Maybe have a glass of wine after Bodhi goes to bed. Unbidden thoughts of making love to Emily resurfaced, as they had the other night. I pushed them firmly away. Do you want some company? I asked. After I finish with London, I could swing by for an hour or so. Maybe you can show me that painting you've been working on. She hesitated, and I was certain she was going to say no. I'd like that, she said instead. I made it home just as London was getting ready for bed, and as usual, Vivian and I slipped into our familiar roles. She read first, and then I went up to read to London. London chattered on about her day. In addition to art class and discovery plays, they'd gone to the mall, and by the time I turned out the light, Vivian was already in the guest room with the door closed. I knocked on the door and heard her voice from the other side. Yes? I'm going out for a little bit. I just wanted to let you know in case London wakes up. I should be back before eleven. I could almost hear her asking, Where are you going? in the silence that followed. Okay, she said after a moment. Thanks for letting me know. Emily had left a note tacked to the door, inviting me in and directing me to the back porch. I moved quietly through the house, trying not to wake Bodhi. I felt a little like a teenager trying to sneak past my parents, and wondered if the child inside us ever truly left any of us. Emily was barefoot tonight, in jeans and a red blouse, with her long legs propped against a low bench that lined the porch. A chair had been placed next to her. On the porch table stood an open bottle of wine and an empty glass. She held a half-full glass in her own hand. Perfect timing, she said. I just checked on Bodie and he's sound asleep. London, too. I got started without you, she said, raising her own glass. Help yourself. I poured and sat next to her. Thanks for having me over. When a friend says he has to hide, my door is open. How is it really, though? I considered the question before answering. We haven't fought, but we haven't seen much of each other either. It's strange, though. It feels like there's this awkward heaviness in the house. Emotions are heavy things, she said, and it's still early for both of you. How was London when you read to her? She was fine. They had a good day. Do you think she knows what's going on yet? I think she knows there's something different, but that's it. That's probably a good thing for now. It's hard enough to get through this stage without worrying about your child as well. I nodded, knowing she was right. Do you sit out here a lot? Less than I should. Sometimes I forget how pretty it is. I love seeing the stars between all the trees and the sound of crickets. She shook her head. I don't know. I guess I just get stuck in my routines, which is why I still haven't gotten around to listing the house yet. I get lazy. I don't think you're lazy. We're just creatures of habit. I took a sip of wine, letting a comfortable silence settle between us. Finally, I said, I feel like I should thank you. Why? I felt her turn toward me, her eyes seeking me out in the darkness. For letting me come over. For talking to me on the phone. For the advice you give. For putting up with my confusion and whining. Everything. That's what friends are for. Emily, we're old friends, I said. But it's been a long time, and it's not like we've been close these past fifteen years. Somehow, though, in just a short time, you've become one of my best friends. Again. I could see the starlight flickering in her eyes. I read something about friendship once and it stuck with me. It goes like this. Friendship isn't about how long you know someone. It's about who walks into your life, says, I'm here for you, and then proves it. I smiled. I like that. Russ, you sound like you think you're a burden to me, but you're not. Believe it or not, I like talking to you, and I like that we've rekindled our friendship. Aside from Grace and Marguerite, it's just Bodhi and me. And I don't know, there's something so comforting about our shorthand, not having to explain everything about who we are and where we came from. We know all that stuff already. Guess I'm like an old shoe, huh? She laughed. A favorite shoe, maybe. One that always fit just right and you were never able to replace. I felt a genuine warmth flowing from her then, and it was such a reassuring sensation one that I had missed, I realized, in all these uncertain years with Vivian. I feel the same way, Em. I stared at her. 
I really do. She was quiet for a moment, rotating the glass of wine in her hands. Do you remember that night when we got stuck on the Ferris wheel, the night of the fireworks? I remember, I said. I thought you were going to propose to me that night, she said softly. And when you didn't, I was so disappointed. I'm sorry, I said, meaning it. Don't be. It's silly. She waved my apology away. The point I'm trying to make is that I would have said yes, and maybe we would have gotten married. But that also means I wouldn't have Bodhi, and you wouldn't have London. And then who would we be? Maybe we would have ended up getting divorced, or hate each other now. I think we could have made it. Her smile seemed to hold a trace of melancholy. Maybe. There's no way of knowing. We've both been knocked around enough by life to understand how unpredictable life can be. I stared at her. You do know that you continually say things that surprise me and make me think. That's because I majored in the humanities, not business. I laughed, suddenly flooded with gratitude that she'd come back into my life, just when I needed her most. It wasn't until well past midnight that I finally made it home. You were out late last night, Vivian remarked as we crossed paths in the kitchen the next morning. I thought you said you'd be home by eleven. Despite the late night, I'd risen early and was ready to start my day by the time Vivian made it downstairs. Time got away from me, I offered. I could tell she was curious about where I'd been and what I'd been doing, but it wasn't her business. Not anymore. Changing the subject, I asked, What time do you think you'll be leaving, since you have to drive? Six, six thirty? I don't know for sure yet. Do you want to have a family dinner before you go? I was going to take London out for an early dinner. All right, I said. I'll be here at six then. She seemed to be waiting for me to announce something about my plans for the day. Instead, I went back to sipping my coffee and perusing the paper. When she realized I wasn't going to speak, she finally went back upstairs, no doubt so she could shower and get ready for her day with London. Chapter 21 Clicking on All Cylinders Emily and I saw each other six times before we ever slept together. Our first date after the wedding was the hike she'd suggested. We also went to a concert. We'd had lunch and dinner a few times. By then, I was already falling hard for her, but I wasn't quite sure how she felt about me. That morning, I picked her up early and we drove to Wrightsville Beach. We lunched at a small oceanside restaurant before strolling to the water's edge. We collected seashells in my baseball cap as we rambled down the beach in the direction of the pier, and I can still picture the way the breeze lifted glinting strands of her hair as she bent down to retrieve a particularly beautiful shell. We both knew what was coming. I'd arranged for a hotel room for the night, but instead of growing more nervous as the day wore on, she seemed to settle into a state of languid ease. Late in the afternoon, after we checked in, she took a long shower while I lay on the bed flipping through channels on the television. Afterward, she wandered out wrapped only in a towel to retrieve a change of clothes. What are you watching? You, I could have said, but instead I answered, nothing really, just waiting for you to finish in the bathroom so I can shower too. It won't be long, she promised. It occurred to me that Emily, more than any woman to that point in my life, made me feel comfortable because she always seemed so comfortable with me. I gave her a few minutes before getting up from the bed. By then she was dressed and applying a little makeup. What are you doing? she asked. Just watching you. I met her gaze in the mirror. Why? I think watching you put on makeup is sexy. She turned around and puckered her lips. We kissed and she turned back around. What was that for? Once I get my lipstick on, you won't be able to kiss me for a while, unless you want to wear lipstick too. I continued to watch for another minute before heading back to the bed. I plopped down, pleasantly buzzed by her kiss and the promise of the evening to come. We ate at a bistro overlooking the intracoastal waterway, lingering over dinner long after the sun went down. On our way out, we heard music and followed the sound to a bar down the street, where we found a live band playing. We danced until the bar closed, pleasantly weary as we strolled back to the hotel after midnight. Electricity crackled between us as I unlocked the door and we stepped into our room. The maids had turned down the bed and the lights had been dimmed. I slipped my arms around Emily and pulled her close, 
feeling the warmth of her body against my own. I kissed her then, our tongues coming together while my hands slowly began to explore the contours of her body. She gave a shallow gasp, and our passion became more intense as I felt her breast through the thin fabric of her dress. Her fingers reached for the buttons of my shirt. We continued to kiss as she undid them one by one. I lifted her dress and she raised her arms to assist me. I slipped it over her head while my shirt fell to the ground, her skin fiery against my own. Her bra came next, and soon we were naked on the bed and moving together, lost in our own feelings and the mysteries of each other. It finally happened on Wednesday, and I'll admit that I was as surprised as the receptionist, but I'll get to that. First things first. On Sunday, Marge and Liz weren't at my parents' when I arrived, and when I called her house, Marge sounded utterly miserable, coughing, achy, feverish the whole nine yards. When my mom found out, she decided then and there to make chicken soup, which I was then tasked with delivering to Marge. If possible, she looked worse than she sounded, and joked that even Liz was keeping her distance, since she had clearly been infected with the plague. Deciding to take my chances, I hugged her anyway, before heading home. Vivian left around 6.30 after bringing London back from dinner. Her departure was as cordial as the rest of the weekend had been. She asked no questions about my day, and I asked no questions about hers. Instead, we simply wished each other well as she headed out the door. After I put London to bed, I called Emily to ask if she would mind picking up London from school on Tuesday, since I'd be filming all day. Emily assured me that it wouldn't be a problem. On Monday, Taglieri's new website went live, and the first two commercials began to air. I posted the commercials on his website as well as on YouTube. I worked from home so I could watch the spots as they aired, feeling an almost physical thrill as I watched them. Meanwhile, I worked on templates for direct mail and billboards for the plastic surgeon, getting the messaging right. On Tuesday, I filmed his patients, a very long day as I'd predicted, and then went to pick up London at Emily's where we ended up staying for dinner, much to London's delight. On Wednesday, as I was driving to the office, I received a text from Taglieri asking me to call him, and I felt my heart sink. Maybe because the previous weekend had been devoid of drama with Vivian, I felt certain that he was calling with what could only be bad news on the divorce front. I returned the call right after I parked, standing outside my office. I felt like I needed to be standing when I spoke to him. Hi, Joey, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I got your text. What's up? My business, he said. My future bank account. Excuse me? You know that new toll-free number? The one you splattered all over those two commercials? The phone's been ringing off the hook. It's crazy. People love that commercial with the kid. They think it's hilarious. And now we can direct them to the website for basic information. It's incredible. I never would have believed it. My staff is going crazy just trying to keep up. You're happy, I said, stunned. Damn right I'm happy. When's that dog commercial going to run? And you need to come up with some more ideas, so put your thinking cap on. I can do that, I said. And Russ? Yeah? Thanks. I hung up the phone and strode into the office, feeling like I was six inches taller. When I waved to the receptionist, I watched as she raised her hand. Mr. Green, don't you want your messages? I have messages? Two, actually. They're both from law firms. Again, I thought of Vivian and wondered if she'd told her attorney to reach out to me directly. If so, I wasn't sure why Vivian hadn't given the lady my cell phone number. As far as I knew, Vivian didn't even know my work number. But it wasn't Vivian's attorney who'd called. One call was from a firm in Greenville, South Carolina that specialized in class actions, the other from a personal injury firm in Hickory. In both cases, I was connected immediately to senior partners, each of whom seemed eager to speak with me. I like those commercials you're doing for Joey Taglieri, and we were wondering if you would consider coming in to make a presentation about your services. After hanging up, I let out a whoop of excitement. I just had to tell someone. I reached for my phone, about to call Marge, but then decided at the last second to call Emily instead. Floating. That's how I felt the rest of the week. Like I was floating free of the worries that had been weighing me down for months. Though it might be only temporary, what goes up always comes down and all that. I decided I was going to enjoy every single minute, even if I didn't land the two new firms as clients. While it would be great to sign those firms, I received three more calls from lawyers by Friday, 
making five new potential clients, all of whom had reached out to me. I'd set up presentations with all of them, and depending on how many I signed, I thought I might be looking at potentially needing to hire another person just to keep up. The Phoenix Agency was officially on its way. What are you going to do with all that extra money you'll be making? Marge said to me over lunch. It was Friday afternoon, and I decided to work only a half day as a reward. Because you happen to have a sister who's in the mood for a new car. Wouldn't that be nice? I always knew you'd make it. I haven't made it yet, I cautioned. I still have to make the presentations. You're good at that part. You just weren't so good at getting the phone to ring. I smiled, still on a high. I'm so excited and relieved. I can only imagine. How are you feeling? She made a face. A little better. I'm not coughing too much during the day now, but the nights are still pretty rough. I finally convinced my idiot doctor to prescribe some antibiotics, but I just started taking them yesterday. He said I might not feel any better until Monday. That's a bummer. It's bad for Liz, too. I kept waking her up, so I've started sleeping in the guest room. So mom's chicken soup didn't work? No, but it tasted good. She pushed her sandwich away. What are your plans this weekend? Vivian's not coming, is she? She'll be here next weekend, for London's birthday. And I can't imagine London not wanting Bodie to be there, which means that Emily will probably make an appearance at the party as well. And me, Marge said, grinning. I can't wait to watch. Nothing's going to happen. She's been on good behavior lately. Hmm, let's see how long that lasts, Marge said with a skeptical look. By the way, are you going to Mom and Dad's tomorrow? Liz and I are planning to swing by for a little while, especially since we weren't there last weekend. Since I had the plague, I mean. Thank God you haven't given it to Liz, I remarked. Yes, especially since she's getting crushed at work. One of the other therapists in her practice group has been on maternity leave since late July. Speaking of maternity, when do you and Liz meet with the fertility doctor? Didn't you say sometime in November? She nodded. On the 20th, the Friday before Thanksgiving. What happens if you're both able to have kids? Would you both get pregnant? I'd have the child. I always thought it would be fun to be pregnant. Tell me if you're still feeling that way around the eight-month mark. By the time London was born, Vivian was thoroughly sick of being pregnant. That's Vivian, and she was younger. I know this will be the only time for me, and I'd make sure to enjoy every minute of it. Having a child is going to change your life. It's changed mine, that's for sure. She looked almost wistful. I can't wait. When I picked London up from school, the first thing she asked when she got in the car was whether we were going to have date night again. Since it's Friday and Mommy's not here? Why not? That sounds like a terrific idea. What should we do? London asked, already buzzing with anticipation. Hmm, I said. We could have dinner at home or go out. Or we could go to the real aquarium. The aquarium! Can we really go there? Of course. I'm pretty sure it's open until 8 o'clock. Can we ask Bodie if he wants to come? You want to bring Bodie on our date night? Yes, and I can wear my butterfly wings, the ones I got at the zoo, and he can wear his wings, too. To the aquarium? For the fish, she said. I wasn't sure I understood the correlation, but if it made her happy, that was fine with me. I can call, but Bodie might be busy tonight. It's kind of last minute. We should try, and Miss Emily can come, too. I waited until we got home before calling Emily. When I asked about the aquarium, she told me to hold on and then called out to Bodie. Do you want to go to the aquarium tonight? London is going. Yes, I heard Bodie shout before Emily came back on the line. I take it you heard him? I did, I said. What time are you thinking? How about I pick you up in an hour? She hesitated. How about I pick you up? DVDs for the kids, remember? I know it's not that far, but we'll be dealing with rush hour traffic. Are you okay with doing the driving again? Sure, I agreed. Text me the address and let me start getting the two of us ready. See you in a bit. Oh, I said. London wants Bodie to wear the wings he got at the zoo. Why? I don't know. She laughed. It's fine with me, and way better than having him run around with a lightsaber. As was becoming her habit, London took a while to get ready for date night. Ultimately, she picked a white skirt with lace, a long-sleeved pink top, pink sneakers, and, of course, the butterfly wings. 
I'd opted for a more casual outfit. Dark pants, dark shirt, and comfortable shoes. That's an eye-catching outfit, I said. You definitely look ready to see the fish. I want to get some ideas for my aquarium, she said. For her birthday, I thought. At least she was making it easy for me, even if I'd end up cleaning the thing. Do you want to pick a movie? We'll be riding with Miss Emily again. I think we should watch Finding Nemo. Sounds like a good choice to me. She found the case and brought it to me. As she was handing it over, I received another message from Taglieri. Calls still coming in like crazy. You're the man. What a great week this was turning out to be. What I didn't know was that it was going to get a whole lot better. Sea Life Aquarium was located in Concord, about 15 miles north of Charlotte, but the traffic meant it took nearly 40 minutes to get there. Not that any of us minded. I caught Emily up on my recent work triumphs, hinted at Marge and Liz's plans to start a family, and talked about my parents. She shared the latest updates on her family and her paintings for the show. Again, by unspoken agreement, we didn't mention Vivian, David, or our shared past. At the aquarium, the kids raced from one exhibit to the next, just as they'd done at the zoo. Emily and I trailed behind, keeping an eye on them. As we followed, I couldn't help noticing the glances that Emily drew from other men. Most of them were with their own families and were circumspect. I'm not sure Emily noticed at all. But I found myself attuned to the way people reacted to her in a way I hadn't before. We finished our tour of the aquarium, the biggest hits for the kids being the sharks, sea turtles, seahorses, and the octopus. Just as we were stepping out the door onto the promenade, I heard music drifting out of an open door marked as an employee entrance. The song that was on came to an end, and a radio DJ came on the air announcing the song coming up. J.D. Iker's 2 by 2 I paused. Did you hear that, London? There's a song called 2 by 2 just like your favorite book. Is it about animals? I don't know, I said. The DJ was still talking and I turned to Emily. She was supposed to have a recital tonight. She wanted to be the butterfly. Right now, I am a butterfly, London announced, letting her wings catch the evening breeze. Well, since it's date night, would you like to dance with me? Yes! A moment later, the song started, and I took London's hands. By that time, the sun was low in the sky, twilight turning the world sepia-colored. Aside from Emily and Bodie, we had the promenade to ourselves. I found the lyrics strangely affecting as I danced with my daughter. She swayed and bounced and held my hands, revealing flashes of the young woman she would become and the innocent girl she still was. We'll find our way two by two. It was, I realized, the first dance I'd ever shared with my daughter, and I didn't know when or if it would happen again. I couldn't imagine dancing with her in a few years. By then, the idea would probably embarrass her. So I lived in the moment and gave myself over to the dance, thankful for yet another wonder at the end of an already unforgettable week. That was the most touching thing I've ever seen, Emily said to me as we walked to the car. I took some photos with my phone. I'll text them to you later. It was pretty special, I agreed, still drifting on the melody of the song. I'm just glad Bodie didn't try to cut in. That wouldn't happen. I asked him to dance, but he said no. Then he told me he found a snail and he wanted me to pick it up. Little boys and little girls are certainly different, aren't they? You get sugar and spice and everything nice, she said, referring to the nursery rhyme. Meanwhile, I get the snail. No puppy dog tails, though. That's only because he couldn't find one. I laughed. I'll bet the kids are starving. I'm starving, too. The real question is whether we let them pick where we eat or whether we get to pick. Just a warning that if we don't find something quickly, Bodie might start getting cranky. And once that happens, you don't want to be anywhere in the vicinity. So, Chick-fil-A? Bingo, she said. Needless to say, the kids were thrilled. London was still wired when we finally got home, but her energy level started to crash by the time she was in her pajamas. I called Vivian and let London FaceTime with her for a few minutes. Afterward, I decided to read two by two. As I finished, I remembered that Emily had promised to text the photographs of the two of us dancing. Pulling out my phone, I saw that she had, and quickly scrolled through them with London. Don't we look good? London took the phone from me and stared at the photos. You can't see my face because my hair is in the way. That's because you were looking at my feet, I said. 
That's okay. I was looking at my feet, too. She continued to scrutinize the images. As she did, I remembered the photos I'd removed from the house and made a mental note to print one of these and have it framed. London handed the phone back to me. What are we going to do tomorrow? There's art class, of course. And after that, we're going to see Nana and Papa. Is there anything else you want to do? I don't know. You could help me clean the hamster cage. No, thanks. It's kind of icky. Right. Smelly, too, I thought. Let's see what you're in the mood to do when you wake up tomorrow, I said, tucking the covers around her. I kissed her goodnight and went back downstairs. I turned on the TV, but the photos that Emily had taken seemed to call to me. I pulled out my phone again and lingered over the images with a smile on my face, more grateful than ever to be the father to such an amazing little girl. Emily waved as soon as I walked into art class with London the following morning. London ran over to hug her, then went to chase down Bodie. That was fun last night, she said. I think we're a good team when it comes to keeping the kids entertained. Agreed, I said, reflecting that I'd been happily entertained as well. And thanks for the photos. I'm probably going to get one or two framed. Even with just an iPhone, you clearly have an artist's eye. Maybe, or maybe I just sent you the best of the hundred or so I shot, she said with a mischievous smile. She jerked a thumb in the direction of the strip mall. You want to grab a cup of coffee while the kids are occupied? I can't think of anything I'd rather do, I said, holding open the door for her. And I meant it. It's the cancer, my mom insisted. I just know he has the cancer. Standing in the kitchen, my mom was reprising her usual worries in particularly urgent tones. We'd barely walked in the door after our class when she pulled me aside for a hushed conference. Was he having trouble breathing again? No, she said. But I had the dream about the hospital again last night. Only this time there was no purple pig. And this time the doctor was a woman. She was talking about the cancer. Did you ever think it might just be a dream? Do you have the same dreams twice? I have no idea. I don't remember most of my dreams. But I wouldn't read too much into it unless you've actually noticed something amiss with Dad. She looked at me with a mournful expression. The cancer sometimes doesn't show many symptoms until it's too late. So you're saying that because he feels fine, he might be sick? She crossed her arms. Explain to me why I dreamed it twice. I sighed. Do you want me to talk to Dad again? No, she said. But I do want you to keep an eye on him, and if you see something, I'll need your help getting him to the doctor. I'm not sure I'd even know what to look for, I protested. You'll know it when you see it. Did Mom waylay you about the cancer? Marge asked pouring herself a glass of sweet tea from the pitcher on the table. I'd just joined her and Liz on the back porch after sending London off to help my mom in the kitchen. As usual, my dad was in the garage, probably lifting an engine out with his bare hands. Oh yeah, I said, holding out a glass of my own for Marge to fill. It's been a few months since she last brought it up, so I guess I should have expected it. I rubbed a hand over my face. I hope I never get like that. Like what? living in fear all the time. She has good reason, Marge said. The cancer knocked off her entire side of the family. Don't you ever worry about it? I don't think I've ever had time to worry about it. I think about it, Marge said. I don't worry, but it does cross my mind from time to time. But I have the sense that if Dad ever starts to develop cancer, the healthy cells will strut over, tap the bad cells on their shoulders, and then proceed to beat the crap out of them. The afternoon sun played across Marge's amused expression, throwing her cheekbones into sharp relief. Hey, you're looking good, by the way, I remarked. You've lost some weight. Thanks for finally noticing, she said, preening a little bit. You didn't say anything yesterday. I'm paying attention now. Are you on a diet? Of course, I'm going on vacation, meaning I'll be hitting the beach and a gal's got to look her best. Besides, with all that running, you were starting to look better than me and I just couldn't have that. I rolled my eyes and turned to Liz. And how are you doing, Liz? Marge said you're drowning at work. Yeah, I've been covering for another therapist who's been on leave. Lately, I spend most of my free time fantasizing about our getaway to Costa Rica. I've even been trying out some Latin American recipes, but Marge won't eat any of it because of the carbs. I keep reminding her that people in Costa Rica aren't as overweight as they are here in the U.S., but to no avail. I know my body, Marge countered. And it helped that I was sick, since my appetite was non-existent. 
On a more interesting note, though, did you see the fair Emily today at art class? I pointedly turned to Liz. Do you know what I like about you? What's that? You don't seem to feel the need to pry into my personal life every time we talk. She doesn't have to pry, Marge said. As a general rule, you blurt out everything you're thinking or feeling without prompting. Marge probably had a point, but still. I sighed. I not only saw her today, but we also went to the aquarium last night. With the kids. We're friends, that's all. And you probably haven't even noticed how pretty she is either. Liz laughed. Whatever the reason, I'm happy for you, Russ. You seem to be in a much better place these days. I am, I said, surprising myself. I really am. After Vivian FaceTimed with London, I asked her to call me back to discuss London's upcoming birthday party. When she did, her tone was markedly icier than it had been over the previous weekend. I've already made all the arrangements, she said. I've rented one of those bouncy houses to set up in the backyard. I've set up the catering and I've ordered a Barbie birthday cake. I sent out email invitations as well. Um, okay, I said, caught off guard by her chilly demeanor. Can you tell me what time the party's going to start? Two. Nothing else. She seemed to be trying to make me feel purposely uncomfortable. All right, I said slowly. I assume you sent my parents and Marge and Liz an evite, but I'll confirm with them just in case. When she didn't answer, I went on. And you're still planning to stay in the guest room, right? Yes, Russ, I'm staying in the guest room. We've already talked about this. Just making sure. I said before she abruptly ended the call. I let out a long, slow breath. Despite the truce of the previous weekend, it seemed that all bets were off again. Chapter 22 The Eye of the Storm As a kid, I always loved thunderstorms. Marge thought I was a kook, but when thunderstorms approached, I would feel an electric sense of anticipation akin to what my dad felt before the World Series. I would insist on turning out all the lights and would move the armchairs closer to the big picture window in the living room. Sometimes I would even toss a bag of popcorn into the microwave, and together Marge and I would snack while we watched the show. In the darkness we would sit riveted as lightning split the sky in two or flickered in the clouds like strobe lights. During the best storms, the strikes would be close enough for us to feel the static electricity and I would notice Marge gripping the armrest of her chair. Always, though, we would count how many seconds passed between a flash of lightning and the thunder, tracking the progress of the storm as the center drew near. In the south, thunderstorms don't usually last very long. Typically, they would pass in 30 or 40 minutes, and when the last rumble of thunder faded away, we would reluctantly rise from our chairs and turn on the lights, going back to whatever it was we'd been doing before. Hurricanes were a different story, however. My ever-cautious dad always boarded up the big-picture window, so we couldn't watch the full extent of the spectacle. But I remained fascinated by the apocalyptic winds and torrential rain, and especially the approach of the eye. That surreal moment when the winds abated entirely and it was sometimes even possible to see blue skies overhead. But the calm is only temporary, for the back half of the hurricane still lies in wait, and with it, sometimes even greater destruction. Which, I wonder, is more analogous to life, or rather, to my life that terrible year? Was it a series of violent storms bursting in quick succession? Or was it a single, massive hurricane, with an eye that lulled me into believing I'd survived intact, when, in fact, the worst was yet to come? I don't know. All I know for certain is that I hope never to experience another year like it for as long as I live. London loved her birthday party. The bouncy castle was a hit, she clapped with delight when she saw the cake, and she had fun playing with her friends, especially Bodie. Emily brought him by, but didn't stay, claiming that she needed to meet with the gallery owner to finalize some things for her upcoming show. Another one of the kids' parents had already promised to bring Bodie home. She apologized for not sticking around, but I think we were both eager to avoid any awkwardness with Vivian. Earlier that morning, while Vivian was ferrying London around, she'd driven the SUV from Atlanta. I made a trip to the pet store and set up the aquarium in her room. 
I chose several colorful fish and stuck a bow on the glass. When Vivian and London returned from art class, I had London close her eyes as I led her to the threshold of her room. She squealed when she opened them and catapulted across the room toward the aquarium. Can I feed them? Of course, I said. I'm sure they're hungry. Let me show you how much food to give them, okay? I tapped some food into the lid of the plastic container and handed it to her. She poured it into the fish tank, mesmerized as the fish raced to the surface and started devouring the food. When I glanced over my shoulder at Vivian, I saw that she had her arms crossed, her mouth a tight crease. At the party, however, Vivian was all smiles with everyone, including me and my entire family. She asked my mom to pitch in when she cut the cake, and when London opened a box filled with Barbie accessories from Marge and Liz, she urged London to go over and give them a hug, which London did. Marge leaned in afterward, muttering under her breath. She's acting as though nothing has changed between the two of you at all. Which upon reflection made me even more nervous than Vivian's earlier chilly demeanor. After the party, Vivian took London to the mall. With Halloween coming up, she took it upon herself to help London choose a costume. I used that time to clean up the house, filling garbage bags with paper plates and cups, and wrapping a tray of leftovers to put in the fridge. With that completed, I decided it might be best to make myself scarce for the rest of the evening, and left for my office. I worked into the evening, focusing on the presentations for the law firms that had contacted me. As London's bedtime approached, I texted Vivian, asking if it was time to read to London, only to receive a terse response a while later that London was already asleep. I stayed late at the office that night, but rose early on Sunday to go for a run and shower. I was having breakfast and coffee when I heard Vivian moving around in the guest room upstairs. Though I lingered in the kitchen, wondering if she might want to talk about how well the party had gone, she never made an appearance. I returned to the office to finish the presentations. They were all fairly similar, aware that the truce between Vivian and me had ended, but unclear as to the reason. Was she jealous that London had loved the aquarium? Something I'd selected without Vivian's input? But then Vivian had been cool toward me for nearly a week, I reasoned. I texted Vivian as soon as I got to the office, asking what time she'd planned to leave. She didn't respond until nearly five, informing me that she'd be leaving in half an hour and forcing me to scramble to get home in time. When I arrived, London came running and jumped in my arms. I fed my fish, Daddy, and they were so hungry, and I let Mr. and Mrs. Sprinkle see them, too. I held them right next to the glass. Have you given them names yet? She nodded. They're all so pretty, so I knew what their names should be. Let me show you. She pulled me up the steps to her room and pointed out the various fish, reciting their names. Cinderella, Jasmine, Ariel, Belle, Mulan, and Dory, because that's who they remind me of. Downstairs, Vivian was already waiting by the door. She hugged and kissed London goodbye. Then she half turned in my direction, uttered a perfunctory, bye, without making eye contact and walked out the door. I should have simply let her go. Instead, after a beat, I followed her out. By then, she was already opening the door to the SUV. Vivian, hold up. She turned, her expression stony as I approached. Are you okay? I'm fine, Russ, she answered, sounding anything but. You seem angry. Are you seriously asking me this? Vivian whipped off her sunglasses. Of course I'm angry and disappointed. Why? What did I do? Do you really want to get into this now? She glared at me over the open car door. I just want to know what's going on. She closed her eyes as though stealing herself, and when they opened again I could see rage flaring behind them. Why are you dragging London along when you go out with your girlfriend? Her question caught me so off guard it took me a second to comprehend what she was talking about. You mean Emily? Of course I mean Emily. She's not my girlfriend, I sputtered. London and Bodie are friends. So the two of you take them to the zoo? And the aquarium? Like some kind of double date? She spat out. Do you know how confusing that is for her? Why would you do such a thing? I'm not trying to confuse her. Do you know what London did yesterday? When we went to art class? She ran up and hugged Emily. In front of everyone. London hugs everyone. She hugged her, Vivian shouted, her cheeks flushed. I thought you were smarter than that. I thought you were better than that. You don't see me insisting that London hang out with Walter and me, do you? 
I haven't even told London about Walter. She doesn't even know he exists. I haven't even told her that we're getting divorced. Vivian, don't, she snapped. I don't want to hear you try to justify why the four of you have been gallivanting around town like you're a family now. You sure didn't wait long, did you? Emily's just a friend, I protested. Are you honestly going to stand here and try to convince me that you see Emily just because London and Bodie are friends? She said, sneering. Tell me this. Are you hanging out with the parents of London's other friends, too? No, but... And you don't think about her? You don't call her? You're not turning to her for support? I couldn't deny it, and my expression must have given me away. I've been trying my best to keep London out of this, she went on. While you, you don't seem to have given any thought as to what might be best for London, or what she might be thinking or feeling. You're just thinking about yourself and what you want. Same old story. You haven't changed at all, have you, Russ? With that, Vivian got into the SUV and slammed the door. She backed out and roared away while I stood there, frozen and reeling inside. I couldn't sleep that night. Was Vivian right? Had I only been thinking about myself? I replayed all the times I'd seen Emily. I retraced the steps that had led us to the zoo and the aquarium. And I asked myself, if London had a different best friend, would I have visited those places with that friend's parents? In my heart, I knew the answer was no, which made me wonder how much I'd been lying to myself. I felt the repercussions of Vivian's anger a few days later, while sitting in Taglieri's office. He'd called me because he had an update on the divorce negotiations. I was finally able to spend time on the phone with Vivian's attorney, he said, going through the proposed agreement section by section. He sighed. I don't know what's going on between you and Vivian, but I was anticipating a little give and take, as is the norm in these kinds of negotiations. What I didn't expect was for her to escalate her demands. She wants more? I felt a numbness spreading through me at his words. Yep. Of what? Everything. More alimony, more money when it comes to dividing joint property. How much exactly? When he told me, I blanched. What if I don't have it? Well, for starters, I'd put the house up for sale. While I'd been dreading Vivian's next move, I felt as if I'd been sucker punched. She also said to tell you that Vivian will be here for Halloween weekend and that she would prefer if you didn't stay in the house this time. Why didn't Vivian just tell me that herself? Because Vivian has decided that henceforth she wants all communications to go through the attorneys. She doesn't want to speak with you directly. Anything else? I said in a daze. She also wants to bring London to Atlanta the weekend of November 13th. And if I say no, she'll probably go straight to the court. And Russ? Taglieri eyed me seriously. This isn't something worth fighting about because you won't win. Unless she's an unfit mother, she has the right to see a daughter. I wouldn't have fought it. I'm just blown away. Do you want to talk about what it is that set her off? Not really, I said. What was the point? What's she saying about London? For now, she wants to have her every other weekend. In the future, though, she's insisting on sole custody. That's not going to happen which is yet another reason to put your house up for sale. Even though I've slashed my rates for you, fighting her is going to make this an expensive proposition. On the work front, at least, things were improving. In the week following London's birthday party up until the end of the month, I landed four out of the five legal firms as new clients. Though it meant I was suddenly drowning in work, as were my tech guys and the camera crew, my work with Taglieri had vastly shortened my learning curve. Meanwhile, the plastic surgeon's campaign kicked off while Marge and Liz were in Costa Rica, and he was thrilled with the results he was seeing. As for London and me, we'd settled into a steady rhythm. The stitches in her forehead came out, and when a follow-up x-ray confirmed there were no broken bones, the splint eventually came off too. She wasn't ready for her piano lessons yet, but she managed fine in art class. Our next date night, I took her out to a fancy dinner at a place called Fahrenheit, which offered glittering Charlotte city views and elegant handwritten menus, the kind of place that Vivian would have loved. As Halloween approached, I didn't see much of Emily. For better or for worse, Vivian's comments had gotten to me. While I had tried to convince myself that our relationship was platonic, I knew it was more than just a friendship. I was definitely attracted to her, 
and in the evenings I would find myself staring at the phone and wondering if I was somehow damaging London by wanting to reach out to Emily. Don't get me wrong, I still called Emily almost every night, unwilling or unable to give up that comforting ritual. But in the back of my mind I could hear Vivian's voice, and I sometimes hung up feeling confused and guilty. I knew I wasn't ready for a relationship, but was I acting as if I were by calling so frequently? And what did I really want in the long run when it came to Emily? Could I be content to simply remain friends? Would I be happy for her if she started dating someone else? Or would I feel a twinge at the thought of what might have been, maybe even succumb to jealousy? Deep down, I knew the answer. Aside from Marge, I considered Emily to be my closest friend, and yet I hadn't told her what Vivian had said. Why couldn't I be honest with her about the conflict roiling within me? Perhaps a part of me felt that I'd been lying to Emily all along about my intentions. I wanted more than friendship. Not now, but down the road. And as selfish as it may seem, I didn't want to risk losing her before that, which left me even more conflicted about what exactly I should do. The day before Halloween, I made arrangements to check into a hotel. Marge and Liz had arrived home from Costa Rica late Wednesday night, and I didn't feel good about hitting them up for a place to stay. Nor did I want to stay with my parents. Though I knew they wouldn't have minded, I didn't want them to know about my further deteriorating relationship with Vivian. At London's birthday party, Vivian's cheerful facade had led my mom to pull me aside and try to convince me that Vivian still had feelings for me. That was a conversation I didn't want to face again. Taglieri texted that Vivian would be arriving early on Friday night, probably around 7, which meant there would be no date night with London. Instead, London and I ate at home. Afterwards, she ran up the stairs to check on the hamsters and her fish while I started to clean the kitchen. I heard Vivian push through the door 20 minutes later. Hello, she sang out. I'm here. My heart started to race as if I'd been caught doing something I shouldn't, simply by being in my own house. Meanwhile, Vivian breezed in like she was the one who still lived here. Vivian poked her head into the kitchen, looking for London. She's in her bedroom, I said. She ran up there to check on her critters. Okay, she said, nodding. Did she eat? I thought you told your attorney that we weren't supposed to communicate directly. But okay, I'll play along. Yeah, she's had dinner. No bath yet. I didn't know if you were going to take her to a movie or... I haven't decided yet. I'll talk to her. She paused. You doing okay? Yeah, I said, thrown once again by her casual demeanor. I'm fine. You looking forward to trick-or-treating? It'll be fun. I picked up an amazing costume for London. It's Belle from Beauty and the Beast, but extra glittery. She'll love that, I agreed. She named one of her fish Belle. Make sure you come by in time to see it. You want me to come by? She rolled her eyes, but in them I saw only disbelief not anger, as though I were merely clueless rather than hateful. Of course, Russ, she's your daughter. It's Halloween. And besides, you need to be here to hand out candy for the kids who come by the house. What did you think was going on tomorrow night? As usual, Vivian had managed to keep me guessing. I hadn't seen Marge and Liz since London's birthday party, so I swung by my parents the next afternoon before the trick-or-treating got underway. I noticed right off that Marge had slimmed down even more. She looked fantastic, but it was on the tip of my tongue to tell her not to lose much more weight, as it might make her face look too severe. Liz, too, looked like she'd shed some pounds, though not as much. Marge and Liz enveloped me in hugs as soon as I stepped through the door. So this is what you look like after a vacation, huh? I said to Marge, giving a low whistle. I know, pretty fab, huh? I weigh as much as I did in college now. You look great, too, Liz. Are you sure the two of you weren't secretly at Canyon Ranch the whole time? Thank you, but no, she said. It was all just good old-fashioned hiking and sightseeing, and like Marge, I kept my servings of rice and beans to a minimum. I'm jealous. I've stopped losing weight, even though I'm still running. How are things? Marge asked. When I talked to Mom last night, she said you landed some new clients. Let's go out back and talk for a while. All right. Let me say hi to Mom and Dad, and I'll meet you outside in a few. Visiting with my parents took 15 minutes. Mom didn't bring up the cancer, thank goodness, and I found my sister and Liz on the back patio, both of them drinking tall glasses of sweet tea. 
For the next hour, we talked about their trip, the zip lines, arenal volcanoes, hikes through the cloud forest and near the coast, and I caught them up on all that had been going on in my world. Just as that part of the conversation was coming to a close, my mom popped her head out and asked Liz if she'd mind giving her a hand in the kitchen. So, you were told you had to communicate through attorneys, but then she showed up at the house and acted as if everything were normal? I nodded. Don't ask me to explain it. I'm just thanking God for small favors. What I still don't understand is why Vivian got London for both her birthday and on Halloween. You should get London for some of the fun things, too. It's just the way the weekends are falling. Marge didn't seem satisfied with this explanation, but apparently decided to let it drop. How do you feel about selling the house? I guess I'm torn. We don't need a place that big. To be honest, we never really did. But at the same time, there are a lot of memories there. Anyway, I don't have much of a choice. Even though my business is finally taking off, it's not like I'll have enough in the bank to pay Vivian off when we sign the papers. I paused. It's hard for me to believe it's been almost two months since she walked out the door. In some ways, it seems like yesterday. In other ways, it feels like forever. I can't imagine, Marge said. She turned her head and covered her mouth, coughing from somewhere deep in her chest. You're still sick? No, she answered. This is just a remnant from the bronchitis. Apparently it can take the lungs months to heal, even when the inflammation is gone. I felt pretty good in Costa Rica, but right now I need a vacation from my vacation. Liz kept us on the go the whole time. I'm still wiped out. And my knees are killing me from all the hiking. Hiking is good exercise, but it's rough on the joints, I conceded. Speaking of which, let me know if you and Emily ever want to go hiking with Liz and me. It'll be like old times. I will, I said. At my answer, Marge tilted her head. Uh-oh, I'm sensing there's trouble in paradise. Is there anything you're not telling me? Not really, I hedged. I just don't know where the relationship is going. Marge scrutinized me. Why can't you just be happy with what you have with her right now? Because it seems to me like she's been a rock to you these past couple of months. She has. Then just appreciate her for that and let it be what it's going to be. I hesitated. Vivian thinks that hanging out with Emily and the kids is confusing to London. And she's right. Marge made a skeptical face. But in the end, she folded her hands on the table and leaned toward me. So don't bring London in Bodhi, she said pointedly. Why don't you just try going out with her? Like on a date? Yes, Marge said. Like a date. What about London? Liz and I would be more than happy to babysit. And besides, didn't you just say that London was going to be in Atlanta in a couple of weeks? Seize the day, little brother. On Halloween night, Vivian was unusually warm, even insisting that she take a photo of me with London on her phone, which she then texted to me right away. I handed out candy to the neighborhood kids. There were so many coming by the house, I sat in the rocking chair on the front porch so I wouldn't have to keep getting up from the couch. The next morning, I woke to a text from Vivian that said she'd be leaving around six, and could I try to be home by then? On the way out the door that evening, she pulled me into a hug and whispered to me that I was doing a great job with London. The first couple of weeks of November blurred together in a string of 18-hour days, marked by the routines that had become second nature. I exercised, worked, took care of London, who started back with piano lessons, cooked, cleaned, and made nightly calls to Emily. Thanks to my new clients, I was so busy that I didn't even have time to swing by my parents the following weekend, nor visit with Marge and Liz even once. A few things from that period do stand out in my memory, however. The week after Halloween, I had a realtor come by so I could put the house up for sale. She walked through and asked a lot of questions. Toward the end, she suggested that I rearrange the furniture to show the rooms to better effect. One by one, at her suggestion, the pieces ended up back where Vivian had originally placed them. Before she left, she retrieved a mallet from her car and pounded a bright red realty sign into the yard out front. The sight of the sign made something sink inside me, and out of instinct, I called Emily. As usual, she brought me back onto solid ground, even encouraging me with the prospect of turning to a fresh page in my life, in a new home. Maybe it was the prospect of Vivian taking London to Atlanta for the weekend. But as the conversation was winding down, I found myself thinking about Marge's suggestion that I ask Emily out. 
Before I could gather my courage, however, Emily spoke up. Russ, I've been meaning to ask you, would you like to accompany me to the opening of the art show I told you about? The one that's going to include a few of my paintings? She sounded a bit nervous, and I could almost picture her smoothing her hair behind her ear, the way she always did when she was anxious. I mean, it's fine if you can't, but since the opening is the weekend when London's going to be in Atlanta, I thought... I'd love to, I interrupted. I'm so glad you asked. As the weekend of November 13th approached, I helped London prepare for her trip to Atlanta, which took more time than I thought it would. London was excited at the idea of visiting Vivian in her new apartment, and packed and repacked her suitcase four or five times. She fretted for days over what to bring ultimately packing several different outfits, in addition to Barbies, coloring books, crayons, and the book Two by Two. Vivian had texted that she would pick London up at five, which I interpreted to mean she'd drive both ways. Of course, I'd forgotten about Spannerman's private jet, but I was reminded of that as soon as the limousine pulled to a stop in front of the house. I carried London's bag to the car and handed it to the driver. By then, London had crawled into the limousine and was already exploring the plush interior. It hurt to see her leaving, even if she was with her mom. I'll have her back here Sunday about seven, Vivian said. And of course you can call any time and I'll put her on the phone. I'll try not to be a nuisance about it. You're her father, Vivian said. You're not a nuisance. She looked away before continuing. And just so you know, she's not going to meet Walter this weekend. It's too soon for him to meet her. I wouldn't do that to her. I nodded surprised, and yes, undeniably grateful. Do you have any big plans? I asked, somehow eager to prolong their departure. There are a lot of things to do there. I think we'll play it by ear, but I should probably be going. I don't want it to be too late when we get to the apartment. This time, there was no hug. As she turned away, however, her eyes caught the sight of the realty sign, and she paused. Then, with a resolute flick of her hair over her shoulder, she moved to the open door and the driver closed it behind her. I watched the limo pull away, feeling strangely bereft. Despite everything that had happened at this point, there always seemed to be another way to remind me that I'd lost the future I'd once imagined. I don't know why the thought of attending Emily's gallery opening made me nervous. Emily and I had coffee together practically every weekend. We talked on the phone most nights and I'd spent an evening drinking wine on our back patio. We'd spent whole days on expeditions with the kids. Moreover, we would be attending an event at which her work, not mine, would be on display. So if anyone should be nervous, it stood to reason it should be her. Even so, my heart was beating faster than usual, and my mouth had gone slightly dry when Emily answered the knock at her front door. One look at her framed in the doorway didn't help. I wasn't sure how artists were supposed to look at their openings, but gone was any trace of the easygoing mom with whom I was so familiar. In her place stood a ravishing woman in a strappy black cocktail dress, her hair tumbling in a glossy waterfall past her shoulders. I noticed she was wearing just enough makeup to make it seem she was wearing none at all. You're right on time, she said, leaning in for a quick hug. And don't you look sharp? I'd gone with what Vivian referred to as a Hollywood look. Black blazer, black slacks, and a black v-neck sweater. I wasn't sure what I was supposed to wear. I admitted, still feeling the imprint of her brief hug. Let me just make sure the babysitter has everything she needs. Then we can go, okay? I watched as she climbed the stairs and heard her speaking to the babysitter. At the top of the stairs, she hugged and kissed Bodhi before returning to the foyer. Shall we? Absolutely, I said, certain that she was one of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen. But only on one condition. What's that? You have to give me some pointers on gallery opening etiquette. She laughed the carefree sound loosening the knot of tension in my diaphragm. We'll talk on the way, she said, moving toward the foyer closet and grabbing a cashmere wrap. But let's scoot out of here before Bodhi realizes he forgot something critical, and it takes another twenty minutes before we can escape. I opened the front door and watched as she led the way, noting how the dress hugged her figure just right. My eyes drifted lower until I flashed on the memory of the night she'd helped me with my bow tie, which made me flush and lift my gaze. I backed the car onto the street and steered it in the direction of downtown, where the gallery was located. So is this show a big deal for you? I asked. I know you've been working like crazy to get all the paintings ready. It's not a major exhibit at MoMA or anything like that, 
but the owner of the gallery does a nice job. He's been in business for a long time, so once a year he invites his best customers to a private showing. A few of them are prominent regional collectors. Usually there are six or seven artists, but this year, I think he said he's showcasing the work of nine artists. Two sculptors, a glass artist, an artist who works in ceramics, and five painters. And you're one of them. I'm one of the painters every year. How many does he represent? Thirty, maybe? See? And you're so humble I never would have known. I'm humble because my paintings don't sell for much money. It's not like anything I've done will ever see the inside of Sotheby's or Christie's. Of course, most of the artists whose work sells for a gazillion dollars are dead. That doesn't seem fair. You're preaching to the choir, she teased. And what role do you play at the opening? Well, it's kind of like a mixer, and I'm one of several hosts. There will be wine and appetizers, and I'll hang around in the general vicinity of my work, in case any of the guests have questions or want to talk to me. What if they want to buy a piece? Then the guests will talk to the gallery owner. It's not really my place to discuss what a painting is worth. As much as I was joking about the big bucks, I don't like to think of art in terms of money. People should buy a piece because they love it, because it speaks to them. Or because it looks good hanging on the wall? Or that, she said, smiling. I'm excited to see what you've done. I'm sorry I didn't make it to the gallery before now. Russ, you're a busy single dad, she said, giving my arm a reassuring squeeze. I'm just glad you agreed to come with me tonight. It'll give me someone to talk to when no one is looking at my work. It's a little dispiriting to stand next to your work and watch people ignore it or avert their gaze so you won't try to talk to them. Has that ever happened to you? Every time, she said. Not everyone who shows up will like my work. Art is subjective. I like your work. What I've seen on your walls, I mean. She laughed. That's because you like me. I looked over at her. True enough. By the time we reached the gallery, any trace of nervousness had passed. As ever, Emily made being around her easy because she was so clearly comfortable with me. I had forgotten how liberating that feeling of acceptance was, and when we paused at the door, I found myself staring at her and wondering how different my life would have been had I married her rather than Vivian. Emily caught me staring and tilted her head. What are you thinking about? I hesitated. I was thinking how glad I am that London and Bodie are friends. She squinted at me, a skeptical gleam in her eye. I'm not sure you were thinking about the kids just then. No? No, she said with a knowing smile. I'm pretty sure you were thinking about me. It must be a wonderful thing to be able to read minds. It is, she said. And for my next trick, watch this. I'm going to enter the gallery without even touching the door. How are you going to do that? She feigned disappointment. You're not even going to open the door for me? I thought you were a gentleman. I laughed and pulled open the door for her. The interior of the building was brightly lit, with the look of an industrial loft. A large, open space with several groups of wall partitions that rose partway to the ceiling. Paintings were mounted on the partitions, and I could see about twenty people clustered among the artwork, most holding glasses of wine or champagne flutes. Waiters and waitresses circulated, bearing silver trays of appetizers. Lead the way, I said. You're the star tonight. Emily scanned the room and we started toward a patrician-looking gray-haired gentleman. This turned out to be Claude Barnes, the owner of the gallery. With him were two couples, both of whom had driven in from other cities to attend the show. I snagged a couple of glasses of wine from a passing waiter and handed one to Emily while we engaged in small talk. I saw Emily point toward a set of partitions in the rear of the gallery, and after the conversation came to an end, we ambled over. I took a few minutes to examine her paintings, thinking to myself that they were not only arrestingly beautiful, but mysterious. While the paintings I'd seen in her home had been abstract, in these I saw more realistic elements. The colors practically exploded off the canvas and were coupled with stark brushwork. One painting in particular continued to draw my eye. These are spectacular, I said, meaning it. I can't imagine how much work they required. Which is the one that was giving you fits? This one, she said, pointing to the one that had caught my eye. I studied it up close, then took a few steps back, examining it from various angles. It's perfect, I said. I still don't think it's done, she said, shaking her head, but thank you. I mean it, I said. I want to buy it. Oh, okay, 
she said, at once doubtful and flattered. Are you sure? You don't even know how much it costs. I want to buy it, I repeated. Really? When she saw I was sincere, she actually blushed. Wow, I'm honored, Russ. I'll see if I can get Claude to give you the friends and family discount. I took a sip of my wine. Now what? We wait and see if anyone comes by, she winked. And if they do, let me do the talking, okay? I don't want to be a modern-day Margaret Keene. Who? Margaret Keene was an artist whose husband took credit for her work for years. They made her life story into a movie called Big Eyes. You should see it. Why don't we watch it together one evening? Deal. As the gallery continued to fill, I listened to Emily explain her work to interested patrons. My role, if I had one, was to take photographs using people's phones. It seemed like practically everyone who came by wanted a picture with Emily, presumably because she was the artist, but after a while I noticed that none of the other artists seemed nearly as popular. While Emily was chatting with various guests, I wandered among the exhibits of the other artists. A few of the sculptures caught my attention, but they were so large and abstract. I couldn't imagine how they could possibly look good in someone's home. I also liked the work of some of the other painters, though in my opinion Emily's work was better. Emily and I nibbled steadily on appetizers as the crowds ebbed and flowed. The flow of visitors reached its peak around 8 p.m. and then began to dwindle. While the show was supposed to be over at 9 p.m., Claude didn't lock the doors until the last guest left at 9.45 p.m. I think that went well, he said as he approached. A number of the guests expressed interest in your work. It wouldn't surprise me if you sold out in the next few days. Emily turned to me. Are you sure you still want to buy that painting? I do, I said, conscious that it was a luxury I could ill afford right now. But somehow I didn't care. Claude frowned slightly, aware, no doubt, that a steep discount request would be coming. The frown vanished as quickly as it had come. Are there any other pieces you're interested in from the other artists? No. I said, just the one. Can we talk about this tomorrow, Claude? Emily asked. It's getting a little late and I'm too tired to talk business. Of course, he said. Thank you for everything you did tonight, Emily, he said. You're always so good at these things. Your personality endears you to others. Standing close to Emily, I knew that Claude was right. What would you like to do now? I asked on the way to the car. If you're tired, I can bring you home. Are you kidding? She asked. I've got a babysitter, and I said I wouldn't be home until midnight. I only told Claude that I was tired so we could get out of there. Once Claude starts talking, it's sometimes hard to get him to stop. I love the guy, but I only have a babysitter once in a blue moon, and I'm going to take advantage of it. Do you feel like having dinner? We might be able to find something that's still open. I'm stuffed, she said. But how about a cocktail? Do you have a favorite watering hole? Russ, I'm the mother of a five-year-old. I don't get out much. But I've heard that Fahrenheit has stunning views and fire pits. And since it's chilly tonight, sitting by a fire sounds perfect. I just took London there for a date night. Great minds think alike. Soon thereafter, we found ourselves at Fahrenheit's rooftop bar, warming ourselves before a glowing fire pit and taking in the carpet of city lights below. I ordered two glasses of wine from a passing cocktail waitress. Emily sat swaddled in her cashmere wrap, Eyes half closed, her expression serene. She looked extraordinarily beautiful in the rosy glow of the firelight, and when she noticed me staring, she gave me a lazy smile. I remember that look, she said. You used to stare at me like that way back when, a million years ago. Yeah? Sometimes it gave me goosebumps. But not anymore, right? Her coy shrug told me otherwise. I know I've said that I'm glad you've come into my life. When I stopped, she raised her eyes to look at me. But? I decided to tell the truth. I'm not sure I'm ready for a relationship. For a moment, she said nothing. All right, she murmured finally, with the faintest echo of regret. I'm sorry. Why are you sorry? Because I've been calling too much. Maybe leading you to think that I was ready when I know I'm not. I'm still an emotional wreck at times. I still think about Vivian way too much. Not that I want her back, because I've realized that I don't. But she's still front and center, in a way that's not healthy. And you've been so generous, listening to me when I'm down, offering endless emotional support, and best of all, making me laugh. When I trailed off, I could feel her eyes inspecting me. 
Have I ever complained that you call too much, or that your confidences are a burden? I shook my head, feeling as if some epiphany were trying to surface in my chaotic brain, like an air bubble rising through water. No, I said, you haven't. You're describing a scenario in which you haven't offered me anything in return, but you have. The reddish tints in her dark hair glinted in the firelight as she pushed it away from her face. Leaning toward me, she said, I like hearing from you, whether you're in a good mood or not. I like knowing that I can talk to you about anything, that you'll understand because we once shared a history. I like feeling that you know the real me, faults and all. You don't have any faults, I said, not that I can see anyway. She gave a snort of disbelief. Are you kidding? No one's perfect, Ross. I like to think I've learned some lessons over the past decade, and maybe I'm more patient than I used to be, but I'm far from perfect. The waitress delivered our wine, and in the silence that followed, our thoughts seemed to take a more serious turn. Emily took a sip of wine, and when she turned toward me again, I thought I saw a flash of vulnerability cross her face. I'm sorry, I said. I know I'm probably putting a damper on the evening. Not at all, she said. It means so much that you're honest with me, Russ. I think that's what I like most about you. You're not afraid to tell me things. That you're hurting, that you're afraid of failure. That you're not ready for a relationship. You don't realize how hard it is for some people to say such things. David never could. I never knew what he was really feeling. Half the time, I don't think he even did. But with you, it's different. You're so open. I always admired that about you, and it hasn't changed. She paused, as if uncertain whether to go on. I really like you, Russ. You're good for me. That's the thing, Emily. I don't just like you. I think I'm in love with you. My words seemed to electrify her. You think? No, I said with growing certainty. I am in love with you. It feels strange to say that when I know I'm not really ready to take further steps, but that's how I feel. For a moment, I stared into the fire, trying to summon my courage. I'm not the kind of guy you should love. You can do a lot better than me. Maybe in time... Saying the words hurt more than I anticipated, and I broke off, feeling a knot forming in my throat. In the silence, Emily stared at me. Then she reached over and laid her open hand on my leg, beckoning for me to take it. I did, feeling a flood of warmth and encouragement as her fingers intertwined with my own. Did you think that I might be in love with you, too? You don't have to say that. I'm not just saying it, Russ. I know what love feels like. Maybe I've always loved you. God knows I loved you once with every fiber of my being. I don't think that kind of feeling just goes away. It leaves its mark on you. She held my gaze, her voice gentle. I'm okay with waiting until you're ready, because I like what we have now. I like that you've become one of my closest friends, and I know how much you care for me. Do you remember what I said about friendship? It's about someone who walks into your life, says I'm here for you, and then proves it. I nodded. You might not believe it, but you've been doing that for me. I don't know if I'm ready for a relationship either. What I do know is that I want you in my life, and that the thought of losing you again would break my heart. Where does that leave us then? How about we just sit by the fire, you and me, and enjoy tonight? We can be friends tonight and tomorrow and for as long as you'd like. And you keep calling and we keep talking and having coffee when the kids are at art. And like everybody in the world, we'll just take things one day at a time. I stared at her, marveling at her wisdom and how simple she made it all seem. I love you, Emily. I love you too, Russ. She gave my hand a squeeze. It's going to be fine. Trust me. Later that night, I lay awake in bed. Emily and I had lingered for another hour by the fire, letting the meaning of everything that had been said sink in. When I dropped her off at home, I felt the urge to kiss her, but was afraid of upsetting our newfound balance. Emily sensed my hesitation and simply leaned in for a hug. We held each other for a long time beneath her porch light, and the intimacy of that moment struck me as more real and more meaningful than anything else she could have done. Call me tomorrow, okay? She whispered, releasing me, but not before raising a tender hand to my face. I will. And with that, she turned and went inside. The last two weeks of November were some of the happiest in my recent memory. 
My anniversary passed without incident. Neither Vivian nor I mentioned it when she FaceTimed with London, and it wasn't until after the call had ended that I even remembered it at all. At work, I was proving to be hugely productive on behalf of my new clients. London returned from Atlanta on Sunday night, and though she'd had a good time, she slipped back into her routine without a fuss. I spoke to Emily every day and worked out a deal with Claude to buy her painting, which I then mounted in the family room. I saw Marge, Liz, and my parents the following weekend, the day after Marge and Liz had met with the fertility specialist. While we were all seated in the family room together, they told my parents about their plans. It's about time, my mom cried, jumping up to hug them both. You'll be good parents, my dad added. He sounded as gruff as always before he embraced Marge and Liz in return. With hugs from my dad as rare as solar eclipses, I knew they were touched. Through Taglieri, I learned that Vivian wanted London in Atlanta for the Thanksgiving weekend. Actually, she wanted London beginning on Wednesday evening through Sunday. I wasn't happy about that. But again, the every other weekend pattern just happened to nail every holiday. Vivian arrived on Wednesday to pick up London in the limo and whisk her off to the jet again. As I watched them pull away, I thought about how quiet the house would be without my daughter for the next four days. The house was quiet that weekend because no one, not even me, was there at all. Instead, that was the weekend when once more, my world began to collapse around me. But this time, it was even worse. How did it happen? Like it always seems to happen, seemingly without warning. But of course, in retrospect, there had been warnings all along. It was Saturday morning, November 28th, two days after Thanksgiving. I'd spent the previous evening with Emily, dining out and visiting the Charlotte Comedy Zone. Once again, I was tempted to kiss her at the end of the evening, but settled instead for another long and glorious hug, one that confirmed my desire to keep her in my life for a long, long time. My feelings for her were already displacing thoughts of Vivian in a way that I hadn't anticipated, and that I hoped would continue. I felt undeniably lighter and more positive about the future than I had in months if not years. The call came in on early Saturday morning. It wasn't yet 6 a.m. when the house phone began to ring, and the sound itself was ominous. My cell phone was on airplane mode, and no one would call the house at that hour unless something terrible had happened. I knew even before I picked up the phone that it was my mother on the other end, and I knew that she was calling to tell me that my father was in the hospital. He'd had a heart attack, or something worse. I knew she would be frantic, probably in tears. But it wasn't my mom on the other end of the line. It was Liz, calling about my sister. Marge, she told me, had been admitted to the hospital. She'd been coughing up blood for an hour. Chapter 23. No. When Marge was 11, she and my mom were involved in a car accident. Back then, my mom was still driving one of those huge wood-paneled station wagons. Because they were from a different generation, my parents weren't accustomed to wearing seatbelts, and as a family, we rarely did. Marge liked seatbelts even less than I did, whereas I simply forgot to put mine on when I hopped in the car. I was still young, remember? Marge deliberately chose not to wear them, because it allowed her more freedom to punch or pinch me whenever the mood struck, which I might add, was way too often. I wasn't in the car that day, and though I'm not sure how accurate my recollections are, it seems the accident was no fault of my mom's. She wasn't speeding, the road wasn't busy, and she was passing through an intersection while the light was green. Meanwhile, a teenager, probably fiddling with the radio or scarfing down McDonald's french fries, blew through the red light and broadside of the rear of the station wagon. While my mom was a little banged up, it was Marge whom everyone was most worried about. The momentum from the crash had thrown her into the side windows, shattering the glass. While she wasn't unconscious when she arrived at the hospital, she was bleeding and bruised and had sustained a broken collarbone. When I entered Marge's hospital room with my dad, the sight of my sister scared me. At six years old, I didn't know much about death or even hospitals. My dad stood over her bed, his expression flat, but I could tell by his posture that he was frightened, which scared me even more. Looking down at my stricken face, he frowned. Come say your sister, Russ. I don't want to, I can remember saying. I don't care what you want, he said. I told you to come here and you're going to do what I tell you. His tone brooked no argument and I inched toward the bed. 
Marge's face was grossly swollen, with deep bruises and multiple stitches, like she'd been sewn back together. She didn't look like my sister. She didn't look like anyone. She looked like a monster in a scary movie, and the sight of her caused me to burst into tears. To this day, I wish I hadn't cried. My dad thought I was crying for Marge, and I felt him lay a comforting hand on my shoulder, which made me cry even harder. But I wasn't crying for Marge. I was crying for myself because I was afraid. And over time, I came to despise myself for my reaction. Some people have courage. On that day, I learned that I wasn't one of them. The doctors didn't know what was wrong with Marge. Nurses took samples of blood and x-rayed her chest. That was followed by a CAT scan. Three different doctors came to examine her. I watched as a needle was inserted into Marge's lungs to remove tissue for further examination. Throughout it all, Marge was the only one who didn't seem worried. Part of that had to do with the fact that since she'd arrived at the hospital, her coughing had abated. She joked with the doctors and nurses while Liz and my parents looked on with grim concern, and I thought again about how effective my sister was at hiding her fears, even from those who loved her. Meanwhile, in another part of the hospital, tests were being run. I heard the doctor whispering words like pathology and radiology, biopsy, oncology. Liz was clearly worried, but not yet panicked. My parents sat like stones, barely holding it together. And I was upset because Marge didn't look good. Her skin had a grayish pallor, which accentuated her weight loss. And I found myself replaying all that I'd seen and the things she'd said over the last few months. The racking cough that never seemed to go away. The soreness in her legs. How exhausted she'd been after her vacation. My parents and I... Liz and the doctors were all thinking about the same thing. The cancer. But it couldn't be cancer. Marge couldn't be that sick. She was my sister and she was only 40 years old. A little more than a week ago, she'd gone to a specialist because she wanted to have a baby. She was looking forward to being pregnant. She had her entire life ahead of her. Marge couldn't be sick. She didn't have the cancer. No. 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 I was thankful that Vivian had taken London to Atlanta, because I don't know what I would have done with her all day. I spent hours drifting in and out of Marge's hospital room. When I couldn't take it anymore, I would pace the parking lot or have coffee in the cafeteria. I called Emily and shared what was going on. I asked her not to come by, but she came anyway. Marge and Emily had a short but sweet reunion a little before noon, and in the hallway afterward, Emily held me as I shook with fear. She told me that she wanted to see me later, if I was up to it and I promised that I'd call. Finally, I called Vivian. When I told her what was going on, she gave a strangled gasp and immediately offered to fly back with London right away. I explained that London was probably better off with her, at least through the weekend. Vivian understood. Oh, Russ, she said quietly, sounding nothing like her usual brisk self. I'm so sorry. Don't be sorry yet, I said. We don't know anything for sure. I was lying to myself, and both Vivian and I knew it. She was well aware of the history on my mother's side of the family. As I spoke again, I could hear my voice cracking. Do me a favor and don't say anything to London yet, okay? Of course not. Is there anything I can do? What do you need? Nothing for now, I said. Thanks. Words were becoming hard to form, my thoughts beginning to scatter. I'll let you know. Keep me informed, okay? I will, I promised, and I knew that I would. After all, we were still married. In the afternoon, when my parents and Liz were visiting the cafeteria, I stayed with Marge. She asked about my work, and at her insistence, I described the ad campaigns I was crafting for my clients. I think she remembered that day in the hospital so long ago, after the auto accident, and could tell how frightened I was. She knew I could speak about work on autopilot, so she kept asking questions to distract me. As had become her habit, she asked about Emily, and I finally admitted that I'd fallen in love, but wasn't ready to tell our parents yet. At that, she cracked a grin. Too late. Mom and Dad already know. How? I haven't said anything to them. You didn't have to, she said. When you called Emily on Thanksgiving, the way you felt about her was plain as day. Mom raised her eyebrows while Dad turned to me and said, Already? 
he's not even divorced yet. Despite everything, I laughed. That was my dad, all right. I didn't realize it was so obvious. Uh-huh, she said, nodding. I just wish you hadn't waited until today to bring her by. I look like hell. You should have had us meet right after Costa Rica when I was still tan. I nodded, struck by how normal Marge sounded. My bad. I'd like to meet Bodhi, too, since I've heard so much about him. I'm sure you'll have a chance. She twisted the hospital sheet, winding it tight and letting it unfurl. I've been thinking about baby names, she said. I bought one of those books, you know. At work, whenever I'm bored, I look through it. I even started highlighting some of them. Baby names? Was she really talking about baby names? I could feel pressure behind my eyes and I struggled to get the words out without my voice cracking. Any favorites? If it's a boy, I like Josiah, Elliot, Carter. If it's a girl, I like Meredith and Alexis. Of course, Liz is going to have her own ideas, but I haven't spoken to her about it yet. It's still pretty early in the process, so we have plenty of time to make a decision. Plenty of time. Marge must have heard herself because she looked first toward the clock, then the door of the room, which was propped open. Nurses hurried past, going about their duties as if today were no different than any other day. I wonder when they're going to finally let me out of here, she said. What's taking them so long? I've been here for hours already. Don't they know I have things to do? When I had no answer to that, Marge sighed. You know I'm going to be okay, right? I mean, I'm not ignoring what happened this morning, but I don't feel all that bad. I feel a lot better than I did before I left for Costa Rica, in fact. I probably just picked up some parasite while I was down there. Lord only knows what the sanitary standards are like in those kitchens. We'll see what the doctors say, I murmured. If you see them, tell them to hurry up. I'd rather not waste my whole weekend here. I will. Marge continued to wind and unwind the sheet. London comes back tomorrow, right? She does. I don't know what time exactly. Early evening, I'd guess. Why don't you bring London over for dinner with Liz and me this week? You've been so busy lately, we haven't had time for our normal sit-downs. Watching her work the sheet, I could feel my throat tightening again. Dinner sounds great, but none of that Costa Rican food. What with all the parasites, right? Yeah, she said, looking right at me. Trust me when I tell you that you don't want what I have. The day crawled by. Mid-afternoon. Late afternoon. Vivian texted, asking if there was any news. I replied that we were still waiting. Emily texted, asking how I was doing. Scared to death, I replied. As dusk approached, the sky began to cloud over. Marge's hospital room was bathed in flat gray light, and the TV was turned to Judge Judy, though on mute. The machine monitoring her vitals beeped steadily. A doctor that we hadn't met came into the room. Though his demeanor was steady, his expression was grim, and I already knew what he was going to tell us. He introduced himself as Dr. Kadam Patel, and he was an oncologist. Over his shoulder in the hallway, I watched as a young girl in a wheelchair was rolled past the room. In her arms was a stuffed animal, a purple pig. Just as my mother had dreamed. I went blank, my mind tuning out almost as soon as he began to speak. I caught various bits and pieces. Adenocarcinoma. More common in women than men. More likely to occur in younger people. Non-small cell. Slower growing than other types of lung cancer. But unfortunately, it's advanced and the CT scan shows that it has metastasized to other parts of the body, both lungs, lymph nodes, bones, and her brain. Malignant, pericardial effusion, stage four, incurable. Incurable. My mom was the first to let out a cry, the plaintive wail of a mother who knows that her child is dying. Liz followed a moment later and my dad took her in his arms. He said nothing but his lower lip trembled while he squeezed his eyes shut, as if trying to block out reality. Marge sat unmoving on the bed. Watching her, I felt as though I would topple over, but somehow I remained upright. Marge kept her gaze fixed on the doctor. How long do I have? she asked, and for the first time that day, I heard fear in her voice. It's impossible to say, Dr. Patel answered. Though it's incurable, it's treatable. 
Treatment has improved exponentially in the last 10 years. It can not only prolong life, it can alleviate some of the symptoms. How long? Marge demanded. With treatment. If we had caught it earlier, Dr. Patel hedged, before it had metastasized. But we didn't, Marge said, cutting him off. Dr. Patel stood a bit straighter. Again, there's no way to know exactly. You're young and in good condition, both of which increase life expectancy. I understand that it's not a question that you want to answer. I also understand that every patient is different, which means you can't really know for sure. What I want, though, is your best guess. Marge's voice made it clear she would not be deterred. Do you think I have a year? The doctor didn't answer, but his expression was pained. Six months? Marge pressed, and again, the doctor didn't answer. Three? Right now, Dr. Patel said, I think it would be best if we start discussing treatment options. It's critical that we get started right away. I don't want to discuss treatment, Marge said. I could hear anger in her voice. If you think I only have a few months, if you're telling me it's incurable, then what's the point? Liz had collected herself enough to wipe her eyes. She moved toward the bed and took Marge's hand. Lifting it to her mouth, she kissed it. Baby, she whispered. I want to hear what the doctor says about treatment options, okay? I know you're afraid, but I need to know. Can you listen? For me? For the first time, Marge turned from the doctor. The trail of her tear had left a streak on her cheek that the light caught, making it shine. Okay, Marge whispered, and only then did Marge begin to cry. Systemic Chemotherapy Over the next 40 minutes, the doctor patiently explained to us his reasoning for the course of treatment he was recommending. Because the cancer was so advanced, because it had spread throughout Marge's body and reached her brain, there were no real surgical options. Radiation was a possibility, but again, because of the spread, the benefits weren't worth the costs. Usually, patients were given more time to consider all the pros and cons of chemotherapy, including side effects, and he went over those in detail. But again, because the cancer was so advanced, the doctor strongly recommended that Marge start immediately. To do that, Marge would need a catheter. When that part was underway, my parents and I left the room to go to the cafeteria. We didn't speak. Instead, we sat in silence, each of us simply trying to process what was happening. I ordered coffee that I didn't drink, thinking that chemotherapy is essentially poison, and the hope is that the cancer cells are killed before normal cells. Too much poison and the patient dies. Too little poison, and the medicine does no good at all. My sister had already known all this. My parents and I had known all this as well. We had grown up knowing about the cancer. All of us knew about stages and survival rates and possible remission and catheters and side effects. The cancer, after all, spread not only through human bodies. Sometimes it spread through families, like mine. Later I returned to the room and I took a seat in the chair, watching as the poison was administered, killing as it flowed through her system. I left the hospital when the sky had turned black and I walked my parents to their car. To me, it seemed like they were shuffling rather than walking, and for the first time, they seemed old, beaten down and utterly wrung out. I knew because I was feeling the same way. Liz had asked us if she could be alone with Marge. As soon as she asked, I felt guilty. Lost in my own feelings about Marge, it didn't occur to me that the two of them needed time together without an audience. After watching my parents pull out of the parking lot, I walked slowly to my car. I knew I couldn't stay at the hospital, but I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to go anywhere. What I wanted was to be able to rewind, to return to yesterday. 24 hours earlier, I had been having dinner with Emily and looking forward to an evening of laughter. The stand-ups at the Comedy Zone were good, and although one of the routines had been a bit too profane for my taste, the second comedian was both married and a father, and the humorous stories he related had the sweet ring of familiarity. At one point I reached for Emily's hand and when I felt her fingers intertwine with my own, I felt as though I'd come home. This, I remember thinking, is what life is really about. Love and laughter and friendship, happy times spent with those you care about. As I drove home, yesterday seemed impossibly distant, a different lifetime altogether. 
The axis of my world had shifted, and like my parents, I'd aged in the last few hours. I'd been hollowed out. And as I squinted through eyes that had gone blurry with tears, I wondered if I would ever feel whole again. Emily texted to ask if I was still at the hospital, and when I replied that I'd gone home, she said that she was coming over. She found me on the couch in a house illuminated by a single lamp in the family room. I hadn't risen when she'd knocked at the door and she'd let herself in. Hey there, she said, her voice soft. She crossed the room and sat beside me. Hi, I said. Sorry I didn't get the door. It's fine, she said. How's Marge? How are you? I didn't know how to answer and I pinched the bridge of my nose. I didn't want to cry anymore. She slipped her arm around me and I leaned into her. Just like earlier that day, she held me close. And we didn't have to talk at all. Marge was released from the hospital on Sunday. Though she was weak and nauseated, she wanted to go home, and there was no reason to stay at the hospital. The first dose of poison, after all, had already been administered. I pushed the wheelchair, my parents trailing behind me. Liz walked beside the wheelchair, clearing a path in the busy hallways. No one we passed cast a second glance in our direction. It was cold outside. On the way to the hospital, Liz had asked me to swing by their house to get Marge a jacket. She directed me to a key hidden under a rock to the right of the front door. I had let myself in and rummaged through the foyer closet, trying to find something soft and warm. I finally settled on a long, down jacket. Before going outside, Liz helped Marge stand so she could slip on the jacket. She winced and wobbled, but kept her balance. Liz and my parents set out for the parking lot together, then veered in opposite directions to find their cars. I hate hospitals, Marge said to me. The only time I've ever been in a good mood in a hospital was when London was born. I'm with you, I said. That's it in my book as well. She pulled at her jacket, pinching it closed around her neck. So roll me outside, would you? Let's get out of here. I did as she asked, feeling a brisk wind nip at my cheeks as soon as we exited the building. The few trees in the parking lot were barren of leaves and the sky was an iron gray. When Marge spoke again, her voice was so soft I almost missed it. I'm afraid, Russ, she whispered. I know, I said. I am too. It's not fair. I never smoked, I hardly ever drank, I ate right, I exercised. For a moment she looked like a child again. I squatted down so I could be at eye level. You're right, it's not fair. She met my gaze then and barked out a resigned laugh. This is all Mom's fault, you know, she said. Her and the family genes, not that I'd ever say that to her, and not that really I blame her, because I don't. I'd had the identical thought, but hadn't spoken the words aloud. I knew that my mom was tormented by the same idea, and it was one of the reasons she'd barely spoken while at the hospital. I reached over and took Marge's hand. I feel like crap, Marge said. I've already decided that I hate chemotherapy. I've thrown up four times this morning, and now I don't feel like I have enough strength to get to the bathroom on my own. I'll help you, I said. I promise. No, she said. You won't. What are you talking about? Of course I will. I'd never seen Marge look so sad. Marge, who shrugged off even the biggest losses with pragmatic insouciance. I know that's what you think you should do, and I know that you'll want to. She gripped my hand. But I have Liz, and you have London and your business and Emily. I could care less about work right now. Emily will understand, and London is in school most of the time. Marge didn't answer right away. When she spoke, it was as if she were returning to a conversation I didn't know we were having. Do you know what I admire about you, among other things? She said. I have no idea. I admire your strength and your courage. I'm not strong, I protested, and I'm not brave. But you are, she said. When I look back at the past year and all you've gone through, I'm not sure how you made it. I watched you become the father I always knew you could be. I saw you at your very lowest after Vivian left, and I watched you pull yourself back up, all while launching a business and the struggles that entailed. Not many people could have handled the past six months the way you did. I know for a fact that I couldn't have. Why are you telling me this? I asked, uncomprehending. 
because I'm not going to let you stop doing what you need to do just because of me. That would break my heart. I'm going to be here for you, I said. You can't talk me out of it. I'm not asking you to abandon me. I'm asking that you continue to live your life. I'm asking you to be strong and brave again, because London's not the only one who's going to need you. Liz is going to need you. Mom and Dad, too. One of you has to be the rock, and while you might not believe it, I know in my heart that you've always been the strongest of us all. Chapter 24 December When I think back on Marge as a teenager, two things come to mind. Roller skating and horror films. In the late 80s and early 90s, roller skating was giving way to roller blading. But Marge stayed true to the old-fashioned skates that she had owned as a child. I think she had a soft spot for the disco roller rinks of her early childhood. Weekends during her teenage years were spent almost entirely on skates, usually with her Walkman and headphones on, even remarkably after she got her driver's license. There were few things she loved more than roller skating, unless it was a good horror film. Although Marge loved romantic comedies like I did, her favorite genre was horror, and she never missed seeing the latest horror movie in its first week of release. It didn't matter to her if the film had been panned by critics and the public alike. She would happily watch it alone if she couldn't find a fellow enthusiast, as devoted to the genre as a groupie to her favorite band. From Nightmare on Elm Street to Candyman to Amityville 4, The Evil Escapes, Marge was a true aficionado of horror, highbrow and low. When I asked her why she loved horror movies so much, she merely shrugged and said that sometimes she liked to be scared. I didn't get it, any more than I did the allure of rolling around with wheels on your feet. Why would someone want to be scared? Weren't there more than enough scary things in real life to keep us awake at night? Now, though, I think I understand. Marge liked those films precisely because they weren't real. Any fright she felt in the course of the film was quantifiable. It would begin, and then it would end and she would leave the theater emotionally spent yet relieved that all was well in the world. At the same time, she'd been able to confront, albeit temporarily, one of the hardwired emotions of life, the root of our universal instinct toward fight or flight. By willing herself to stay put despite her fear, I think Marge felt that she would emerge stronger and better equipped to face down whatever actual terrors life had in store for her. In retrospect, I think that Marge might have been onto something. Vivian had returned with London on Sunday evening. Before she left, she hugged me, a longer hug than I'd expected. In it, I could sense her concern, but strangely, her body no longer felt familiar to me. London had enjoyed her visit, but this time she mentioned that she had missed both her fish and Mr. and Mrs. Sprinkles. As soon as she got home, we went up to her room, where she told me that she'd had Thanksgiving dinner in a mansion. I guess that Vivian had introduced our daughter to Spannerman in reaction to seeing London hug Emily at the art studio. To Vivian's mind, no doubt, I'd violated the taboo first, which gave her the right to do so as well. I suppose I should have cared more, but in that moment I didn't. I was worn out, and I'd known that London would meet Spannerman sooner or later anyway. What did it matter if it was this weekend or the next time she was in Atlanta? What did anything matter anymore? While London was occupied with the fish, I decided to clean the hamster cage, since I'd let it slide while London was gone. By then I was accustomed to it, and it took no time at all. I ran the mess to the outdoor garbage can, washed up, then went back upstairs where London was holding Mr. Sprinkles. Are you hungry, sweetie? I asked. No, she said. Mommy and me ate on the plane. Just making sure, I said. I took a seat on the bed, watching her but mainly thinking about Marge. My sister wanted me to keep living my life, to act as though nothing had changed. But everything had changed, and I felt hollowed out, as empty as a junked oil drum. I wasn't sure I was capable of doing as Marge asked, and wasn't sure I even wanted to. Guess what, London said, looking up. What, sweetheart? For Christmas, I'm going to make Auntie Marge and Auntie Liz a vase, like I did for Mommy, but this time I want to paint fishes on it. I'm sure they'll love that. For a moment, London seemed to study me, her gaze unaccountably serious. Are you okay, Daddy? Yeah, I answered. I'm okay. You seem sad. I am, I thought. 
It's all I can do to not fall to pieces. I just missed you, I said. She smiled and came toward me, still holding the hamster. Would you like to hold Mr. Sprinkles? Sure, I said, as she gently placed him in my hand. The hamster was soft and light, but I could feel his tiny claws scramble for purchase as he shifted into place. His whiskers twitched and he began to sniff my hand. Guess what? London asked again. I summoned an inquisitive look. I can read now. Yeah? I read two by two all by myself. I read it to mommy. I wondered if it wasn't so much reading as reciting from memory. After all, we had read it a hundred times together. But again, what did it matter? Maybe you could show me later? Okay, she agreed. She put her arms around me and squeezed. I love you, Daddy. I caught the scent of the baby shampoo she still used and felt another ache in my heart. I love you, too. She squeezed harder before letting go. Can I have Mr. Sprinkles back? Marge quit work on Monday. I know because I got a text from her saying, I have decided to retire. I went by her house after I dropped London off at school. Work could wait. I didn't care what she wanted. What I wanted was to see my sister. Liz answered the door, and I could tell she'd recently been crying, though only a trace of redness in her eyes remained. I found Marge propped on the couch with her legs tucked up, wrapped in a blanket. Pretty Woman was playing on the television. It brought back a flood of memories, and all at once I saw Marge as a teenager again, back when she had an entire life in front of her. A life measured in decades, not months. Hey there, she said, hitting the pause button. What are you doing here? Shouldn't you be at work? I know the boss, I answered. He says it's okay if I'm a little late today. Smart ass. I learned from the best. Marge made room and I plopped down on the couch next to her. Admit it, you got my text and you came over because you're jealous that I finally quit the rat race. She gave a defiant grin. I figured it was time to live a little. I struggled in vain for a snappy comeback, and in the silence Marge poked my ribs with her feet. Lighten up, she said. No doom and gloom allowed in this house. She peeked over her shoulder. Was Liz okay? She finally whispered. I guess so, I answered. We didn't really talk. You should, she said. She's actually a very nice person. Are you done? I asked with a half-hearted smile. How are you feeling anyway? A lot better than yesterday, she answered. Which reminds me, can I take London roller skating this weekend? You want to take London roller skating? My disbelief must have shown because Marge bristled. Believe it or not, I refuse to let all of you keep me cooped up in the house, and I think London will enjoy it. I know I will. Left unsaid was that it would likely be something that London would remember forever, since it would be her first time. When was the last time you even went roller skating? What do you care? It's not like I've forgotten how to do it. If you recall, I used to be pretty good. It's not that, I thought to myself. I'm wondering whether you'll have the strength. I looked away toward the screen, convinced that Marge was in denial. In the freeze-frame image on the television, Julia Roberts was in a bar, confronting her roommate about money. Though I hadn't seen the movie in years, I could still recall the film practically scene by scene. Okay, I said, but only if you hit play so we can watch the movie. You want to waste your morning watching Pretty Woman? Instead of earning money? It's my life, I said. Well, just don't make it a habit, okay? You're welcome to come by after work, but not before. I'll probably start needing my beauty rest. Just hit the play button already. She lifted her eyebrows slightly and pointed the remote. I just started it a few minutes ago. I know. We used to watch this together. I know, I said again. Just like I also know you've always had a crush on Julia Roberts. She laughed as the movie started up again. And for the next couple of hours, my sister and I watched the movie calling out lines and sharing a running commentary, just like when we were kids. After the movie, Marge went to the bedroom to take a nap, while Liz and I drank coffee in the kitchen. I don't know what I'm going to do, Liz admitted, with the expression of someone overtaken by events she can hardly comprehend. In Costa Rica, she seemed fine. She barely coughed and it was hard for me to keep up with her. I don't understand how she could seem so healthy a month ago and now... She shook her head in bewilderment. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I canceled my appointments today and tomorrow, but Marge basically forbade me from taking a leave of absence. She wants me to continue working at least a few days a week, insisting that your mom can fill in as needed. 
that we should work out a schedule or whatever. When she raised her eyes, they were full of pain. It's like she doesn't want me around. It's not that, I said, covering her hand with my own. She loves you, you know that. Then why is she essentially telling me to stay away? Why can't she understand that I just want to be with her as much as possible, for as long as possible? She squeezed my hand in return as she stared out the window, unseeing. She still wants to go to New York next week, she finally added. You're not seriously thinking of going, are you? Roller skating was one thing, but a sightseeing trip to one of the busiest cities in the world? I don't know what to do. She asked the doctor about it last night, and he said that if she was feeling up to it, there was no reason for her not to go since it's between chemo sessions. But how can I go and not think to myself, this will be the last time Marge sees this, or this will be Marge's only chance to do that? She was looking to me for an answer, but I knew there wasn't anything I could say. Most of her questions, after all, were the same as my own, and I had no answers either. On Tuesday morning, the first day of December, I got a text from Marge asking London and me to dinner that night. It was a subtle way of telling me not to swing by the house before that. The thought depressed me, and after dropping London off at school, I arranged to meet Emily for coffee. In jeans and a thick turtleneck sweater, she looked as fresh-faced and youthful as a college student. You look tired, she observed. Are you holding up okay? I'm surviving, I answered, pushing a weary hand through my hair. I'm sorry for not calling the last couple of days. She raised her hands immediately. Don't be. I can't imagine what you're going through. I've been worried about you. For whatever reason, her words were a comfort. Thanks, Em, I said. That means a lot to me. Do you want to tell me what's going on? She said, touching my arm. For the next hour, I rambled on, my cup of coffee gradually cooling to room temperature. Listening to myself, I realized that since Emily had come back into my life, I'd been careening from one emotional catastrophe to the next. Even as she held me later, I found myself marveling that she was still willing to put up with me. For dinner that night, Liz went out of her way to cook something she knew London would enjoy. Shake and bake chicken, seasoned potatoes, and a fruit salad. My mom was just leaving as we arrived, and I walked her out to her car. Before she got in, she paused. Marge is refusing to let me give up any of my clubs, my mom said. In fact, she insisted that I stick to the very same schedule, but Russ... She frowned in concern. She doesn't know how bad it's going to get. She's going to need help. It's like she's in denial. I nodded, signaling that I'd been thinking the same thing. Do you know what she said to me just now? She wants Dad to come by to fix a few of the railings on the porch because they've got some dry rot. And some of the windows are sticking. And there's a leaking sink in the bathroom. She was so insistent about getting these things fixed. As if that even matters right now. She gave me a baffled look. Why would she be making such a fuss about a few porch railings or the windows? Though I didn't respond, it finally dawned on me what Marge was doing. I suddenly knew why she wanted me to only come by in the evenings why she was having Liz and my mom split time with her. I knew why she wanted my dad to come over and make repairs on the house and why she was insisting on taking London roller skating. Marge, more than anyone, knew that each of us not only wanted private time with her, but were going to need it before the end. With the side effects of the initial chemotherapy treatment diminishing over the course of the week, Marge grew steadily stronger and all of us wanted to believe her treatment was working because we so desperately craved even a few more months with her. I know now that only Marge understood on some intuitive level what was really going on inside her body. She bowed to treatment in the first place, simply because it was what all of us wanted her to do. In hindsight, I realized that she understood even as she'd said yes, that it wouldn't slow the progress of the disease at all. To this day... I still wonder how she knew. Liz and my mom organized a schedule such that one of them would always be at the house during the day, once Marge and Liz returned from New York. The Friday following my dinner at Marge's, my dad took a morning off work and showed up at Marge's with his tool chest and a pile of pre-cut railings in his trunk. He began the slow process of repair and took a break at lunch. Marge and my dad had sandwiches and sweet tea on the back porch, 
admiring my dad's handiwork to that point and discussing the Braves' prospects for the following year's season. On Saturday, Marge arrived at my house after art class, the very same art class where unbeknownst to my sister London had fashioned her Christmas gift, to take London roller skating. Liz and I tagged along with them, watching from the gallery as Marge helped London inch around the rink. London, like most kids, kept trying to walk in the skates rather than glide, and it took a good half an hour before London began to master the motion. Had it not been for Marge holding both of London's hands, Marge was skating backward. My little girl would have wiped out at least 20 times. However, by the end of the session, they were able to skate side by side, albeit slowly, and London was visibly proud as she finally untied the laces with Liz's help and turned in her skates. I took a seat next to Marge while she bent over and removed her own skates. Your arms and back are going to be sore tomorrow, I predicted. To my eyes, she looked tired, but I couldn't tell whether it was because she was sick or because catching London over and over before she fell was understandably exhausting. I'll be fine, she said. London's not very heavy, but she is a chatty little thing. She talked and talked the whole time. She even grilled me on what my favorite color of fish was. I had no idea what to tell her. I smiled. New York will probably seem restful by comparison. You're leaving tomorrow? Yeah, I can't wait, she said, perking up. I've told Liz that our first stop is the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. I want to get in the spirit of the holidays. Text me some pictures, I said. I will, she promised. By the way, I know what I want for Christmas, she said pointedly. From you. Do tell. I'll tell you when I get back, but here's a little hint. I want to go somewhere with you. Like a trip, you mean? No, she said. Not a trip. Then where? If I told you, you wouldn't be surprised. If you don't tell me, then how can I do it? How about you let me figure that part out, okay? With her skates off and her shoes back on, I saw her cast the last wistful look toward the rink. It was getting crowded now, filling with children, groups of raucous teenagers, and a few nostalgic adults. By Marge's expression, I knew she was thinking to herself that she was never going to have the chance to skate again. Today, I realized, hadn't simply been about teaching London to roller skate, or making a memory that London might hold on to forever. Marge had begun the process of saying goodbye to the things she loved, too. Marge and Liz were gone for six days. While they were away, I worked long hours wanting to get as much done on the new ad campaigns as possible, but mostly trying to keep myself from dwelling on my sister. As promised, she'd texted me photos of the Rockefeller Christmas tree, one of her and Liz together, and another shot of her by herself. I had the pictures photoshopped, printed, and then framed, with the intention of giving one set to Marge and Liz as a Christmas gift, and keeping another set for myself. Meanwhile, I was contacted by two more law firms, including a small firm in Atlanta that had stumbled across my recent work on YouTube. As I started to put together the requisite presentations, I found myself reviewing the past six months. When I'd started my agency, it seemed as though all my worries were business or money-related, and at the time, I'd found the stress overwhelming. Things I'd thought couldn't get much worse, yet I could distinctly remember Marge reassuring me that everything would turn out fine in the end. She was right, of course. On the other hand, she couldn't have been more wrong. The holidays continued to approach. What are your plans for Christmas, with London? Marge asked me. It was Sunday afternoon and she'd just woken from a nap, but still looked tired. We were on her couch, where she'd wrapped herself in a blanket, even though the house felt warm to me. She and Liz had returned from New York the day before, and I wanted to see her before London returned from Atlanta. Have you and Vivian discussed that yet? Christmas is only two weeks away, you know. As I stared at my sister, it seemed to me that she'd lost even more weight since I'd seen her at the skating rink. Her eyes had a sunken look about them, and her voice sounded slightly higher and thinner somehow. Not yet, I said. But again, it's falling on one of her weekends. Russ, I know I've said it before, but it's not fair for you not to have any holidays with London. No, it wasn't. But there wasn't much I could do about it so I attempted to change the subject. How was New York? It was amazing, Marge sighed. But the crowds, wow. There were lines down the block just to get into some of the stores. The shows were fantastic, and we had some truly unforgettable meals. 
She mentioned some of the musicals they'd seen and restaurants where they'd eaten. It was worth it then? For sure, she said. I had the hotel arrange a couple of romantic evenings while we were there, too. Champagne, chocolate-covered strawberries, rose petals trailing to the bed. I'd also brought along some new lingerie to show off my newly svelte figure. She waggled her eyebrows. I think I blew Liz's socks off. Why didn't you want her wearing socks? Really? That's your thought process? When my sister starts talking about her love life, I choose to retreat into naivete, I explained. It's not like I share details about my love life. You don't have a love life with Emily yet, and if you ask me, it's about time you did something about that. We're in a good place right now, I insisted. We talk every night on the phone, see each other for coffee, and we went out on Friday night. What did you do? Dinner and karaoke. You did karaoke? That caught Marge by surprise. She did. Then again, it was her idea. She's pretty good, too. Marge smiled as she burrowed deeper into the couch. That sounds like fun, she said. Not really sexy or romantic, but fun. Any bites on your house yet? There have been a few nibbles here and there, but nothing official yet. My realtor says that December is always slow. She wants to do an open house in January. Let me know when. Liz and I will come by as ringers and talk up the place in front of potential buyers. You have better things to do than go to an open house. Probably she conceded. Then again, you always seem to end up needing my help in one way or another. I've had to take care of you my whole life. She glanced in the direction of the kitchen where Liz was preparing lunch. I'm supposed to have more chemo this week. Next Friday, I think. I'm not looking forward to that at all. She sighed, a flicker of apprehension crossing her face. She turned to me. With that in mind, we should probably do our thing on Thursday. What thing? Our trip, remember? She said. My Christmas present? You do realize that I still have no idea what you're talking about. That's okay. I'll pick you up at seven. Liz can get London ready for bed if that's all right with you. Of course, I said. She stifled a yawn and I knew it was time for me to go. I guess I should take off. I've got a ton of work I want to get done before London gets home. Okay, she said. I'm looking forward to Thursday night. Make sure you dress warmly. I will, I promised. I rose from the couch, hesitated, then leaned back over to kiss my sister on the cheek. Her eyes were closed. See you later. She nodded without answering, and by the sound of her breathing, I knew she had fallen asleep again, even before I'd reached the front door. Vivian delivered London around 7 p.m. that evening. While the limousine idled out front and London was in the bath, we spoke briefly in the kitchen. About Christmas, she said cutting to the chase. I think it would be best if we spend it here. For London, I mean. It'll be her last Christmas in this house. I can just stay in the guest room if that's all right with you. She reached for her purse and pulled out a slip of paper. I've already bought some things, but it might be easier if you picked up some of this other stuff so I don't have to haul everything back here. I made a list. Just save the receipts and we can split it all up at the end. Whatever's easiest, I agreed, thinking back to what Marge had said about the holidays, knowing she'd be pleased. I saw Marge today, I said, leaning against the counter. How's she doing? She's already beginning to sleep a lot. Vivian nodded, lowering her gaze. It's just awful, she said. I know you think Marge and I didn't get along that well, but I always liked her. And I know she doesn't deserve this. I want you to know that. She's always been a great sister. She still is, I said. But even as the words came out, I wondered how much longer I'd be able to say them. After school on Wednesday, Emily and I planned to take the kids out to a Christmas tree farm, where you could choose and have your own tree cut down. Much of the place was decorated like Santa's village, and kids could meet Santa before visiting his workshop, where hot chocolate and cookies were served. Even better, the farm would deliver and set up the tree in its stand, something I needed since I suspected that my Prius would otherwise be crushed beneath the weight of the tree. When I mentioned the plan to Marge, she insisted that she and Liz meet us there. It was nine days until Christmas. In the gravel parking lot, Marge emerged from the car. When I hugged her, I could feel the sharp ridges of her ribcage, the cancer slowly eating away at her from within. She seemed to have more energy, however, than she had just after she returned from New York. And this, I take it, is Bodie, Marge said, 
shaking his hand with touching formality. You're so tall for your age, she remarked, before proceeding to ask about his favorite activities and what he wanted for Christmas. When the kids became visibly antsy, we let them run off toward the farm, where they were quickly lost between evergreen triangles. Emily and I trailed after them, strolling with Marge and Liz. How is your holiday season shaping up, Em? Marge asked. Are you going anywhere? No, she said. We'll just do the family thing like we usually do. See my sister and my parents. Ever since London learned to ride a bike, Bodie's been begging for one, so I guess I have to get him one, even if I'm not so confident about my ability to teach him to ride. You'll help her out, won't you, Russ? Marge said, elbowing me. I grimaced. Marge has always been good at volunteering me for things. I seem to recall that, she laughed. Russ said you had a good time in New York? The two of them fell behind a bit, engrossed in their conversation. I looped my arm through Liz's and followed the path the kids had taken. How's the schedule working out with Mom? I asked. It's working, I guess. I cut back to three days a week at work, so your mom is going to come on the other two weekdays. Marge seems to be doing well today. She was a little fatigued this morning, but she perked up on the ride over. I think doing things like this makes her feel like there's nothing wrong with her, if only for a little while. She was the same way when we were in New York. I'm glad she wanted to come. I just don't want her to get run down. I've said the same thing to her, Liz said, and do you know what her response was? I can't imagine. She told me not to worry so much because she still has something important to do. What does that mean? Liz shook her head. Your guess is as good as mine. As we stopped and waited for Emily and Marge to catch up, I pondered my sister's cryptic words. She had always been one for surprises, and I wondered what last mysteries she had up her sleeve. The next evening, Marge and Liz arrived at my house at seven on the dot. As soon as Liz walked through the door, London took her hand and led her up to the bedroom to show her the aquarium. Marge was bundled in a scarf and hat despite the relatively mild temperatures. She also wore gloves in the oversized down jacket I'd brought to the hospital. It seemed impossible that less than three weeks had passed and she'd been rushed to the hospital. Are you ready? She said impatiently, clearly ready to leave. I grabbed my jacket and dug out a pair of gloves and a hat, even though I couldn't imagine needing them. Where are we going? You'll see, she said. Come on before I chicken out. I was still mystified, but as we began to turn down roads, I recognized I suddenly understood what she had in mind. You're not serious, I said as she pulled up to the gates and shut off the engine. I am, she said firmly, and this is your Christmas gift to me. Looking up, the water tower loomed, impossibly, immeasurably tall. It's illegal to climb the water tower, I said. It's always been illegal. That never stopped us before. We were kids, I countered. And now we're not, she said. You ready? Get your hat and gloves. It'll probably be windy up top. Marge. She stared at me. I can make the climb, she said in a voice that left no room for dissent. After another round of chemo, maybe I won't be able to. But right now, I still can. And I want you to come with me. She didn't wait for me to answer. Getting out of the car, she strode toward the steel maintenance ladder, leaving me paralyzed with indecision. By the time I scrambled after her, she was already six feet in the air, which meant, of course, that I had no choice but to start climbing. If she got tired, if she became weak or dizzy, I had to be there to catch her. In the end, it was fear for her that spurred me to follow. Marge hadn't been lying. Though she had to take a break every twenty feet or so, she would inevitably start up again, moving relentlessly higher. Below me I could see rooftops, and I caught the scent of chimney smoke. I was grateful for my gloves, as the metal rungs were cold enough to make my hands stiffen up. When we finally reached the top, Marge inched her way over to the spot where I'd found her on that terrible night back when she'd been in college. Just like then, she let her feet dangle over the narrow walkway, and I quickly moved to her side. I put my arm around her again in case she got dizzy. You must be feeling the cold, I said. Speak for yourself, she retorted. I put on long johns before I came. Fine, I said. Then slide your butt closer to me so I can get warm too. She did, and for a while we took in a bird's eye view of the neighborhood. 
It was too cold for the nighttime sound of crickets or frogs. Instead, I caught the faintest murmuring of wind chimes and the sound of the breeze as it rustled the branches of trees. That and the sound of Marge wheezing, low and wet. I wondered how much pain she was in. The cancer, after all, always brings pain. I remember when you found me up here, drunk as a skunk, she said. Well, not all of it. I actually don't remember much at all about that night, other than that moment when you suddenly appeared. It was a rough night, I said. I sometimes wonder what would have happened had you not shown up. I wonder if I really would have jumped, or maybe fallen. I was so heartbroken about Tracy at the time, but I look back now and can't help but think it was a good thing. Because in the end, I found Liz. And what Liz and I have is nothing like what I had with Tracy. Ever. She and I just work, you know? Yeah, I know. You guys have something that everyone wants. I'm worried about her, Marge admitted. She's so good at helping other people get through their problems. But I think she gives so much at work, she doesn't have much left for herself. And it scares me, because I want her to be okay. I want her to be happy. She stared out into the distance, almost as if trying to see into the future. I want her to one day find somebody new, somebody who loves her as much as I do, someone she can grow old with. I swallowed, forcing the tightness from my throat. I know. When we were in New York, she swore she has no interest in ever finding someone else. And I actually got really mad at her. We had an argument, and afterward I felt so bad about it. We both did. There's a lot going on, Marge, I said, my voice soft. She understands, and she'll be okay. If Marge heard me, she gave no sign. Do you know what else scares me? What's that? That she's going to lose contact with London. She loves that little girl so much. London is a big part of the reason we wanted to have kids of our own. And now? Liz is always going to be part of the family, I cut in. I'll make sure that Liz plays a big part in London's life. What if London moves to Atlanta? Marge pressed. She'll still see Liz regularly, I assured her. But you're only going to have her on the occasional holiday and every other weekend, right? Maybe a couple of weeks in the summer? I hesitated. I honestly don't know what's going to happen with London, I said. Vivian had been more generous and less volatile since learning about Marge. But then she was the least predictable person I knew, and I was leery of making specific promises I couldn't keep. She turned toward me. You have to fight for her, Marge urged. London should live with you. Vivian won't let that happen, and I doubt that the courts will either. Then you have to figure something out, because let me tell you something. Girls need their fathers. Look at me and Dad. He might not have been the most expressive guy in the world, but I always knew at some really deep level that he was there for me. And look at what he did for me when I came out. We stopped going to church, for God's sake. He chose me over God, over our community, over everyone. And if you're not around for London when she comes to her own crossroads in life, she's going to feel abandoned by you. You have to be there for her every day, not just now and then. She fell silent for a moment, as if winded by her efforts. Anyway, she's used to you being the primary parent now, she added, and you're great at it. I'm trying, Marge, I said. She grabbed my arm, her voice fierce. You have to do more than that. You need to do whatever you can in order to remain in London's life. Not as a weekend or vacation dad, but as the parent who's always there to hold her when she cries. Pick her up when she falls. Help her with her homework. To support her when she can't see a way forward. She needs that from you. I stared down at the empty streets below, washed by the halogen glow of streetlights. I know she does, I said quietly. I just hope I don't fail. On Sunday morning, the Christmas tree was delivered, and London and I spent the first part of the day decorating it stringing lights among the branches and conferring over the placement of every single ornament. When I called Marge and Liz later that afternoon to see if they wanted to come by for some eggnog, Liz answered the phone and said they wouldn't be able to make it. It's been a pretty bad day, Liz said. 
Marge had undergone her second round of chemo on Friday, the day after the trip to the water tower, and I hadn't seen her since. According to Liz, the nausea and pain were worse than the first time, and Marge had barely been able to leave her bed. Is there anything I can do to help? No, she answered. Your mom and dad have been here pretty much all day. They're still here. She lowered her voice. Your dad. I think it really kills him to see Marge like this. He keeps finding new things to repair. It's hard for your mom too, of course, but she's been through it so many times that at least she knows what to expect. He's trying so hard to be strong for Marge, but it's destroying him inside. He just loves her so much, his girl. They both do. I found myself thinking about what Marge had said that night on the water tower, about being the kind of dad who was there for everything, always. Even, it seems, at the end. He's a great father, Liz, I said. I hope I can be half the dad he is. On Monday, London's last day of school before winter break, I finally got around to the Christmas list that Vivian had left me. Work had kept me busy most days, and in my binary focus on clients and Marge, Vivian's list had slipped off my radar. Luckily, Emily still had some last-minute shopping to do, so the two of us drove from store to store late that morning. With Christmas only four days away, I was worried that some items would be sold out, but I was able to find everything on Vivian's list. Halfway through our shopping, Emily and I took a break for lunch. There was a cafe at the mall, and though the food smelled good, I had little appetite. On the scale that morning, I saw that I'd begun to lose weight again. I wasn't alone. Liz was losing weight as well, and I noted that she sometimes looked disheveled, as if she no longer cared about her appearance. Her hair, often tied back in a careless ponytail, was losing its luster. My mom and dad, too, were suffering. My dad seemed to have acquired a defeated hunch in the past few weeks, and my mom's face was more deeply lined with worry with every passing day. But our suffering was nothing compared to Marge's. Walking was becoming painful for her, and often she struggled to stay awake for more than an hour. When I visited, I sometimes sat with Marge in her darkened bedroom, listening as she seemed to struggle to draw breath, even as she slept. Occasionally she whimpered in her sleep, and I wondered if she were dreaming. If only, I thought, she could dream the kind of dreams that would make her smile. Thoughts like these preoccupied me, even in Emily's company, no matter what the surroundings. When my lunch arrived, I stared at it blankly, picturing Marge's emaciated face. I took only a single bite before pushing the plate aside. If Marge couldn't eat, I guess there was a part of me that felt like I didn't deserve to either. You need to come by the house, Marge said without preamble, right after I answered her call. I just dropped Emily off a few minutes earlier. Why, are you okay? Do you really want me to answer that question? She said, with a trace of her old sardonic humor. But yes, I'm feeling better than I was, and I'd like you to come by. I have to pick up London from school in a little while, and drop off the gifts beforehand. Swing by here on the way and leave the gifts with us, she said. London won't find them that way. When I reached her house a few minutes later, I started unloading the bags from the trunk. When I looked up, my mom appeared in the front doorway. Even with her help, it took two trips to unload everything. I'm not sure where to put all this, I said, staring at the mountain of bags on the kitchen floor. Did London really need all this, I wondered. I'll put it all in one of the closets, my mom said. Go on in, Marge is waiting for you. I found Marge on the couch, wrapped in a blanket as usual, with the living room shades drawn. The lights from the Christmas tree cast a cheerful glow, but in the days since I'd seen her last, she seemed to have aged years. Her cheekbones stood out in sharp relief below the sunken pits of her eyes, and her arms looked ropey and flaccid. I tried to mask my dismay at her appearance as I took a seat beside her. I heard it was a rough few days, I said, clearing my throat. I felt better, that's for sure. I'm on the mend now, but... She cracked a smile, a ghost of her irrepressible self. I'm glad you came by. I wanted to talk to you. Getting the words out seemed to be an effort. Emily called a little while ago. Emily? Yeah, she said. You remember her, right? Gorgeous hair, has a five-year-old son, the woman you love. Anyway, she called me because she's worried about you. She says you're not eating. She called you? I said, feeling my irritation rise. 
Now Marge was going to worry about my health? I asked her to keep an eye on you and let me know how you're doing, Marge said in a bossy voice I remembered from childhood, which is why I then asked you to come over. She scanned me with a critical eye. You better eat a decent dinner tonight or I'm going to get seriously angry with you. When did you discuss keeping an eye on me with Emily, I demanded. When we went to Santa's village for the trees. You have better things to worry about than me, Marge, I said, conscious of how sulky I sounded. That's where you're wrong, she said. That's something that I won't let you take away from me. Tuesday, December 22nd, was London's last day of school before the winter break, and that was when I planned to wrap all the gifts. Before I'd left her house the previous day, Marge asked if she could help with the wrapping, since the gifts were over there anyhow. When I arrived at the house with wrapping paper after dropping London off at school, my first thought was that Marge looked better than she had the day before. Simultaneously, I hated that I had begun to make those kinds of evaluations every time I saw her, only to see my hopes elevated or dashed depending on how she seemed to be doing. Liz was home with her that day, and she exuded a forced good cheer as we brought the gifts to the kitchen and began to wrap. At Marge's request, she made us all cups of hot chocolate, thick and foamy, although I noticed that my sister drank little of hers. Marge wrapped a couple of the smaller gifts before settling back in her chair, leaving the rest to Liz and me. I'm still not happy that you're calling Emily to check up on me, I groused. Despite her condition, Marge was clearly enjoying my discomfort, as evidenced by the gleam in her eye. That's why I didn't ask your permission, and if you're interested, we didn't just talk about that, by the way. We talked about a lot of things. I wasn't sure I liked the sound of that. What things? That's between me and her, she said. But for now, what I want to know is whether you ate last night. Full report, please. I made steaks for London and me. I sighed. And mashed potatoes. Good, she said with satisfaction. Now, have you spoken with Vivian about the plans for Christmas this year, other than that she'll be coming to Charlotte? The tradition in my family had been to gather at my parents on Christmas Eve. My mom would make an elaborate dinner, and afterward we'd allow London to open gifts from the relatives while It's a Wonderful Life played on television. On Christmas morning at our house, Vivian and I would have London to ourselves. We haven't gotten into the specifics yet, I said. She doesn't come in until tomorrow. We'll figure it out then. You probably need to get her something, Marge pointed out, for London's sake, so she can see her mom opening some gifts. It doesn't have to be anything big. You're right, I said. I didn't think of that. What did you get Emily for Christmas? Nothing yet, I admitted. Any thoughts yet? You're cutting it a little close. I don't know, I said, looking to Marge and Liz for inspiration. A sweater, maybe? Or a nice jacket? Those could be part of it, but she told me what she's getting you, so you'll have to do better than that. Like jewelry or something? If you want, I'm sure she'd appreciate that too, but I was thinking that you need to do something from the heart. Like what? I think, she said, drawing the words out, that you should write her a letter. What kind of letter? Marge shrugged. You write for a living, Russ. Tell her how much she's meant to you these past months how much you want her to remain in your life. Tell her, Marge said, lighting up, that you want her to take a chance on you again. I squirmed. She already knows how I feel about her. I tell her that all the time. Write her a letter anyway, Marge urged. Trust me, you'll be glad you did. I did as Marge suggested. With London in tow, piano lessons weren't until the new year, I drove directly from school pickup to the mall, where I found some gifts for Vivian. Her favorite perfume, a scarf, a new novel by a writer she liked. I also picked out an embroidered silk jacket for Emily, one that I was sure would complement her rich coloring and slightly bohemian style, and a gold chain with an emerald pendant that would accent the color of her eyes. Later, after London had gone to sleep, I sat at the kitchen table and wrote Emily a letter. It took more than one draft to get it right. Despite the wordsmithing I did for my job, writing from the heart was entirely different, and I found it difficult to strike that delicate balance between raw emotion and maudlin sentimentality. In the end, I was happy with the letter, and grateful that Marge had made the suggestion. 
I sealed it in an envelope and was about to put the pad and pen back in the drawer when I suddenly realized that I wasn't yet done. Working until long past midnight, I wrote Marge a letter as well. Vivian got in a little past noon the following day, not long after I'd returned from dropping off the gifts at Emily's. With the tree already trimmed, London and I had spent the morning decorating the mantle and hanging the stockings. It was a little late in the season, but London didn't mind at all. She was proud to be old enough to help. I let Vivian visit with London for a while before signaling my desire to speak with her. Retreating to the kitchen while London watched TV in the living room, I asked her what she wanted to do for Christmas Eve. At my question, she stared at me as though it were obvious. Well, aren't we going to your parents' place like we always do? I know that it might feel a little strange considering what's going on, but it's Marge's last Christmas, and I want London to spend time with her and the family, like she always has. That's why I came home in the first place. Even though we weren't in love anymore, I thought to myself, there were still moments when I was reminded of some of the reasons I'd married Vivian in the first place. Christmas Eve and Christmas Day unfolded much like they always had. The atmosphere was a bit stilted on Christmas Eve at first, for obvious reasons. Everyone was polite to each other and there were kisses and hugs all around when Vivian, London, and I showed up at my parents'. But by the time I finished my first glass of wine, it was clear that everyone's sole aim that evening was to make the gathering enjoyable for London's sake. And Marge's. Vivian appreciated the gifts I'd gotten her. For me, she'd bought some running gear and a Fitbit. Marge and Liz oohed and awed over the vase that London made for them, especially marveling at the colors of the fish that London had painted. Tears shone in their eyes when they opened the framed photos that had been taken in New York, and my sister took the envelope containing the letter I'd written with a tender smile. London received a bunch of Barbie stuff from pretty much everyone, and after the gifts were opened we put on the movie It's a Wonderful Life while London played with her new toys. The only truly notable event of the evening took place after we'd finished opening the gifts. From the corners of my eyes, I watched as Marge and Vivian slipped from the living room, sequestering themselves in the den. The low hum of their voices was barely audible behind the partially closed door. It was odd to see the two of them speaking so intimately, let alone in private, but I knew exactly what was happening. Vivian, like all of us, had wanted the chance to say goodbye. On Christmas Day, once London had opened the rest of her gifts, I left the house so Vivian could have some time alone with London. To that point, we'd been together almost continuously during the previous 48 hours, and if I needed a break from her, I was certain that Vivian felt the same way. Cordiality, let alone forced gaiety, in the midst of a divorce and custody dispute, wasn't easy for anyone to maintain. I texted Emily, asking if I could drop by, and received a quick response, urging me to do so. She had a gift for me, she said, and she wanted me to see it. Even before I got out of the car, she was skipping off the porch toward me. Up close, she threw her arms around me, and we held each other in the pale sunlight of a cool December day. Thank you for the letter, she whispered. It was absolutely beautiful. I followed Emily inside, picking my way through a maelstrom of new toys and torn wrapping paper, at the center of which stood Bodie's shiny new bicycle. She led the way toward the Christmas tree, and reaching behind it pulled out a flat, rectangular package. I thought about giving this to you before Christmas, but with Vivian staying at the house, I thought it would be best to give it to you here. I tugged at the wrapping paper and it came off easily. As soon as I saw what Emily had done, all I could do was stare, the memory coming back to me in a rush. Overwhelmed, I couldn't speak. I had it framed, but you can change it to something else, Emily said in a shy voice. I wasn't sure where you might want to hang it. This is incredible, I finally said, unable to tear my eyes from the image. Emily had painted the photo of London and me dancing outside the aquarium, but it seemed even more real, more alive than the photo somehow. It was by far the most meaningful gift I'd ever received, and I wrapped my arms around Emily, suddenly understanding why Marge had been so insistent that I write Emily a letter. She'd known that Emily was giving me a gift from the heart, and Marge wanted to make sure I matched it with one of my own. Once again, Marge had been looking out for me. The year rolled toward its inevitable conclusion. Vivian went back to Atlanta. 
I'd closed the office for the week and spent most of my time with London. I visited with Marge and Liz every day. Marge continued to rebound, rallying our hopes, and saw Emily three times, though twice in the company of the kids. The lone exception was New Year's Eve, when I took her out for a night of dinner and dancing. At the stroke of midnight, I almost kissed her. She almost kissed me too, and we both laughed about it. Soon, I said. Yes, soon, she answered. And yet, as romantic as that moment was, I felt reality beginning to take hold. In 2015, I thought I'd lost everything. In 2016, I suspected I'd lose even more. Chapter 25 For Old Lang Syne Marge's romantic plans for Liz in New York weren't without precedent. Around the five-year mark of their relationship, Marge had surprised Liz with an elaborate scavenger hunt on Valentine's Day. When Marge initially revealed her plans to me, I'll admit I was shocked because it seemed so unlike the sister I knew. After all, she was an accountant, and while generalizations might be unfair, she always struck me as more of a smart-alecky pragmatist than a mushy paramour. While Marge rarely showcased her romantic side, she could clearly hit it out of the ballpark when she chose to do so. Indeed, the scavenger hunt proved to be the work of a master planner. New York was child's play by comparison. The centerpiece of the Valentine's Day scavenger hunt, which involved locations all over Charlotte, was a series of ten riddles. The riddles were set to verse and led to specific reveals. A sample. Today, dear Liz, we'll have some fun. To remind you that you're my only one. So visit the spot where it's all about you. On early mornings and late at night, too. Then look to your left, my darling dear, and your very first clue will there appear. Marge had taped the first clue, a small key, next to the bathroom mirror, which led Liz to a post office box that she had to open with the key. Inside the box was another riddle, and so it went. Some of the clues were tougher than others. One required Liz to finish a glass of champagne to find the next clue, which was glued to the bottom of the champagne flute. At the time, I was stunned by the breadth and inventiveness of Marge's scheme. Looking back, I'm no longer surprised by Marge's elaborate Valentine's Day plans or her meticulous footwork. I no longer think of it as out of character, because drawing up blueprints for other people's happiness was what she did best. My sister, the accountant, always had a plan, especially for those she loved. My memories of early 2016 are distilled into a series of vivid moments, set against the muted backdrop of my day-by-day -day existence. The backdrop consisted of work, where I wrote, filmed, edited, and designed ad campaigns, London's care, before and after school, my daily run, and Emily, whose nightly phone conversations and occasional dates nourished and sustained me. Those routines made up the regular fabric of my days and also served as temporary distractions from the peaks and abysses that marked that period of my life. With the passage of time, I'm sure I've forgotten more than I remember. Some things I willed myself to forget. But other memories will remain with me forever. About a week into the new year, Marge went in for further tests. While I didn't accompany her to the hospital, my parents and I joined Liz and Marge when it came time to hear the results. We met the doctor in his office across the street from the hospital. He faced us across a heavy wooden desk, a handful of family photos arranged next to a large stack of files. On the walls were shelves filled with books and the usual assortment of framed diplomas, plaques, and citations. The only incongruous element was a large framed poster from the film Patch Adams. I only vaguely remember the film. It starred Robin Williams as a caring, kind, and funny doctor, and I found myself wondering if Dr. Patel aspired to be a doctor with similar attributes. Had there ever been anything humorous said in this room? Did any patients ever laugh when talking to their oncologist? Could any joke minimize the horror of what was happening? To us, Marge appeared to be improving slightly. She'd had more energy since the holidays, and her pain didn't seem quite as acute. Even her breathing seemed less labored. All of that should have pointed to good news. I could see the hopefulness in my parents' expressions. I noted the confident way Liz was holding Marge's hand. 
We'd shared our secret hopes amongst ourselves during the previous week, trying to draw strength from each other. Marge, however, didn't look hopeful. There was an air of resignation about her from the moment she took her seat, and I knew right then with certainty that Marge would be the only one who wouldn't shed a tear that afternoon. While the rest of us had remained stuck in various stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, Marge alone had already moved on to acceptance. Marge knew, even before the doctor said a single word, that the cancer hadn't slowed its progression. In truth, she'd known all along that it had spread even farther. Please don't ask me how I'm doing, Marge said. Mom and Dad just left, and Mom kept asking me that over and over, and Dad keeps asking what else needs to be fixed. I wanted to say me, but didn't think they could handle the joke. We were sitting on Marge's sofa, as had become our custom, staring at the empty space where the Christmas tree had once stood. My dad had removed it a few days earlier, but the furniture hadn't been rearranged yet, leaving a barren space in the corner of the room. It's a hard day for them, I said. They're doing their best. I know, Marge said, and I love that Dad keeps coming around. We've talked more than we have in years, and not just about baseball. She let out a breath before suddenly wincing. A wave of pain, somewhere, everywhere, made her entire body tighten before it finally passed. Can I get you something? I asked, feeling more helpless than ever. I just took a pill, she said. I don't mind the painkillers, other than that they make me sleepy. They don't work as well as I want them to, of course. They blunt the pain a bit, but that's about it. Anyway, she looked toward the kitchen, where Liz was at the table, coloring with London. Lowering her voice, she said, I told Liz I'm not doing another round of chemo. Her expression was grim, but resolute. She was pretty upset about it. She's just scared, I said. But do you really think that's the right decision? You heard the doctor, she countered. It's not working. And on the downside, it makes me feel even worse. All I do is vomit and sleep and my hair is starting to fall out. I'm losing whole days after the treatment and I don't have that many days left. Don't say that, I pleaded. I'm sorry. I know you don't want to hear it. Nobody does. Marge squeezed her eyes shut, wincing again at another wave of pain that, to me, took far too long to pass. I'm guessing London doesn't know I'm sick, am I right? I shook my head. She doesn't even know that Vivian and I are getting divorced yet. Marge opened one eye to peer at me. It's probably time that you tell her, don't you think? I didn't answer, because I didn't even know where to start. There was too much to lay on a six-year-old. Divorce and Marge dying and moving, maybe even as far away as Atlanta, leaving her father and her friends behind. I didn't want London to deal with any of it. I didn't even want to deal with it. As I felt the tears building behind my eyes, Marge reached over and placed her hand on mine. It's okay, she soothed. No, it's not okay. None of this is okay. I could hear my voice begin to crack. What am I going to do about London? What am I going to do about you? She squeezed my hand. I'll talk to London about me, okay? So don't worry about that. It's something I've been wanting to do. As for everything else, I've already told you what I think. What if I can't? What if I let you down? You won't, she said. You can't know that. Yes, I can. I believe in you. Why? Because, she said, I know you better than anyone. Just like you know me. The following Friday, in mid-January, Vivian flew into town to pick up London for the weekend. When I broached the idea that it was probably time to tell London about our impending divorce, she suggested that we do it when they got back. After all, she said, she didn't want to ruin London's weekend. The next morning, my realtor staged our first open house, and as promised, Marge and Liz were there, loudly talking up the house to each other in front of potential buyers. Afterward, my realtor called to tell me that she detected some genuine interest in the property from one couple in particular, who were relocating with their children from Louisville. By the way, your sister missed her calling as an actress, the realtor remarked. On Sunday evening, shortly after their return from Atlanta, Vivian and I sat our daughter down at the kitchen table and gently broke the news. We kept the discussion at a level appropriate for a six-year-old, emphasizing that both of us still loved her 
and that we would always be her parents. We told her that she had nothing to do with the fact that we could no longer stay married. As she'd done the first time, Vivian led the discussion. Her demeanor was loving, and I felt that she struck the right tone, but London burst into tears nonetheless. Vivian held her and kissed her as she cried. I don't want you to get divorced, London pleaded. I know it's hard, sweetheart, and we're so sorry. Why can't you just be happy with each other? London said, still sobbing. Her naive incomprehension triggered such a profound wave of guilt that I despised myself. Sometimes it just doesn't work, I tried to explain. The words sounded meaningless, even to me. Is that why the house is for sale? I'm afraid so, baby girl. Where am I going to live? At her question, my eyes flashed toward Vivian, silently warning her not to say Atlanta. Her expression was defiant, but she held her tongue. I put a hand on London's back. We're still working on that. And I promise that no matter what happens, your mom and I will both be around to take care of you. Eventually, London calmed down, though she was clearly still confused and shaken. Vivian went upstairs with her and started getting her ready for bed. When she came back down, I intercepted her at the door. How is she? I asked. She's upset, Vivian answered. But according to my counselor, that's normal. In the long run, she'll be fine as long as you don't make the divorce more acrimonious than it has to be. That's when kids suffer the most in these situations, and you don't want to do that to her. I bit back a retort. I wasn't the one making this acrimonious after all, knowing it was pointless. Vivian gathered her things, the limo and the jet were waiting after all, but she paused in the doorway. I know it's a bad time with Marge and everything, she said, but we need to get our agreement squared away sooner rather than later. You just need to sign it so we can be done with all this. And then she was gone. Swallowing my rage, I started up the steps so I could finish tucking London in. In bed, her eyes were red and swollen, and she barely looked at me. Later that night, for the first time in years, she wet the bed. In the days following our discussion with London, she was noticeably subdued and spent even more time in her bedroom than usual. The bedwetting continued, not every night, but two more times, and she no longer wanted to read two by two before going to sleep. While she let me kiss her goodnight, she no longer reached up to put her arms around my neck for a hug. On Marge's recommendation, I spoke to her teacher at school about what was going on between Vivian and me. The teacher assured me she hadn't noticed anything amiss, other than a recent incident at the drinking fountain. London had somehow spilled water on her blouse one morning and immediately burst into tears. She was inconsolable and resisted both the teacher's and her classmates' attempts to comfort her. My daughter, in other words, was struggling. After her piano lesson on Thursday, I spontaneously suggested we go out for ice cream, but her reaction was tepid. I finally persuaded her to go, but she barely touched her ice cream on the drive home, oblivious to the mess the melting cone made in the car. Later that evening, as she was playing with her Barbies, I overheard her talking to herself as she leaned young Barbie toward Ken. I don't want to live with Mommy in Atlanta, Barbie said to Ken. I want to live here with Daddy. Daddy is fun and we go on date nights and he lets me cook, too. And I want to play with Bodie every day and see Nana and Papa and Auntie Marge and Auntie Liz. That night, I couldn't sleep, replaying the scene that London had enacted over and over in my head. Marge was right, I thought. Emboldened, I called Taglieri the following morning, making it clear to him that I was willing to do whatever it took to ensure that London lived with me. That same day, my realtor called to let me know that I'd received an offer on the house. Well, you've certainly stirred up a hornet's nest, Taglieri said. It was Wednesday, five days since I'd conveyed my instructions to Taglieri, and he had called me into his office to discuss the response. I fidgeted in my seat as he went on. I got a letter from Vivian's attorney yesterday. And? If you choose to fight her on the custody issue, it's going to get very ugly. Basically, the attorney warned me that they're going to aggressively pursue a claim that you're an unfit father. I blanched. What does that mean? For starters, they want to bring in a psychologist to evaluate London and do an assessment of her needs and preferences. I mentioned that as a possibility to you early on, if you remember. London's so young, I'm generally of the opinion that it's of limited use. But depending on the psychologist they use, they're hoping to submit a report that bolsters their claims. 
Some of the allegations are frivolous. They're claiming that you don't feed London a healthy diet, that you sometimes feed a sugary junk food for dinner, for instance, or that your failure to get her to dance class resulted in her getting kicked out. But there are other claims that the psychologist might explore on a deeper level. Like what? I felt slightly nauseous as Tagliari went through the possibilities. That you're forcing London into a relationship with your new girlfriend, Emily, before she's ready. Emily's son, Bodie, is London's best friend. I hear you, and hopefully the psychologist will confirm that. But you never know until they file their report with the court. He paused. There are also more serious allegations in the letter. That you purposely endangered London by pressuring her to ride her bike down a hill, knowing she was still inexperienced and couldn't handle the challenge. Also that you failed to contact Vivian right away, and that you purposely minimized London's injuries when talking to Vivian to cover up for your ineptitude. That's... that's not the way it happened, I stammered, feeling myself flush. Vivian knows it was an accident. She knows I'd never purposely endanger my daughter. Taglieri held up his hand. I'm just letting you know the substance of the letter. But there's one more thing, and you're going to have to stay calm, all right? I squeezed my hands into fists, feeling the veins at my temples throb. In the letter, Taglieri went on, the lawyer mentions that you have date nights with your daughter, that she gets dressed up in an adult-like fashion and that the two of you go out to romantic destinations. So? Russ... Taglieri gave me a pained look. It's disgusting, but the lawyer is suggesting that your relationship with London might be unhealthy, if not outright inappropriate. It took me a second to grasp the implication. When it hit, it took my breath away. Oh, God. Vivian wouldn't do this. Not in a million years would she do something like this. I actually felt lightheaded, black spots swimming at the edge of my vision. I was mortified, repulsed, and furious, but even those terms weren't strong enough to describe the way I was feeling. It was only innuendo, Taglieri cautioned, but the fact that it was mentioned in the letter at all troubles me. At the very least, it signals that they're prepared to paint a very negative, if not downright sickening, picture of you. I barely processed Taglieri's words. Vivian wouldn't do this. How could she even hint at something like this. I'm going to get on the phone with the attorney later because we can't just ignore these kinds of implied threats. It's an attempt to intimidate you, and it's also incredibly unprofessional. At the same time, it gives us a sense of just how far Vivian might go to get custody. And if it goes to court, I want to emphasize that you never know what a judge is going to decide. What do I do? I know London wants to live with me. Like I said, let me talk to the attorney. But what would be best, as I told you early on, is for you and Vivian to work it out. Because as your attorney, I can't say I feel optimistic about your chances when it comes to winning this thing. For the rest of the day, I staggered around as if I'd received a massive body blow. I didn't go to work. I didn't go home. I didn't visit Marge or Liz or drop by my parents' place. In my speechless fury, in my horror, I didn't want to talk to anyone. Instead, I texted Emily and asked if she could pick London up from school and watch her until I got back into town. She asked me where I was and what was wrong, but I couldn't answer. I need a few hours alone, I texted back. Thank you. Then, getting into my car, I started to drive. Three and a half hours later, I was in Wrightsville Beach, where I parked my car. The sky was overcast and the wind was bitter. I walked the beach longer than it took me to make the drive, and as I walked, my mind circled from London to Marge to Vivian before starting anew. With it came uncertainty and fear and relentless waves of emotion. I alternated between rage and confusion, heartbreak and terror. And by the time I returned to the car, my cheeks were windburned and my soul was numb. I hadn't eaten all day, yet I wasn't hungry in the slightest. I made the drive back to Charlotte and picked up London long after the sky had turned black. It was past London's bedtime, but thankfully Emily had fed her. I couldn't summon the energy to speak to Emily about what had happened just yet. There was so much I still didn't know how to put into words. It was Marge to whom I eventually turned, mainly because she left me no other choice. 
It was the last Friday in January, and I had agreed to stay with Marge while my mom ran to the pharmacy to refill one of Marge's prescriptions. By this time, the cancer had progressed to the point where no one was comfortable leaving Marge alone, even for a little while. The living room was illuminated by a single table lamp, and the shades had been drawn at Marge's request. She said bright light made her eyes ache, but I knew the truth. She didn't want us to see her clearly, for even a single glance was enough to reveal how sick she really was. So much of Marge's hair had fallen out that she'd taken to wearing an Atlanta Braves baseball cap whenever she was awake. Even though she was wrapped in a blanket, her continued weight loss was evident in her bony hands and painfully skinny neck, in which her Adam's apple protruded, knob-like. Her breathing sounded wet and thick, and she had long bouts of coughing and gagging that sent my mom and Liz into a panic. They would pound her back in an effort to dislodge mucus and phlegm, which often came out bloody. She slept more than 16 hours a day, and her appearance at the open house two weeks earlier was the last time she'd left the house. She could no longer walk more than a few steps on her own. The cancer in her brain had affected the right side of her body, as if she'd had a stroke. Her right arm and leg were weak, and her eye had begun to droop. She could only offer half smiles. And yet, as I sat beside her, I found her as beautiful as ever. Emily came by yesterday, she said, the words emerging slowly and with effort. I like her so much, Russ, and she truly cares about you. You need to call her, she said with a pointed look. You have to talk to her. Let her know what's going on with you. She's worried about you. Why did she come by? Because I asked to see her. I wanted to spend some time with the woman my brother loves. The new and improved model, I mean. She forced a weak smile. That's what I called her. I think she was pleased. I smiled. Despite her decline, Marge was still Marge. She gathered her strength for a moment and went on. I think it's time that I talk to London, too. When? Can you bring her by this weekend? She won't be here. She'll be in Atlanta with Vivian. Then how about after school today? My sister, in her own way, was telling me that time was running out. I was suddenly unable to swallow. All right, I whispered. I want to see Vivian, too. Can you set that up? My stomach tightened at the name and I looked away. Still furious and mortified, I could barely tolerate the thought of Vivian, let alone the idea of asking her to visit my dying sister. Marge saw my expression but pressed on. I need you to do this for me, she said. Please. I'll text her, I said, but I don't know whether she'll come. She's usually on a tight schedule. See what she says, Marge pressed. She blinked, and I noticed that even her lids were slowing down. Tell her it's important to me. I reached for my phone and texted Vivian. She responded almost instantly. Of course, the text said. Tell Marge I'll be there around five. I let Marge know and watched as she closed her eyes. I thought she was about to fall asleep before she opened them again. Have you accepted the offer on your house yet? I shook my head. We're still going back and forth on the price a bit. That's taking a long time. The potential buyers have been traveling. According to my realtor, we're close, though. She's thinking we'll sign next week. That's good, right? So you'll be able to pay off Vivian? Again, the sound of her name made me recoil. I guess. Marge stared at me. Do you want to tell me what happened? Emily said that you were gone all day Wednesday, but wouldn't talk to her about it. Rising from the couch, I peeked out the window to make sure my mom wasn't pulling into the drive. I didn't want her to hear what was going on. The last thing she needed was even more stress in her life. Taking a seat again, I brought my hands together and told her about the meeting with Taglieri and the letter that Vivian's attorney had sent. Well, Marge said when I finished, this isn't completely unexpected. She's been very clear all along that she intends to bring London to Atlanta. But the threat, she's playing so dirty. What does your attorney say? that he doesn't like my chances, and that he still thinks Vivian and I should work something out between us. Marge was silent for a moment, but her gaze was almost feverish in its intensity. 
First, you have to know what you really want. I frowned. Why do you keep saying that? We've talked about this already. I've told you what I want. Then do what you have to do. You mean go to court? Play dirty like she is? She shook her head. I don't think that would be good for London. And London is your priority. Then what are you suggesting? I think you know, she said, closing her eyes again. And as I studied her weary face, it finally dawned on me that I actually did. On the way back from Marge's, I called Emily, asking if we could meet for lunch. She agreed, and we arranged to meet at a bistro not far from her home. First, I want to apologize for not telling you what was going on, I said as soon as we sat down. To be honest, I didn't even know how to begin. It's okay, Russ, she said. Sometimes we all need to process things on our own first. Don't ever feel pressured by me. I'm here whenever you feel ready to talk, or even if you don't. No, I'm ready now. I said, touching her hand. Taking a deep breath, I told her everything. About London's distress, my instructions to Taglieri, and Vivian's response. As I spoke, she brought her hands to her mouth. I can't imagine how you must have been feeling, she said when I finished. I would have been shell-shocked and completely, utterly furious. I was. I still am, I admitted. For the first time, I feel like I actually hate her. With good reason, she said. Maybe it's not such a bad idea to let the psychologist talk to London. You'll probably be able to put these crazy allegations to rest right off the bat. There's still the issue of the bicycle accident. Kids have accidents, Russ. That's why the law requires them to wear bicycle helmets. Judges know that. I don't want this custody battle to play out in court. I don't even want London to have to meet with a psychologist about this. If she needs counseling to help her deal with a divorce, that's different but I'm not going to put London in the position of having to choose between her mom and dad. I shook my head. I'm trying to stay focused on what's best for London, and I know she needs me in her life as a consistent, everyday presence, not in an occasional ad hoc way. So I'm going to do what I have to do. I knew I was being vague, but there were some things I just couldn't tell Emily. She nodded before sliding her water glass toward her. Rather than raising it to her lips, however, she rotated it on the table. I saw Marge yesterday, she said. I know, she told me. How do you like being labeled the new and improved model? I cracked a grin. I'm honored. Then with a sad smile, she's such a good person. The best. There was nothing else really to say. After school, I brought London to Marge's. Because she'd been to the house numerous times in the past month, she'd known that Marge was sick, even if she didn't realize the seriousness of her illness. When Marge opened her arms, she went to her as usual and gave her a tender hug. When I mouthed the question, do you want me to stay, Marge shook her head. I'm going to visit with Nana for a little while, okay, London? Will you keep an eye on Auntie Marge for us? Okay, she said, and I left them alone in the living room. My mom and I sat on the back porch off the kitchen, not saying much of anything. A short while later, when I saw London enter the kitchen, I went back inside and held her as she cried. Why doesn't God make Auntie Marge better? She choked out. I swallowed through the lump in my throat, squeezing her small body to mine. I don't know, sweetie, I said. I really don't know. Vivian texted that she planned to go straight to Marge's after her flight landed, and as a result, she didn't arrive at the house until half past six. As soon as I saw the limo out front, I thought of the letter from her attorney. I left the front door open but retreated to the kitchen, feeling a wave of disgust toward her wash over me. Even though she'd just spent more than an hour with my sister, I still had no desire to speak to her. I heard Vivian enter the house and then London's tremulous voice, asking Vivian if she really had to go to Atlanta. Despite Vivian's promise that they were going to have a terrific time, London began to cry. Footsteps pounded as she ran to the kitchen and threw herself into my arms. I don't want to go, Daddy. She sobbed. I want to stay here. I want to see Auntie March. I scooped her up and held her as Vivian entered the kitchen. Her expression was unreadable. You need to spend time with your mom, I said. She misses you all the time, and she loves you very much. London continued to whimper. Will you take care of Auntie March while I'm gone? Of course I will, I said. We all will. 
With London and Atlanta, I passed most of the weekend at Marge's, just as I'd promised my daughter. My parents were there, too, alongside Liz. We spent long hours at the kitchen table telling stories about Marge, as if our vivid memories and outrageous accounts of Marge's exploits would help keep her alive longer. I finally told my parents and Liz about the night I rescued Marge from the water tower. Liz recreated the romantic scavenger hunt. We laughed about Marge's roller skating and horror movie obsessions, and reminisced about the idyllic day that Marge and Liz had spent with Emily and me at the Biltmore Estate. We marveled at Marge's wit, and the fact that she still viewed me as a little brother desperately in need of her superior guidance. I wished Marge had been there to hear all the stories, but she was with us for only a few of them. The rest of the time, she was sleeping. On Sunday evening, London returned from Atlanta. Vivian said goodbye to our daughter near the limo and didn't come inside. It was the last day of January. Marge and I were both born in the month of March, she on the 4th and I on the 12th. We were both Pisces, and in the world of the Zodiac, people born under that sign are said to be compassionate and devoted. I'd always believed that to be truer of Marge than me. Her birthday, I realized, was less than five weeks away, and I knew she wouldn't be around to celebrate it. Like Marge, I just knew. Chapter 26 Saying Goodbye my parents didn't have the most active social lives when Marge and I were young. While my dad might grab a beer every now and then with friends, it was relatively rare, and my mom hardly went out at all. Between work, cooking, cleaning, visiting her family, and raising kids, she didn't have a lot of extra free time. Nor did my parents dine out as a couple very often. Dining out was considered an extravagance, something I can remember them doing perhaps half a dozen times. When you consider birthdays, anniversaries, Valentine's Day... Mother's Day and Father's Day, six dinner dates in 18 years isn't much. That meant that when they did go out, Marge and I would be giddy at the thought of having the house to ourselves. As soon as their car pulled out of the driveway, we'd make popcorn or s'mores, or both, and start watching movies with the volume turned up way too loud until, inevitably, one of Marge's friends would call. Once she got on the phone, I would suddenly be forgotten, but I was usually okay with that, since it meant even more s'mores for me. Once, when she was 13 or so, she convinced me that we should build a fort in the living room. We found a coil of clothesline in the storage shed and ran it from the curtain rod to the grandfather clock to an air vent and back again to the curtain rod. We pulled towels and sheets from the linen closet, fastening them to the line with clothespins. Another sheet went over the top, and we finished the fort with pillows pulled from the couch. Marge hauled in a propane-fueled camping lantern from the garage. We somehow got that lit without burning down the house. My dad would have been furious had he known, and Marge turned out all the lights before we crawled inside. Setting the whole thing up had taken more than an hour, and it would take almost as long to take it all down and clean up, which meant we were only able to spend 15 or 20 minutes in the fort before my parents got home. Even when they did go out, they never stayed out late. I still recall that night as a near-magical experience. At eight years old, it was adventurous and new, and the fact that it was also against the rules made me feel older than I was, more like Marge's peer than a little kid for the very first time. And as I looked at my sister in the eerie glow of the lantern in our makeshift fort, I can distinctly remember thinking that Marge was not only my sister, but my best friend as well. I knew even then that nothing would ever change it. On February 1st, the high temperature hit 71 degrees, Five days later, the high was only 50 degrees and the low dipped to 24. The wild temperature swings that first week of February seemed to weaken Marge even further. With every passing day, Marge grew worse. Her 16 hours of sleep a day lengthened to 19 hours, and every breath was a struggle. The paralysis on her right side grew even more pronounced, and we rented a wheelchair to move her around the house more easily. Her words started to slur, and she had hardly any appetite but those things were nothing compared to the pain she was experiencing. My sister was taking so many painkillers that I suspected that her liver was turning to mush, but the only time she seemed to feel any relief was when she slept. Not that Marge ever mentioned the pain. Not to my parents or Liz, and not to me. As always, she was more worried about others than herself, but her suffering was evident in the way she winced 
and the way her eyes would unexpectedly blur with tears. Witnessing her agony was torture for us all. Often I would sit with her in the living room as she slept on the couch. Other times I sat in the rocking chair in the bedroom. As I stared at her sleeping form, memories would roll back through the years, like a movie playing in reverse. A movie in which Marge was the star with the most memorable lines of all. She was forever vivid, forever alive, and I wondered whether my memories would remain that way, or whether they would slowly fade with the passage of time. I struggled mightily to see past her illness, telling myself that I owed it to her to remember everything about the way she was before she got sick. On the day that the temperature plunged to 24 degrees, I remembered something that my father had told me about wood frogs, which can be found in North Carolina to as far north as the Arctic Circle. As cold-blooded creatures, wood frogs were susceptible to frigid temperatures and could freeze completely solid to the point that their hearts stopped completely. And yet, the frog has evolved in such a way that glycogen continues to break down into glucose, which acts a bit like nature's antifreeze. They can remain frozen and immobilized for weeks, but when the weather finally begins to warm, the wood frog blinks and the heart starts back up. There's a quick breath, and the frog hops away in search of its mate, as if God had merely hit the pause button. Watching my sister sleep, I found myself wishing for a miracle of nature just like that. Strangely, the rest of my life continued to move forward apace. Work remained a sometimes welcome distraction, and my client's enthusiasm for my work product was a rare bright spot during that time. I met with my realtor and signed on the dotted line, the couple from Louisville asked for a long escrow because they wanted their kids to finish out the school year there, so the closing was set for May. And over lunch one day, Emily casually asked me for the name of my realtor, revealing that she was thinking of selling her house too. I think I need a fresh start, she said, in a place where I didn't live with David. At the time, I suspected she was just trying to show moral support for my own decision to sell, a decision she knew I still harbored ambivalence about. But a few days later, she texted me a photo of the new for sale sign in her front yard. Nothing remains the same for long. Her life, like mine, was moving forward. I just wished I knew where mine was heading. My dad continued to show up at Marge's house with his toolbox nearly every afternoon. What began as necessary repairs on the house gradually turned into extensive remodeling. He had torn out the entirety of the guest bathroom on the day Liz and Marge attended my open house, intent on upgrading it to the kind of bathroom he thought his only daughter deserved. My dad was a dinosaur when it came to technology. To that point in his life, he'd seen no reason to purchase a cell phone. His boss always knew the location of the job site, and everyone else on the crew had one, so he could always be contacted. Who else would call him anyway, he wondered. Why be bothered? Yet my dad came to me right after the new year, and asked me to help him buy a phone. Since he didn't know anything about those cellular gadgets, he asked me to select one for him. Just make sure it does all that fancy stuff, he said, but isn't too expensive. Though my dad hadn't mentioned it, I chose a phone that I felt would be simple for him to use as well. I set him up on my plan, and then spent some time with him showing him how to make and receive calls, as well as text. To his contacts, I added the information for Marge, Liz, my mom, and me. I couldn't think of anyone else to add. Can it take pictures? He asked. I've seen phones that can do that now. Pretty much all phones have done that for years, I thought to myself. But I said only, yes, it does. I showed him that function and watched as he practiced taking pictures and then examining them. I also showed him how to delete the ones he didn't want. Though I had the sense that much of the information was overwhelming, I watched him carefully tuck the phone into his pocket and head out to his car. I saw him again at Marge's house the following day. She'd risen from her nap and our mom had chicken soup waiting. Marge ate half the bowl, less than we'd hoped, and when the tray was taken away, our dad took a seat beside her. He looked almost shy as he began to show her photos of various faucets, sinks and towel rods, as well as options for floor and wall tile. Obviously, he'd been at the home improvement store, and this was the only way he could make sure that Marge was part of the design process. Marge knew that our dad had never been a man of words, nor had he ever been openly affectionate. But through his labors, she could see that in his own way, he was shouting his love for her at the top of his lungs. 
hoping that she could somehow hear what he'd always found so difficult to say. Dad took notes as she made her selections, and when they were finished, Marge leaned closer to him, giving him no choice but to hug her. Love you, Daddy, she whispered. Then, rising from the couch, he lumbered out of the house. Everyone knew he was off to purchase her selections, but after a few minutes I realized that I hadn't heard him start his car. When I got up to peek through the curtains at the driveway, I saw my dad, the strongest man I'd ever known, sitting in the front seat of his car with his head bowed and shoulders heaving. Wonderful aromas always floated from Marge's kitchen these days, as my mom tried desperately to make food that would tempt Marge into eating more. There were soups and stews and sauces and pasta, banana cream and lemon meringue pies, and homemade vanilla ice cream. The refrigerator and freezer were stuffed, and every time I came by she handed me food from my refrigerator, which had gradually filled as well. Whenever Marge was awake, my mom would set a tray in front of her. By the second week of February, my mom had begun to feed her because her left side was growing weaker as well. She would carefully raise the spoon to her lips, wiping her mouth between bites, and then offer my sister a sip of something to drink through a straw. While Marge ate, my mom would talk. She would talk about Dad and the way the young new owner of the plumbing business was giving Dad a hard time for missing so much work. By that time, my dad had probably accrued years of vacation time, but the owner was the kind of guy who was never happy, a man who demanded more from the employees while demanding less of himself. She described the tulips she'd planted for my dad, and the lecture she'd attended with her Red Hat Society friends. She also regaled Marge with things that London had told her, no matter how inconsequential. More than once I heard my mom pretend to be upset that no one had notified her in advance about Marge's and London's roller skating adventure. I picked you up and dropped you off so many times at that rink that my tires made tire grooves in the parking lot asphalt. And you forgot to mention when my granddaughter was trying it for the very first time? I knew that she was only half teasing, that she would have loved to have been there, and I silently berated myself for it. My mom, after all, not only wanted to see London on skates that day, She'd wanted to see her own daughter, skating with abandon and joy on her face. One last time. As the second week of February rolled around, I had the sensation that time was simultaneously speeding up and slowing down. There was a slow-motion quality to the hours I spent at Marge's every day, marked by long stretches of silence and sleep. On the other hand, each time I showed up, it seemed that Marge's deterioration was accelerating. One afternoon before pickup, I stopped by and found her awake in the living room. She and Liz were speaking in low voices, so I offered to leave, but Liz shook her head. Stay, Liz said. I was about to touch base with one of my clients anyway. It's an emergency. You two talk for a bit. I'm hoping this won't take long. I took a seat by my sister. I didn't ask her how she was feeling because I knew it was a question she hated. Instead, as always, she asked about Emily and work. London and Vivian, her voice slurred and tinny. Because she tired so easily, I did most of the talking. Toward the end, though, I asked if I could ask her a question. Of course, she said, her syllables running together. I wrote you a letter for Christmas, but I never heard what you thought about it. She smiled her half-smile, the one I'd grown used to. I haven't read it yet. Why not? Because... She said, I'm not ready to say goodbye to you just yet. I confess that I sometimes wondered if she'd ever have a chance to read it. Over the next three days, whenever I went to the house, Marge was always asleep, usually in her bedroom. I would stay for an hour or two, visiting with Liz or my mom, whoever happened to be around. I would admire the latest repairs or renovations that my dad had undertaken, and more often than not eat a large plate of food that my mom would put down in front of me. We almost always stayed in the kitchen. I thought at first it was because no one wanted to disturb Marge while she was sleeping, but I discounted that when I realized that if my dad's hammering wasn't enough to wake her, our low voices wouldn't either. I finally figured it out one afternoon, when Liz stepped outside to sweep the porch. At loose ends, I wandered to the living room and took a seat in the spot where Marge and I usually sat. My dad was working away quietly in the bathroom, but I realized I could hear a strange rhythmic sound, like a malfunctioning fan or vent. 
unable to pinpoint its origin, I moved first to the kitchen and then to the bathroom, where I spotted my dad lying on his back with his head beneath the new sink, in the final stages of hooking it up. But the sound was fainter in both those places. It grew in volume only as I began to make my way down the hallway, and it was then that I knew what was making that horrible noise. It was my sister. Despite the closed door, across the far reaches of the house, what I'd been hearing was the sound of my sister breathing. Valentine's Day fell on a Sunday that year. Marge had planned a special gathering at her house, even inviting Emily and Bodie, and I brought London over as soon as she got back from Atlanta. For the first time in two weeks, London and I arrived to find Marge sitting upright on the couch. Someone, maybe my mom, maybe Liz, had helped her apply a little makeup. Instead of the baseball cap, Marge wore a gorgeous silk scarf, and a thick turtleneck sweater helped disguise the weight she'd lost. Despite the tumor ravaging her brain, she was able to follow the conversation, and I even heard her laugh once or twice. There were moments when it almost felt like one of our usual Saturday or Sunday afternoons at our parents. Almost. The house itself had never looked better. My dad had finished the guest bathroom and the new tiles and sink gleamed, reflecting state-of-the-art fixtures. He'd also spent the last week repainting all of the interior trim in the house. My mom had laid out a veritable banquet on every surface of the kitchen, and as soon as Emily arrived, my mom made her promise to take a mountain of leftovers home with her, including whatever was left of the pies. We rehashed a lot of family stories, but the highlight of the evening was when Liz presented her Valentine's Day gift to Marge. She'd made a photo album of the two of them that opened with photos of each of them as infants and progressed through their entire lives. On the left-hand pages were photos of Liz, on the right, Marge. I knew that my mom must have helped Liz compile the photos, and as Marge slowly turned the pages, I watched my sister and Liz grow up in tandem before my eyes. Eventually, the album began to feature photos of the two of them together, some taken on exotic trips, while others were merely candid shots taken around the house. No matter how formal or casual, however, each photo seemed chosen to tell a story about a particularly meaningful moment in their lives together. The entire album was a testament to their love, and I found myself close to tears. It was the final two pages of the album that broke me. On the left was the photo of Marge and Liz beneath the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree in New York, the last trip they would ever take together. On the right was a photo that looked to have been taken only a couple of hours earlier, with Marge looking exactly as she did right then. Liz explained that my dad had taken it, and that unbeknownst to her had left to get it developed at a nearby drugstore. Upon his return, he asked Liz to add it to the last page of the album. All eyes turned toward him. I've always been so proud of you, my dad choked out as he looked at Marge, and I want you to know that I love you too. The day after Valentine's Day, the waiting began. I now believe that on Valentine's Day, Marge used much of her last remaining reserves of energy. She slept almost the entire day Monday and ate no solid food from that point on, sipping only tepid chicken broth through a straw. While my mom and dad were a constant presence at Marge's house, I drifted in and out, mainly because of London. She had been unusually volatile since learning the truth about Marge, occasionally throwing a tantrum or bursting into tears over trivial things. She would get particularly emotional when I refused her requests to visit Marge, but it was difficult to explain to London that her aunt was almost always sleeping now. However, a few days following the Valentine's Day celebration, Liz called me at home in the evening. Can you bring London by? She said urgently. Marge wants to see her. I called up to London, who was already upstairs in her pajamas, her hair still wet from her bath. She raced down the stairs and would have rushed straight to the car, but I managed to block the door in order to get her to put on a jacket. When I pointed out that she wasn't wearing shoes, she randomly grabbed a pair of rubber boots from the closet and slipped those on, despite the fact that it wasn't raining. I saw she was holding a Barbie, refusing to put it down even while donning her coat. When we arrived at Marge's house, Liz gave London a hug and kiss, and immediately pointed her in the direction of the master bedroom. Despite her fevered rush to the car, London hesitated for a moment before starting slowly down the hall. I trailed a few steps behind. Again, I could hear my sister, the sound of life leaving her with every breath she took. Inside her room, the bedstand lamp spilled a warm pool of light onto the hardwood floor. London paused just inside the doorway. 
Hi, honey, Marge said to her, the words slurred but understandable. London cautiously approached the bed, moving quietly so as not to disturb her sick aunt. I leaned against the door jamb, watching as London reached Marge's side. What do you have there? Marge asked. I brought you a present, London responded, handing over the doll she'd been clutching all along. It's my favorite Barbie because I've had her since I was little. She's my first Barbie, and I want you to have it. When London realized that Marge didn't have the strength to take it, she set it beside Marge, propping it against my sister as she lay beneath the covers. Thank you. She's pretty, but you're prettier. London bowed her head and raised it again. I love you, Auntie Marge. I love you so much. I don't want you to die. I know. And I love you, too. But I have something for you. Auntie Liz put it on the dresser. One day, when you're old enough, maybe you can watch it with your dad, okay? And maybe, when you do, you'll think about me. Can you promise me you'll do that? I promise. My eyes flashed to the dresser. I saw the DVD that Marge had given my daughter, and I blinked back sudden tears as I saw the title. Pretty Woman. Marge thinks I should still have a baby, Liz told me over coffee in the kitchen a few days later. Her expression was a mixture of fatigue and bewilderment. When did she tell you this? Well, she first brought it up when we went to New York, she said. She keeps pointing out that I'm healthy enough to do it, but she trailed off. I waited for her to go on, but she seemed lost. Do you want to do that? I asked in a tentative voice. I don't know, Russ. It's all just so hard to contemplate right now. I can't imagine doing it on my own, but she brought it up again yesterday. For a moment she picked at the grain of the kitchen table, making a small groove in the wood. She told me that she'd already made financial arrangements in case I felt differently down the road. That I'd be able to afford IVF, a nanny if I wanted, schooling even. When I tilted my head trying to figure how and when Marge had made these arrangements, Liz ran a hand over her hair, trying to corral loose strands into her messy ponytail. Apparently, right after she'd passed the CPA and became an accountant, she bought a bunch of life insurance. Two different policies, in fact. She added to them over the years, and it's quite a lot of money. The larger policy lists me as the beneficiary, and it's more than I'll ever need, even if I did decide to have a child on my own. She recently changed the beneficiary on the other policy to your parents, so your dad can retire. I asked about you. I raised my hand, interrupting. I'm glad it's going to you and my parents, I said. She looked confused, as if none of the information she'd recited really made sense to her. What I kept wondering when she told me about all this, Liz continued, is how did she know? I asked her, and she said that because of her family history, and even though she wasn't sure who the beneficiaries would eventually be, early on, I think she listed you and your parents, she wanted to make sure she had it just in case she ever needed it. She never told me. She never told me either, Liz admitted. When we were discussing having a baby before she got sick, I guess I never really focused on the cost. We do okay and we've saved a bit, but mostly I guess I always trusted that if Marge thought we could afford it, we could. For a moment, her expression verged on desperation. I could barely hold myself together. I told her that I didn't think I was capable of raising a child without her. She was always the more maternal one. And do you know what she said to that? I looked at her, waiting. She said that I was her inspiration and that any child that I raised would make the world a better place. And that if there's a heaven, she promised that she would watch over our child forever. The following day, it was my turn to say goodbye. When I arrived at the house, Marge was sleeping, as usual. I stayed for a while, keeping an eye on the clock so as not to be late to pick up London from school. But before long, the baby monitor in the kitchen crackled and both my mom and Liz hustled back to the bedroom. A few minutes later, my mom returned to the kitchen. Marge wants to see you, she said. How is she? She seems pretty coherent, but you should probably head back now. 
Sometimes she starts to get confused and doesn't stay awake long. Observing my mom's steady demeanor, I could see that she was every bit as strong as my father, for she was bearing the unbearable, each and every day. I held my mom for a moment, then walked down the hall to the bedroom. As on Valentine's Day, Marge was wearing a pretty scarf, and I guessed that she had asked Liz to put it on her before I came in. I pulled a chair from the corner of the room and scooted it toward the bed. Liz backed out of the room as I reached for my sister's hand. It felt warm, but lifeless in mine. Unmoving. I didn't know whether she could even feel it, but I squeezed it anyway. Hi, sis, I said to her softly. At my voice, she blinked, then struggled to clear her throat. Read, she said, the word coming out garbled. It took a moment for me to understand what she meant, but then I spotted the envelope that Liz had placed on the bedstand, and I reached for it. Opening it, I pulled out the single sheet of paper, took a deep breath, and began to read. Marge, it's late at night, and I am struggling to find the words that I wish would come more easily. In truth, I'm not sure it's even possible to convey in words how much you've always meant to me. I could tell you that I love you, and that you're the greatest sister a guy could ever have. I could admit that I've always looked up to you, and yet, because I've said those things to you before, it feels painfully inadequate. How can I say goodbye to the best person I've ever known, in a way she truly deserves? And then it occurred to me that all of what I need to say can be summed up in just two words. Thank you. Thank you for looking out for me all my life, for trying to protect me from my own mistakes, for being a living example of the courage I so desperately wish I owned. But most of all, thank you for showing me what it means to truly love and be loved in return. You know me, the maestro of grand romantic gestures, of candlelit dinners and flowers on date night. But what I didn't understand until recently was that those tender, orchestrated moments mean nothing unless they occur with someone who loves you just the way you are. For too long, I was in a relationship in which love always felt conditional. I was forever trying and failing to become someone worthy of true love. But in thinking about you and Liz and the way you are with each other, it eventually dawned on me that acceptance is the heart of true love, not judgment. To be fully accepted by another, even in your weakest moment, is to finally feel at rest. You and Liz are my heroes and my muses, because your love for each other has always made room for your differences and celebrated everything you had in common. And in these darkest hours, your example has been a light that helped me find my way back to the things that matter most. I only pray that someday I, too, will know the kind of love that you two share. I love you, my sweet sister. Russ my hand shook as I refolded the letter and placed it back in the envelope. I didn't trust myself to speak, but Marge's wise gaze told me I didn't need to. Emily, she wheezed, you have that with her. I love her, I agreed. Don't let her go. I won't. And don't cheat on her again. And here she managed the ghost of a wicked smile. Or at least don't tell her. I couldn't help but laugh. My sister, even at death's doorstep, hadn't changed a bit. I won't. It took her a little bit to catch her breath. Mom and Dad need to see London be part of her life. They always will be, just like Liz. Worried for them. I thought of my mom and all the loved ones she lost. I thought of my dad, weeping in the car. Do it. I will. Love you. 
I squeezed my sister's hand, then leaned down and kissed her on the cheek. I love you more than you will ever know, I said. After offering a tender smile, she closed her eyes. It was the last time I ever spoke to her. My dad packed up his tool chest that night, and all of us kissed Liz goodbye. Now it was time for the two of them to be alone. I don't know what, if anything, they said to each other over the next couple of days. Liz never told us, other than to say that Marge enjoyed a day of surprising lucidity before she finally slipped into a coma. I am glad that Liz was there for that, and I pray that they both had a chance to say most of what was left to be said. A day later, my sister died. The funeral at the gravesite was a short affair. Marge had apparently given strict instructions to that effect, but the brief ceremony attracted dozens of mourners, all of them bundled up under the cold and gloomy sky. I gave an abbreviated eulogy, of which I have little memory, other than that I spotted Vivian standing at the edge of the crowd, far from my family, Liz and Emily. Prior to the funeral, London had asked if she could dance for her auntie one last time, so after the mourners had dispersed, streaming away to their cars, I helped London attach her gauzy wings. With no music and only me as an audience, London fluttered gracefully around the freshly turned earth, like a butterfly flitting in and out of the shadows. This much I know, Marge would have loved it. Epilogue At the park... I sit in the shade while London runs and climbs and plays on the swing. It's been hot the last couple of weeks, and the air is so thick with humidity that I keep spare t-shirts in the trunk of my car to change into at times like this. They don't stay dry for long, but I suppose that's typical for late July. In the past four months, the Phoenix Agency has signed three more legal firms as clients, and now represents firms in three different states. I've had to find a new office and two months ago I hired my first employees. Mark had two years' experience with an internet marketing firm in Atlanta, and Tamara is a recent graduate from Clemson with a degree in film. Both of them are digital natives and text using both their thumbs, as opposed to the hunt-and-peck method preferred by their boss. They're intelligent and eager to learn, and they've made it possible for me to spend time with London this summer. Like last summer, my daughter is constantly on the go. Tennis, piano, and art, along with dance at a different studio, one run by an instructor who inspires hugs from the kids. I drive her to and from her activities and work while she's busy. In the afternoons, we can often be found at the neighborhood pool or at the park, depending on her mood. It amazes me to see how much she's changed since our first summer together. She's taller and more confident, and when I'm driving her here and there, I can often hear her sounding out the words she sees on billboards. My house isn't as large as my former home, but it's comfortable in both of Emily's paintings, the one I had bought at the show and the one she'd painted of London and me, grace the walls of the living room. Even though I've been living there since late May, there are still boxes I haven't yet unpacked, and I had to rent a storage unit for the furniture from my previous home that I no longer needed. I'll probably sell most of it eventually, but with all the recent changes in my life, I just haven't had the time. I'm still getting used to living in Atlanta, after all. Vivian and I met the day after the funeral, and in less than an hour we had worked everything out. Though I offered, she declined my offer of alimony, and as for the property settlement, she asked for only half of the equity in the house, savings, and investment accounts. She let me keep the funds in our joint retirement account, but then again, money for her was no longer the concern it once was. At that same meeting, she revealed that she was secretly engaged to Spannerman, Others would learn of it after our divorce was finalized, and while I could have been hurt by that, I found to my surprise that it didn't bother me at all. I was in love with Emily, and like Vivian, I'd reached the point where I was ready for a new chapter in my life. However, money had never been the real bone of contention between us. Custody was. So I was both relieved and a bit skeptical when she leaned over and said in an earnest voice, I want to apologize for the letter my attorney sent. She placed a hand over her heart. I was venting in her office and didn't realize how my words would get twisted. I know you would never do anything inappropriate with London, and when I finally saw the letter my attorney had sent, I felt sick to my stomach. She sighed. 
I can't imagine what you must have been thinking about me. She closed her eyes, and in the moment I chose to believe her. Part of me longed for that. I didn't want to think she had ever been capable of such things, but the truth is, I'll never know how things actually transpired. When Marge asked to see me that night, she told me flat out that London needed both of us, that I would be hurting London by pursuing sole custody. Needless to say, I was angry. At the time, I felt it was none of her business, but her words affected me more than I wanted to admit, and over time I began to realize that she might be right. On her wrist, she twisted a thin gold bracelet around and around. Whenever London came to Atlanta, all she did was talk about you. How much fun she had with you, the games you played together, the places you went. Her voice trembled. I never wanted to take London from you. I just wanted her with me. So when Marge said you would move to Atlanta, I was floored. I never imagined that you'd leave Charlotte or your parents. I always felt that you started your own business because you weren't serious about finding work in another city. At my protest, she held up a hand. That's why I wanted sole custody in the first place. Because I love London, too, and only seeing her every other weekend was killing me. I guess I never believed that you would go to such lengths to remain in her life. She looked directly at me. You're a great father, Russ. I know that now. If you're willing to move to Atlanta, like Marge said, and you want to split time with London, I think we can probably figure something out. Which is exactly what we did. For starters, London was allowed to stay with me in Charlotte to finish out the school year. Two days later, the moving van filled with our stuff rolled toward Atlanta. When Vivian travels, which is often three or four nights a week, London stays with me. I also have my daughter every other weekend, and London and I have a standing date night on those Fridays she's with me. To avoid a repeat of the past year, Vivian and I have decided to alternate holidays in the future. So I can still read bedtime stories to my daughter when she stays with her mom, I bought a mini iPad, and London props it against a pillow to see me via FaceTime. Even better, once school starts, I'll get to pick her up at school every day, and she'll stay with me until Vivian finishes at work. I'm assuming that means that London and I will have dinner sometimes. Other times, London will have dinner with her mom. But I'm confident that Vivian and I will figure it out. I find myself being thankful to Vivian for all those things. Cognizant that in all the years I've known her, my ex-wife has never once failed to surprise me. Even, sometimes, in good ways. I dreaded telling Emily that I was moving. Most people would applaud my decision to choose my daughter over a new romantic relationship, but I also knew that a woman like Emily comes along once in a lifetime. Charlotte and Atlanta were close enough for a short-term relationship, but could it really work in the long run? Like me, Emily had been born and raised in Charlotte, and her parents and sister lived nearby. We hadn't been seeing each other for very long. To that point in our relationship, we hadn't so much as even kissed. You could do better than me, is how I began the conversation. There were smarter and kinder men, wealthier and better-looking suitors, I went on. When Emily interrupted me to ask what this was about, I spilled everything. My conversations with Marge, my meeting with Vivian the day after the funeral, the realization that I needed to move to Atlanta. For London. Could she forgive me? Standing, she put her arms around me. We were in her kitchen at the time, and in that moment, my eyes flashed to her studio where she was working on yet another painting. It was one she intended to give Liz. As she'd done with the image of London and me, Emily was painting a version of the photo taken of Marge and Liz beneath the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. I've known for a while that you were going to move to Atlanta, she whispered into my ear. Marge told me when I went to see her. Why do you think I put my house up for sale? Emily and I now live less than a mile from each other. We're each renting for the time being because we both know that it's only a matter of time before we start shopping for rings. There are those who might think it's too fast. My divorce was finalized only three months ago. But to this I would respond, how many people have the chance to marry their closest friend? For London, knowing that Bodie not only lives here but will go to the same school, there's an excellent one nearby, has made London's transition that much easier. Right after I watched London zip down the slide, I glanced toward the parking lot and saw Emily pulling in. 
Bodhi jumped out and made a beeline toward London, and when Emily smiled and waved, I knew with certainty that my day has gotten a whole lot better. And by the way, if anyone's interested, on Emily's first night in Atlanta, she moved here a week after London and I did. We celebrated with champagne and ended up in bed. Ever since, I felt as if I've finally come home. It hasn't been easy for my parents, or for Liz. On the weekends that Vivian has London, I make the drive to Charlotte, and I visit my parents. Liz is often there, and our conversations drift to Marge as a matter of course. These days, we no longer weep at the mention of Marge's name, but the aching emptiness remains. I'm not certain that any of us will ever fully fill the void. Yet there are glimmers of hope. When Liz and I were chatting last weekend, she asked me in an offhanded way whether I thought she was too old to become a single mother. When I assured her to the contrary, she merely nodded. I didn't press her, but I could see that Marge's gift to Liz was already bearing the fruit of possibility. Later that same afternoon, my dad mentioned that the owner of the plumbing company was running it into the ground, and he wasn't sure whether he wanted to stick around to watch that happen. When my parents came to visit London and me in Atlanta earlier this week, I caught my mom looking through the real estate section of the newspaper. As I mentioned before, my sister always had a plan. As for me, Marge had known all along what I needed to do, and in the weeks following her funeral, I often wondered why she hadn't simply told me to move to Atlanta, instead of letting me fumble my way to the answer on my own. Only recently did I figure out why she'd held back, that after a lifetime of looking to her for guidance, she knew I needed to learn to trust my own judgment. She knew that her little brother needed just one more push to become the man she always knew I could be, the man who finally had the confidence to act when it mattered most. It was a year to remember and a year to forget, and I am not the man I was 12 months ago. In the end, I lost too much. The grief I feel about Marge is still too fresh. I will miss her always, and know that I couldn't have weathered the past year without her. Nor can I imagine who I'd be today without London. And whenever I look at Emily, I clearly envision a future with her at my side. Marge, Emily, and London supported me when I needed it most, in ways that now seem almost preordained. But here's the thing. With each of them, I was a different person. I was a brother, and a father, and a suitor. And I think to myself that these distinctions reflect one of life's universal truths. At any given time, I am not the whole me. I am but a partial version of myself, and each version is slightly different from the others. But each of these versions of me, I now believe, has always had someone by his side. I'd survived the year because I'd been able to march two by two with those I love the most. And though I've never admitted it to anyone, there are moments, even now, when I feel Marge walking beside me, I'll hear her whisper the answer when I'm confronted with a decision. I'll hear her urging me to lighten up when the world is weighing heavily on me. This is my secret. Or rather, it is our secret. And I think to myself that I've been lucky, for no one should ever be forced to march through life alone. <laughs>